see what we, we'll see where we're at. All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the judiciary public hearing for um, March twentieth, twenty twenty four. Um, this is our final public hearing of the year. Uh, and as certainly as the case would have it, of course, we have our most robust sign up list for our last public hearing of the year. So a uh, couple reminders uh, in terms of um, process and procedure. Folks have three minutes to testify. It, is it a strict three minutes? Um, there will be a bell and I will cut you off. So. Uh, please move quickly. If you've submitted written testimony, I do not need you to come up here and read me your written testimony. Um, we have it. We have it online. We have our laptops. We do not need you to read written testimony. Um, please reference it. Uh, if you'd like to highlight particular sections for us or summarize it, that's fine. But don't feel um, you need to take up the full three minutes either. Uh, if there are questions from the committee, uh, we will address those after your testimony. Um, a reminder to members of the committee that we this is a public hearing. We'd like to get to folks before it gets too late and they have to leave for other obligations. So please uh, constrain your questions to those that are um, most necessary. With that, uh, we will start. First up will be uh, Michelle Villani. Or Michael Villani, I should say. I'm sorry. Michael Villani, I'm off to a great start. No Michael Villani. All right, we're going to go to uh, Megan McLeod then. Why? I'm hello. I've been I've been talking. Okay. All right. Sorry, sir. I, you're on. Go ahead, Mr. Blind. Yeah. Ahead. Somehow it wasn't. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Michael Villani, and uh, my partner Douglas Hartman and I own three forty five Railroad Avenue in the south end of Bridgeport. The building is now a thirty four thousand square foot renovated historic mill with approximately 40 artist studios, gallery space, and other exhibition areas. We have a fully leased building of all 40 studios. We also have a waiting list of over 135 artists who want to be in our building. We opened in October 2021, and three months later, we were 100% leased with artists who are all members of Metro Art Studios. Our artists commute from all over Fairfield County, such as towns like Westport, New Canaan, Reading, Southport, and, of course, Bridgeport. When we opened, Max Perez of the Bridgeport Economic Development said that we were a game changer in the city and that he had tried for 30 years to get affluent Fairfield residents to spend the day in Bridgeport. By the way, those artists all have uh, businesses and pay taxes. I tell you this because five years ago, this was not the case. The building was abandoned for approximately 35 years. There was no electric, plumbing, or anything else except for people openly doing drugs in our parking lot. All 290 large windows were boarded up and replaced. Many people advised us that we shouldn't invest our hard earned retirement money in a city known for drugs, crime and corruption. We went against these naysayers and were blessed with a beautiful building, which won the 2022 Merit Award from Preservation Connecticut. Within months, we were also blessed with Historic New England choosing our historic mill to launch a seminar series about adaptive reuse of historic mills in Connecticut. Both Historic New England and Preservation Con Connecticut consider our building very important to the history of Connecticut. Um, I want to just mention that there are also uh, 10 points that I think are very important for our process. And um, I'd like to just humbly kind of recommend them, that these suggestions. Number one, underground should always be the preferred route wherever a new easement is needed to lessen the impact on the community and businesses. Currently, there's a 30 foot deep trench running along Railroad Avenue, which has gas, electric and other things and can be used for this purpose. 
Number two, legal resources are provided to interveners at no cost. We in Bridgeport are uh, socially disadvantaged. We're not as rich as Southport and Greenwich and all these other towns that do have the money. And so if we're going to be ensnared in a legal system, we need to have uh, we need to have some legal resources. Number three, export resources are provided for engineering, economic input, and impact, and environmental impact. Number four, the removal of infrastructure be required in equal measure to any replacement resulting in neutral impact or less. Number five, notice be provided via certified mail with signature required and notice posted with door hangers, doorknob hangers. Thank you. Uh, we found that in M number Mr. six. Mr. Villano, your, your time's elapsed and I just have a couple quick questions for you. First of all, and I should have said this at the outset, but um, just when folks come up, if you could just tell us what bill you're testifying on. I, I presume, sir, you're here testifying in support of House Bill 5507. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, which which um, which will put the trend take the transmission lines away from the buildings and not allow uh, land to be taken by eminent domain. Right. So what what this bill. Um, one of the reasons you're in support of this bill is that it it treats uh, transmission lines um, under the Environmental Justice Act. Uh, is that right? Correct. Okay, great. And sir, I want to appreciate. I want to thank you for um, being with us today. Uh, I certainly want to thank you for your investment in Bridgeport and and in my district. Um, certainly, I I know how detrimental. Um, the proposed project by UI has been to you and to your business and to so many folks in Bridgeport uh, and the complete lack of community outreach um, uh, there has been. So I, I want to thank you for being here to lend uh, your voice on, on this critical issue. So further questions from the committee? If not, thanks for being with us today. And um, thank you. I look, for, look forward to coming to visit soon. Um, thank you. So, you please all do. Right. Next up will be um, Megan McClout, who is going to be joined by Senator Tony Wong. Um, well, they're coming up. Way of housekeeping. Again, we do have a lengthy list today. So if folks want to buddy up, they are welcome to. Um, but you 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 just have the same three minutes. You don't get six if you buddy up. But if you'd like to buddy up and help us get through the list quicker, we, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, Senator and, and Ms. McClout, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Staffstrom and, and the ranking and chairs. Uh, Senator Tony Huang, I, I am here in support of our community and constituent, and a big thank you to this committee for raising uh, House Bill 5507. I will defer the rest of my time to uh, a constituent and an advocate, uh, Ms. Maggie McClote, for the remainder of the three minutes, but I want to thank you to the committee's condolences on this. Thank you all. Uh, my name is Megan McClote. I am a resident of the town of Fairfield. Um, I'm also a member of the Sasco Creek Neighborhood Environment Trust, which is the advocacy group leading against these, these issues that we're seeing happen in Fairfield, Southport, and now the city of Bridgeport. Um, it's probably no surprise to many people on this committee that there's a lot of issues around these proposed monopole projects. Um, it's a tough balance to strike as a result of the fact there's no denying that we need to fortify our grid and make sure that we provide long-term sustainable electric transmission, but we've got a lot of issues for the way that this has impacted our town. And we see that this is obviously gonna be an issue if continuing along this course for other towns and municipalities in the state. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of things in this bill that I first must commend um, the people who drafted this bill. It's almost as if they were listening to the community and the constituents and drafted exact language to answer those needs. And that's really refreshing um, from a constituent perspective because we really finally feel that there's an opportunity to be heard after many months of a long drawn out battle of not being heard and feeling like we didn't have adequate notice. Um, there are laws in place for reasons and it doesn't seem that a lot of our uni uh, utility providers are, are following a lot of those laws and this legislation really expands on codifying what those notice requirements are. Um, what I really like about some of the pieces in this legislation is that it directly speaks to the impact of the economic issues as a result of these monopoles. And I, I say that because it's really important to look at this from a broader scope of not only environmental justice, but economic justice and making sure we're delivering that to all levels on an equal basis. Um, the reality is, is that this legislation now 
requires people to look at what the economic impact would be, re requiring appraisals, requiring that the notice is given not only to the chief executive officer of a town, but to the entire legislative representation at that town or municipality. That way we feel as neighbors, we would never be in this situation again where there, there wasn't enough adequate notice. There wasn't enough description about what the plan was. Things were branded as a rebuild when in fact they were an entirely new substantive project that was much bigger than any of the structures that were already in place. Um, but the reality is that the cost analysis requirements of this would make it much more difficult for the siting council to skirt their obligation to its community members and its ratepayers of what it costs when they analyze what this project would be, why they didn't show what the options would be if it was a, a perhaps a longer term investment with a better return on their investment funds. This legislation requires them to literally and explicitly say what it is they're trying to do. And that's why we're in support of House Bill 5507. Thank you, Ms. McClough. Uh, questions from the committee? Um, if not, I want to thank you for your advocacy. Certainly, I want to thank um, Senator Wong as well. Uh, you know, this is certainly one of those issues that has transcended party lines uh, and transcended town lines. Um, and uh, I've been um, uh, been fortunate enough to be working with him on on this legislation and and on some of the um, uh, uh, some of the impact that that this project's going to have on on both of our communities and and frankly how it highlights concerns that should be shared across the state of Connecticut with with these types of projects and so thank you both for being here today and and I want to thank you uh, Chairman Staffstrom for for your leadership on this because it's not just one town it's it's Fairfield Southport Bridgeport. But I think most important of all, we're always going to have an ongoing conversation as it relates to transmission lines, our need for power. This is one where transparency and accountability to the consumers and the communities that will be impacted. I know there's a real concern in regards to how that may possibly restrict or impact transmission line buildup to meet our power needs in, in our state. But nevertheless, I think there's a balance. There's a balance in regards to proper notification, proper engagement and be able to get the facts. And and I thought the language, and I concur with Ms. McClote, that this is a bill that was very well crafted, but it addressed the issues of a conversation that was sorely needed. And I want to thank this committee for your leadership in initiating it and and our support of it. So I want to thank you, Mr. Well, Chairman. Well thank thank you. And and I think, you know, that certainly highlights the concern. Um, you know, I don't know that in any other state in the country, um, a utility company would Go th would go and propose a uh, high energy transmission line smack through the downtown of that state's largest city without any sort of community outreach whatsoever. Um, it's it's really really kind of mind boggling. So thank you both for being here. Um, Joni Webster will be next. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Joni Webster and I live at 383 Westford Drive. I am in favor of HB 5507, the bill that seeks to revise the Connecticut Siting Council. My property directly abuts the Metro, Metro North line. I guess you could say I officially live on the wrong side of the tracks, the north side. Although Southport is a community that really isn't separated by the tracks. This project that has been approved will affect everyone all over Southport and across the harbor, straight through the town. I take exception with the, to the travesty of the vote on February 15th of 2024, in which four council members approved a project that doesn't exist yet. Only one council member voted no for the obvious reason that there literally was no plan to approve. And yet four council members were okay with that and two more abstained. That's outrageous and a slap in the face of every one of us sitting here in harm's way. We have no idea of what we're in for. The residents in Fairfield are being played. The council has not protected the citizens of Fairfield or its resources. My husband stated in his written statement that this is a clear case of the little guy being steamrolled by a billion dollar company and you'd have a hard time winning the other side of that argument. Neither the council nor UI has done their homework. There have been no studies done to assess the impact of these wires on our health or on the wildlife here by the shore. Property owners have no idea about the easements or what putting these lines up entails in terms of equipment storage, infrastructure removal, access roads, et cetera. Who will end up with the tower in their backyard? 
We don't know, but then they don't know either. Abutters like us should be granted intervener status and legal resources should be provided to us. Although I'm retired, most folks were, are working at 10 a.m. on a Wednesday. With a project this large and impactful, citizens should be provided with at least one public hearing on a Saturday. It's nearly impossible for people to participate in the process when all meetings are held on a, on a Wednesday morning. Finally, the citizens have expressed their feelings about this, and clearly we do not want these monopoles in our community. Our position has always been to bury the lines and the reasons are numerous, but instead UI has been given a certificate to do who knows what. You've clearly put the cart before the horse and the horse is wearing blinders. In my opinion, the certificate should be revoked until a plan has been submitted, hopefully one that buries the lines and Fairfield residents have been made aware of what will be happening. What it comes down to is this, Four people think the situation is okay, and they got to decide the future of our town and the beautiful village of Southport, but then a few thousand of us are totally outraged. This council definitely needs to be revamped, and I wholeheartedly support the changes being proposed in HB 5507. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, ma'am. Um, questions or comments from the committee? If not, appreciate joining us. Andrew Allen will be next. How you doing? I'm Andrew Allen. Um, I live in Bridgeport. Um, I consider myself a bit of a cannabis advocate, um, and I'm also in the industry. I work in a dispensary that's uh, going to be opening up in Norwalk here in a week or two. Um, I'm here to speak out against two bills specifically and four one. Um, I'll start with the ones I'm against. Uh, SB 445 and HB 5509. Um, I think both of these are regressive and work directly against one of the main goals of cannabis legalization, uh, restorative justice for minorities who have been historically criminalized and, and incarcerated at greater rates than their white peers for the same level of cannabis activity. Five years from now, if these are enacted, these laws will not result in any noticeable declines in DUIs, but they will result in higher rates of black and brown kids and adults profiled and criminalized by law enforcement. Um, in favor of SB 44, I'll keep this really, really brief. Uh, this bill is long overdue and probably should have been included in the original cannabis legalization. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? If not, I want, uh, want to thank you for making the trip all the way up here from Bridgeport to make your voice heard and, and certainly appreciate your advocacy on this. Thank you. Um, Sheldon Taubman can be next. Good morning, uh, Representative Stoss from Senator Winfield, other members of the committee. Um, my name is Sheldon Taubman. I'm the litigation attorney for Disability Rights Connecticut. Uh, DRCT is the federally mandated protection and advocacy system for Connecticut. Um, as such, we serve individuals with a full range of physical, behavioral, sensory, intellectual, and other developmental disabil disabilities. Um, I submitted written testimony on SB 425 which would uh, prohibit discrimination in, in healthcare settings. And I discussed there the uh, benefits to people with disabilities from including that protection on a state level. But I mostly wanna to talk today about HB 5509. The executive director of my organization, Deborah uh, Dorfman submitted written testimony on this. I wanna highlight it, some of the issues there. Um, this provision, uh, section three through seven of 5509, would cause individuals who have been found not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, um, otherwise known as acquitties, um, to be significantly restricted in the exercise of their rights. Um, Section three seeks to change the language of the recently amended uh, state statute to revert to prioritizing public safety over the safety and well being of the acquittee. This would be harmful to acquittees. It's an affront to individual rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act. For example, um, if enacted, this would allow courts the ability to require an equity to stay in an inpatient setting, even if it were deemed clinically inappropriate and for the individual, uh, and if, if the own treatment team of the individual said the person could be released, no, um, this could be overridden based upon that, that prioritization if this law were to, to be adopted. 
The legislature passed two years ago a provision saying that both protection of society and, and safety and well-being of equities had to be of equal import. This proposed legislation would be extremely harmful going a step backwards. Section 5 of HB 5509 would also take rights away. It would extend the time period from six months to 12 months before which an equity can apply for temporary leave or conditional release. Require a hearing when Whiting applies for an equity to be permitted to go on temporary leave. Require an equity on temporary leave to do so only with supervision and require the PSRB to use the evidentiary standard, the strict standard of clear and convincing evidence when an equity or applicant seeks an order for less restrictive placement. These provisions would also be harmful. And just as one example, the requirement that somebody cannot go out and leave without supervision at all times, we all know there's short staffing. And so obviously that's going to dramatically restrict rights. The professional research in this area shows that such prolonged, indefinite and unnecessary confinement is harmful. It's also well doc documented that when equities are uncertain about when or whether they will be able to return to the community and be free from court supervision, they often lose hope and disengage from treatment. Thank you, This sir. proposed, thank you. Um, we, we urge you to consider the severe harm on individuals who are quitting if the provisions taking us a step backwards were to be adopted. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate your advocacy for being with us today. Patricia King will be next. Good morning, uh, Senator Sastrom. I'm sorry, Representative Sastrom, Senator Winfield, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Patricia King. I am uh, the Corporation Counsel for the City of, of New Haven. And I'm here to testify in support of House Bill 5413, which uh, contains amendments to the enabling legislation um, for municipalities to destroy uh, ATVs and dirt bikes that are seized on our city streets, and also amends 14224 to create an offense or to amend the offense of street takeovers. Um, I have already submitted written testimony, so I won't belabor that. Um, but the reason that the city supports both of these amendments um, and other amendments as well uh, included in this package is that I think deterrence is an important aspect of this legislation. Because these offenses involve public safety risks posed by vehicles of various kinds, whether motor cars and street takeovers, ATVs, dirt bikes, and other small vehicles on city streets, enforcement is particularly difficult uh, because, primarily because of the police pursuit policies and the amount of uh, resources it takes for the police department to muster up a detail uh, since a lot of this enforcement needs to be done by a group of police officers. Uh, we would also support, of course, the uh, amendment that would include the possibility of funding for municipalities to enforce these. But I think that the more that we can uh, create deterrence with some of these increased penalties, um, I think that would go a long way towards uh, resolving this serious public safety problem, which plagues many of the streets uh, in our state uh, and in our city. Uh, so with that, unless there are any questions, I'm... Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Attorney King. Questions or comments from the committee? Questions or comments? If not, um, I know that we take this seriously and appreciate your advocacy on it. Uh, Rena Kapoor will be next. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for allowing me to testify regarding HB 5509 about the PSRB. My name is Rena Kapoor. I am the Director of Forensic Services for the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, which means that I oversee DEMAS's programs that are at the intersection of mental illness and the criminal justice system. I'm a forensic psychiatrist by training and a practicing physician for over 20 years. I'm also a member of the PSRB working group that was created by this legislature in Public Act 2245 a couple of years ago. I've submitted written testimony explaining why Demas does not support the bill 5509 as written. So I'll just use my short time here to highlight that it was really only 18 months ago that this legislature made changes to the PSRB statutes 
that were aimed at promoting the recovery of people found not guilty by reason of insanity and recognizing the humanity of people with serious mental illness when it passed Public Act 2245. This, as you know, was done in response to abuse that occurred at Whiting Forensic Hospital in 2017. And although I wish that it had been something other than abuse that had catalyzed these changes, they've undoubtedly been a good thing, helping to support Demas patients while still adequately maintaining public safety. And so it's somewhat surprising to be here today considering legislation that not only undoes important parts of PA 2245, but takes steps even further backward, changing systems that have been in place in the PSRB since it was in inception in 1985. It's also somewhat surprising that these changes are being proposed while a work group that was created by this legislature continues to meet and to gain consensus about the very same issues being addressed in this bill. There haven't, to my knowledge, been any adverse events since the law was passed 18 months ago. Um, and so we respectfully ask that you wait for that report from the work group and the recommendations that have been fully considered. I just say the two most problematic provisions of the bill um, are sections 5A, um, which removes the ability of patients to be in their own custody after the board has approved a temporary leave. Um, the whole point of temporary leave is for patients to have gradually increased freedoms in the community and making a, for a safer transition. And so this change would diminish the hospital's ability to do that um, and we think would ultimately uh, increase the risk upon their eventual discharge from the hospital. There's also section seven um, that raises the standard of proof necessary for our patients to meet at every stage of movement through the PSRB system. So at temporary leave, conditional release, um, and at discharge from the board. So I'll stop and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about the PSRB process, the work group, or anything else related to this. Thank questions you. from the committee. I, I guess just briefly, what, um... So the work group, where does that stand in terms of sort of how close to an outcome are is the work group? So the work group has been meeting at least monthly since November of 2022, um, and more recently twice a month. Um, we have reviewed the, the process of managing insanity equities in 17 other states. Um, we are now at the phase of uh, considering a number of specific proposals um, put together by the committee members. And as you know, you know, there are people from with very diverse viewpoints. There are equities, there are victims, there are prosecutors, public defenders, judges, mental health professionals, and getting all of those people to agree can be a lengthy process, but there are all already areas where we do have consensus. Um, and we hope to, you know, to wrap this up. In the are there CMP. legislative appointments to that work group? There are not. I believe it's a Demas, like the chair, it was sent to Demas to create the work group. And then uh, the members are not appointed by specific legislators. Okay. All right. Are there questions or comments? If not, I uh, appreciate being here. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Gersten. Good morning, members of the Judiciary Committee, and thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of SB 444 concerning the sentence modification of certain cannabis offenses. My name is Sarah Gersten. I am the Executive Director and General Counsel of the Last Prisoner Project, a national nonpartisan nonprofit working at the intersection of cannabis and criminal justice reform. I'm also a resident of West Hartford. I won't belabor the policy reasons in support of this bill that I included in my written testimony, as did many other advocates in the community, um, but I will highlight a few points. This committee passed a similar measure last session, and unfortunately that bill did not become law. Nevertheless, its introduction revealed that there were over 4,000 pending cases for an offense invalidated by the legalization of cannabis. 
thanks to the leadership of the state's attorney's office and the chief state attorney, over 1,500 cases for outdated charges have been dismissed. This session, we owe it to families across the state to finish the job by creating a sentence modification procedure that allows individuals sentenced under outdated laws to have their sentence reevaluated in light of legalization. And I think it's important to point out that every agency that we have worked with to produce this legislation, the state's attorney's office, the judicial branch, DOC, is in support of the policy issue at hand. Um, I want to address something that the judicial branch raised in their testimony that they alone as an agency would not be able to identify eligible individuals. And so we should do this through a petition-based process. Um, we have been working with the Department of Corrections and the judicial branch. And just this month, we obtained data from DOC showing that there are 476 individuals currently serving a sentence for an offense that would be eligible under this law, 682 individuals with eligible commingled offenses who have been charged and sentenced, and over 100 individuals charged and awaiting sentence for an el eligible offense. Let that sink in. There are more than 1,200 people who continue to bear the consequences, some even currently incarcerated, for the same activities we now tax regulate and make a profit off of. Here in Connecticut, the legal market brought in over $2 million just in the first week of sales, and the state is poised to earn over a billion dollars in tax revenue over the next five. This piece of legislation is clearly in the interest of justice and fairness. We know that there is essentially no substantive opposition to this policy issue. Um, but these agencies working together, Department of Corrections, the judicial branch, can proactively identify these individuals. We know that we've spoken to these agencies. The courts can identify people that have eligible offenses and working in conjunction with corrections, they can identify which of those individuals are currently serving either a sentence of incarceration or supervision. So we can proactively identify these in individuals and that's the pro process that we need to follow to ensure that it is effective. So let me ask you, where did those numbers come from? From the Department of Corrections. Do you have a, a like an email or some sort of? I sure do that I can forward to this committee, and then it was also included in my written testimony. Okay, um, yeah, because I, I do think we want to drill down on those a little bit because I think those numbers are different than ones uh, I've seen or heard in the past. So I want to want to want to compare apples to apples. Um, so you reference the state's attorney's office and having discussions with them. They they actually submitted testimony opposing this bill. Um, and and I will say, you know, when this bill or part of this bill came up last year, uh, they were pretty quick to jump on and go through and look at pending pending cases and make sure those were dismissed expeditiously. So I I, I do take the chief state's attorney at his word um, on uh, on this issue because I do think he has been a um a, a straight shooter so to speak in terms of in terms of working with us on this their opposition to this bill in addition to some technical language changes that would seem to have to be addressed before this bill were to move out of committee is that um this that this a new process is not necessary because there's existing processes to seek sentence modification um i mean you referenced a number of cases where somebody may have been convicted for a cannabis possession charge but that's not why they're or the primary reason why they're serving prison they're they're in for you know that is some lesser included charge to some other offense they've committed um and that there's a way to seek a modification under existing law what what response would you give to the chief state's attorney on that criticism of this yes yeah, so the current sentence modification process is very narrow in terms of eligibility um, you have to have served seven years and it has to be the result of a plea deal so of course there likely are many individuals who are serving sentences for activity we have now legalized that wouldn't meet that criteria Additionally, that's a petition-based process. We have many states that have implemented this type of law. This isn't a novel procedure. This is something that has become the norm for states that have legalized. And in those states that do follow a petition-based process, we know that it simply doesn't work. It's why this legislature, this state, um, has passed clean slate, because the same holds for the expungement process, 
petition-based process simply don't work. People don't take advantage of those laws. It needs to be initiated by the state to truly have an impact and make sure no one's falling through the cracks. Um, we have one of the highest rates of incarceration in the country. We, these are scarce resources. We need to vote to things that are devote to things that are actually in the interest of public safety. These offenses are not them. And if we do this through a petition-based process or we just leave it up to the current sentence modification process, we're gonna continue to incarcerate individuals at very high cost to the state, to taxpayers, for activity that we now believe people should not be serving time for. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, I, guess I, I guess I'm not sure we have one of the highest incarceration rates of any state. No, either. sorry, the cost of incarceration. Oh, cost, okay, yes. I was going to say, our, our, our incarceration. No, rate we've rate. done a very good job to decarcerate, but Thank you. this is a huge issue, um, another area where we could be decarcerating. And every person in DOC custody costs the state over $90,000 a year. That's a very high cost okay. to the public. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Further questions or comments? If not, appreciate being with us. Um, all right, Judge Beverly Strait Kafalis. Good morning. I'm Beverly Strait Kafalis, probate court Ad administrator, uh, Representative Staffstrom, Senator Kissel, Judiciary Committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to offer comments and concerns regarding Senate Bill Number 445, an act concerning, among other issues, the establishment and expansion of truancy clinics in the probate court system. Thank you for your consideration of the probate courts to address chronic school absenteeism in our state. Um, I have submitted written testimony regarding my concerns, but I do wanna comment about some of the other testimony that has been submitted to elucidate the committee on what the models have been in the probate court system. First of all, they are not really called truancy programs. They are school attendance and engagement clinics. They are non-punitive programs that are focused on determining the cause of absenteeism, absenteeism and then developing effective solutions to engage the child and the parent or guardian in school attendance and engagement. And importantly, a distinct uh, feature of the programs that have been implemented in the probate court system is that the judges go to the schools, the parties, the children do not go to court. It is really a unique model. However, having said all of that, um, and being very proud of the work the probate courts have done in a very limited manner in this area of concern is that the proposal before you is beyond, frankly, the resources of the probate court system at this time. I thank you for your consideration of the probate courts in this regard. We are certainly always willing to be a partner with stakeholders to address this issue, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? Questions or comments? If not, Judge Beverly, thank you for your written testimony and for being with us today. Thank you. Um, all right, I skipped uh, Ivelisse Correa. She's ready. Sorry if I sound like crap, I don't feel good today, so thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for allowing me to speak today. I'm here in support and opposition of a couple bills. First, I'm here in support of HB 5505, an act concerning self-defense or the defense of a third person. We should be able to stand up for victims of a crime without fear of arrest. Whether it's a random attack or stopping rape, people are inherently good inside and we should be able to stand together as a community. Um, we shouldn't have to worry about being arrested for coming to the aid of um, another person. Um, I also oppose SB 445, Section 3. This will target minority drivers and cigarette smokers. Cigarette smokers generally are minorities or LGBT due to targeting by big tobacco to these demographics. We should be moving forward in racial equity and focusing our efforts on drunk driving and fentanyl. Um, part of this bill essentially says I can't smoke in my parking lot where I live if my car is stationary, which makes no sense. Um, regarding SB 444, I did want to remind the committee that most inner city residents also live in school zones. It's like Hartford's an entire school zone. So personal possession 
may have turned into a charge with a drug factory within a school zone if they had a small jar of cannabis and a scale. The state is also still prosecuting personal possession cases prior to July of 2021. Um, I oppose HB 5506. Truant children need support and not police. I'm happy to email my transcripts, um, high school transcripts to state reps as a former truant youth. The reason I graduated early and half a credit over is because I transferred to a school where the teachers actually cared. No court could have engaged me better than teachers and resources. Um, I oppose HB 5509. My car smells like cannabis. I didn't smoke today. Minority drivers will be smoked at higher or will be searched at higher rates because police most times cannot differentiate between fresh and burnt cannabis. An ounce of cannabis for a regular user means you're running low. Suspicion of over five ounces really means nothing. Am I carrying something deadly or is it just flowers I grew and will smoke later? It's not fentanyl. Um, I also, oops, sorry. Um, I oppose HB 5413. The ATV law from last year did not focus on ATVs. They focused on ride outs led by black and brown bikers who were, um, I'm sorry, already criminalized in our cities. Instead of focusing on H on ATVs, most municipalities took their blank checks for police funding and hired officers to focus on traffic stops, despite the ticket scandal from last year with state police and a Hartford police officer. I would hope instead that we can focus on getting resources back into our city, helping engage um, those who have been criminally affected by the war on drugs. And I once again would like to thank the committee for my time. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committees? Representative Howard. Hi, Elise. I, uh, just Hello. one question for you. You said that the odor of marijuana in your vehicle uh, would be present even though there's no marijuana in it. As I understand this bill, you're over 21, right? Yes. So the, the odor of marijuana in your vehicle wouldn't lead to a search of your vehicle because you're over 21. Is that the way you understand the the bill as well? Um, my son's about to turn 16. So if he did borrow my vehicle since um, my, his vehicle is recently stolen, um, you guys would be searching a vehicle based off the odor of my previous use with my black 16 year old son inside. Okay. Uh, actually the legislature doesn't search vehicles. All right, well, police would. All right. So. Thank you. Further questions? Or and, comments? um, he's never smoked a day in his life. Further questions or comments? If not, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Jill Kidiff. Good morning. My name is Jill Kidiff. I am a medically retired Hartford police officer after being stabbed repeatedly in my throat on May 17th of 2018, um, that week I was issued a protective order by the courts, keeping my attacker from having contact with me in any way, shape or form as all victims have a right to. <clears throat> Years later, due to COVID and also me being pregnant, our trial was pushed off, pushed off, pushed off. I continued to have this protective order until Unbeknownst to me, it was erased from the system the moment that her not guilty by reason of insanity was accepted and she was therefore committed to the PSRB and not convicted of a crime. And I therefore do not qualify as a victim of a crime in the state of Connecticut, even though I have paralysis of the right side of my throat. And I had to medically retire. My whole life was taken from me because I tried to help somebody one day. That was my job, a job that I loved still love and have grief over not being able to go do because I chose to stay and help her. And she chased me down in the hallway, tackled me from behind, and two maintenance men witnessed her take a purple Cousinart butcher knife and thrust it into my throat, splitting my trachea in half. And I live with that every day because my whole life has been changed physically, emotionally, mentally. I am here today to say I deserve a protective order Others will say that this is a double jeopardy, that this is a crime against mental health. You have to be found guilty of a crime by a judge 
in order to have a not guilty by reason of insanity. Those words seem to be very confusing to people as it should be guilty, but insane. That's a fight for another day. They are guilty. You have to be found guilty of the crime. Otherwise, if you're not guilty, you don't go to prison. You don't go to PSRB. I deserve to have a protective order. The other people that did not know that their protective orders just went away. I still have it in my purse right over here. And I didn't know until last September when a retired defense attorney suggested therapy for the equities that they meet, restorative justice that I meet with my attacker, that we as victims should meet so that we can help them with their healing. What about my healing? I'm broken and there's nobody that cares about what happens to us as victims or survivors. I don't want that person to contact me ever. I don't want to be in a room with her. She sends me a letter. Do you know what that could do to a person? I am strong to a point. I am strong because nobody else is strong for me. I am tired. I'm tired of listening to people say that their well-being and their health and their rehabilitation is most important. What about us? There are so many people that didn't know that they were carrying around a piece of paper. That means nothing. If I call 911, they don't know who I am. She can come to my door and they, she didn't commit a crime. Senator Kissel. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kiddick. Uh, you are my constituent and uh, I definitely fully support your efforts to get a, be able to get a protective order when someone is uh, sent to uh, a psychiatric institution and found not guilty by virtue of uh, mental disease or defect or insanity. Uh, you have every right to, to be safe. So first of all, I just want to walk through. Uh, you were a police officer for the city of Hartford. Yes. And you live up in North Central Connecticut. And when you were uh, injured, were you told by your physicians that you were the first person that they were aware of that were, was a survivor and otherwise the injury that you suffered usually ends up in death? Yes, there's no one that has had their trachea split in half, stabbed in the throat, who had an army of emergency services coming for them. And are you fearful for your safety even at this time? I am fearful because I'm on the PSRB work group for the state, which I also support by 509 should probably like hold off in that regard. The things that some people want to do to get people out faster. You know, some mental health is like cancer. There's no cure for it. We can't predict how it's gonna go. We can't guarantee how people are going to be. I have a fear that she will show up and find me the reason that she lost her apartment just a couple of blocks from here in Con at Five Constitution Plaza. I'm the reason she doesn't live there anymore. I don't know. You can, Nobody can guarantee me that she's not gonna come and hurt me or hurt my two babies. I have a two and a three-year-old. She could just stand on my yard and I don't know what she's going to do. I don't know. So your testimony here this morning is not because you have any disparaging feelings towards people with mental disabilities, nor do you want to change the way we characterize individuals. And perhaps there are those that can be rehabilitated, but your sole purpose being here today is to advocate for legislation that would say for purposes like this, if an individual who's the victim and whether we characterize it as a crime or an assault where a person was found not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect or insanity, that you should as a victim uh, be able to at least get a protective order so that you, your family, your children, your husband can feel safe and that there is, in your opinion, and I'm going to say I agree with you, that there's sort of a loophole or a glitch in the law that if this individual is found guilty of a crime, you'd still be able to have that protective order. But because they were institutionalized and found not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, you're unable to get a protective order. Is that the, the problem that we have in Connecticut right now? Yes, there is no level of protection that I qualify for because she was not convicted. I therefore don't qualify as a victim. Okay. 
Is there anything more that you, uh, I know that you we had to live within the three minutes, but is there any anything else that you wanna make sure that the members of this committee are aware of in your very tragic case? And I wanna thank you for your service, protecting the people of the city of Hartford, uh, your uh, desire to be a law enforcement officer uh, at your uh, very young age. Now you've been prohibited from being able to pursue your career of public service, but is there anything that we were not able to get out in testimony thus far? This is has nothing to do with anything against anyone with any sort of disability, mental health concern it has nothing to do with it. It's simply that oh, I shouldn't be alive. It shouldn't be attempted murder. She murdered me. I just, for some reason, the bright people showed up, put their lives on the line, took the knife forcefully under her hand. And I just had, I called my own ambulance. I called an ambulance to get her help. And that ambulance ended up taking me to Harvard Hospital. And thank God the chief of surgery at Harvard Hospital worked with my mother in Boston. Everything aligned. Nobody has that happen. I'm here for a reason. This has nothing to do with anything against, there are people that can be rehabilitated, absolutely, but you can't guarantee it. And I am just asking for the basic right to have a piece of paper that I can call 911 and they will know that she's not to be near me. And especially with the move that people want the board, the PSRB to go away. If they go away, nobody's protecting the victims. And then there's nobody to give guidance to those who are acquitted. Thank you, Ms. Kiddick, and I appreciate your your bravery and courage in coming to testify this morning. Thank you, Chairman Staffster. Representative Howard. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. Jill, thanks for being here. Um, obviously, a difficult story to tell. Um, and you said to, that, that you're tired. And um, I think that all too often victims don't have the strength to come here. Uh, they are too tired, um, and their voices aren't heard as much as they should be. So I, I mean that wholeheartedly. Thank you, and thank you for your service. How long were you a police officer for? I had 11 and a half years on the date of my injury. So I know as a police officer then that you had uh, mandatory training and things like domestic violence and protective orders. Why do we issue criminal restrain restraining orders in this state? To protect the victims from future unknown events. So are you in any less danger because your, your attacker happened to have mental illness? No. So today, if your attacker were to send you a letter, or give you a phone call and re-victimize you, what would she be guilty of? Nothing. And if she had a standing criminal restraining or a standing criminal protective order, what would she be guilty of then? She'd be in violation of a protective order to say no contact. Which is a felony, right? Correct. All right. So right now, do you know where your attacker is now? Yes. Is she free? She is at Dutcher, at which point she could have temporary leave and I would not be notified that she had access to the community. Okay. And there's nothing legally preventing her from contacting you or really even coming to your front door and knocking on the door? No. So what you're looking for is for this legislature, you're coming here and saying, I gave the people of Connecticut 11 years of service, essentially the rest of my life uh, for them. And I'm just asking that you give me some some protection. So if I get re-victimized, I can take action. Is that your ask today? That's it. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Um, Ma'am, did you get any notice at all that this that the order was going to lapse? Was that nothing was mailed to you? I did not know. So she was committed in August of 21, I believe. And it was September of 23 that I said in a meeting that I have a protective order that she can't send me a letter. And I didn't feel like I was telling the truth. It was a moment of like, I don't think I know what I'm talking about. And it took weeks of me reaching out to state investigators, to the courts, to victim services. And they said, somebody didn't enter into computer right. It's not in the jacket properly. Somebody screwed up until everybody realized, wait a minute, it was a race the day that she was sent permanently to Whiting. Nobody knew. And I just had this piece of paper thinking I, <laughs> it meant, it means nothing. Nobody knew. Wow. Well, listen, I, um, I certainly appreciate your service. I appreciate being here today. And um, uh, thanks for shedding some light on this that I think is a Certainly an issue, and I don't know that this committee was aware of until until you came in here today. So appreciate it. Thank you, um, Monty Radler.
Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, some of you may have heard me testify before over the years. Um, by way of introduction, I was the uh, head of the Public Defender Psychiatric Defense Unit from 1998 until my full-time retirement in 2022. Um, I do pro bono uh, work now for Connecticut Legal Rights Project at the hospital. I am also a member of the white of the uh, PSRB working group and um, can ask answer any questions related to that. I also have a degree in counseling specializing in marriage and family. Um, I am recovery in recovery myself for mental illness, two episodes of major depression. I've spent most of my adult life educating myself about mental illness and treatment of mental illness. Um, a lot of what I had to say was said by uh, Dr. Kapoor, so I'm not gonna repeat that. Um, I would also like to indicate that one of the major focuses of the PSRB working group is to attend to the lack of uh, education and protection uh, in the system for victims of the crimes committed by insanity equities. We are taking them very seriously and I support um, what Ms. Kiddick had to say. Um, as far as House Bill 5509, three, uh, sections three through seven, I am adamantly opposed to that. Um, this legislature enacted the provisions that they seek to turn the clock back on um, in Public Act 22-45. Um, we don't even know, there's no empirical evidence that um, there has been any damage or threat to public safety as a result of the provisions that they're seeking to turn the clock back on. Um, empirical evidence developed by experts within our state have basically concluded that the biggest protective factor to public safety is for equities to be transitioned into the community when they are ready. Um, and the PSRB um, is the best safety net as far as that uh, population is concerned. And I have no problem with their role as far as that's concerned. The problems that uh, advocacy groups have had is the lengthy periods of hospitalization of equities before they are allowed back into the community. It is counterproductive. It costs the taxpayers of this state an enormous amount of money and clogs up valuable mental health resources that could otherwise be used for treatment of others with mental illness. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions, Representative Howard? Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, when equities transition back to society and they've been, uh, I'll use the word rehabilitated. Is that fair? Is that the right word? Uh, what's a word that, that to transition them back that's appropriate? It basically means that their clinical condition has improved to the extent that um, the system does not regard them as a danger to self or others. And there is a, a big misconception about what transitional leave and conditional release actually mean. These individuals are subject to literally pages of restrictions, monitoring continually. And if these individuals violate rules, show any indication of clinical decompensation, if they miss their appointments, um, you know, anything like that that does not amount to a crime or a serious mental health um, exacerbation, they're pulled back into the hospital. And the way the system worked before these legislative changes, some of these individuals, it took from eight months to up to four years to get them back out. That is unacceptable waste of taxpayer dollars on mental health resources. And it also is a waste of judicial resources that public defenders and prosecutors litigate and judges time and everything else for basically a perception that these individuals are somehow more dangerous than anybody else in the mental health community. 
And I just want to point out one more thing. An executive summary uh, was issued by the Connecticut Sentencing Commission in response to a request in 2019 by Senator Catherine Austin about the mental health situation in Connecticut's prisons. And I would urge all of you to read that summary, which was just issued in 2023. 32% of the incarcerated population in Connecticut was classified as having an active mental health disorder requiring treatment, mental health three or above. These individuals do not receive a fraction of the treatment um, that um, Insanity Equities actually receive. And at end of sentence, these people are released with no conditions. A lot of these individuals are also individuals who might have qualified for the insanity defense, and yet were advised by their attorneys who now know it's not a good idea to pursue an insanity defense because in all likelihood, you will spend as much time an inpatient in, in the Connecticut uh, you know, Whiting Forensic Hospital then you would spend incarcerated um, okay. for the crime that you committed. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further questions or comments? Seeing none, thanks, Uh Kirsten Newman. Thank you. Kristen Newman, no, okay. Uh, Aaron R. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Aaron Ramsey. I currently reside at Dutcher, the less restrictive set setting at uh, Whiting Forensic Hospital. I'm grateful for all the improvements that have been made to the system. Um, but I am here to strongly oppose Bill 5509, particularly the part about the Psychiatric Security Review Board. It would undo all the progress that has been made over the last six, seven years and actually make things even worse than what they were before. The abuse that started all these changes and created 50 people being fired, 10 arrested, uh, was based on video surveillance that proved some of the abuse that was going on. The stuff on camera did not show anything compared to what was actually going on there. Staff were going in patients' bedrooms and beating them up, black guys. And the worst part was you knew that nobody was going to help you. And that's what you had to live with. Um, the well-being of the patient, as well as their safety, needs to remain as a primary consideration for the board. Because of these reasons, it sets the tone for how a patient is supposed to be viewed and treated. Um, if I had gotten treatment and mental health education when I was out, I may never have ended up in this situation. Um, there's many other people that have not been able to receive any treatment, including those incarcerated and those free that could benefit from the services that are provided in this hospital. And it's not furthering public safety to clog up these beds and all the services that are provided after we get released, because there are many people who do not qualify for this level of care anymore. We have done hundreds of hours of therapy. I've done over a hundred groups. Um, I've been transitioning out. Um, I am two thirds of a way through a college degree. There's many other people that are in similar circumstances that do not need to be here anymore. Um, also, it's important to know that the prisoners that got sentenced and found guilty knew what they were doing is wrong. We did not know right from wrong because of the mental illness and the delusions and the break from reality. So it doesn't make sense that we should be punished more so and have such scrutiny than people who are being released that knew exactly what they were doing was wrong. 
There are many steps involved in progressing us through the system. There's so much oversight. It would just be terrible to implement some of these changes that would roll back all the Thank improvements. You. Thank you, sir. So I just want to ask you to please wait for the working group to make their report before making Thank any. You. Thank you. Thank you. Pre appreciate your testimony. Seeing no further questions, appreciate being with us. Um, next up will be Vincent A. Vincent A. Hi, good morning. My name is uh, Vinny Artizone. I'm, I'm opposing bill number 5509. And uh, what I had to say is that I, I've been here 33 years of my life and uh, I don't have an act of violence in 20 years in full remission. And the only terms I could come to with myself is that this system is very corrupt. I, I went to court like five times with seven psychiatrists and doctors and people back of me. They had no one against me, and they still keep me here. And I had one doctor in court say that this is cruel and unusual punishment, illegal confinement, and against the 8th and 14th Amendment. And they still warehouse me here for no reason. I, I don't understand that kind of mentality. When I took this route coming mental health, I thought they'd help me and, and restore me and send me back out to the community to be a productive citizen. I own two businesses. I had no crime before I came here. And I'm a nonviolent person, and I, I feel that they have too much power as it is with the Bill 5509, I'll give them more because I'm in the community now and they're sending me with staff anyways. And I don't think that should, is right. Uh, that shouldn't be done, but they don't listen to anything here. They're like above the law anyways. So thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Um, questions or comments? Seeing none, appreciate being with us. Stephen H. Stephen H. Hi, my name is Stephen Timothy Hughes Jr. And I'm an acquitty that's under the board um, for zero to 30 years. And I have been, been here for 23 years at Dutcher. And I am here to oppose Bill 5509. Um, so, I first of all, I want to say is that that I have not, I haven't been granted a TL for since um, after until after 21 years. Okay, so now when um, TL is primarily for us to build our our independence in the community without without having supervision of course there's supervision at the programs that I go to which are in New Haven currently and I don't I don't feel that there has to be supervision from the uh, the Whiting Forensic Hospital, Dutcher Building, because because it's it's a chance for us to build our independence. And if we we can't be independent if we are supervised twenty four seven. And I think that me as a patient advocate since two thousand five. I have dealt with a lot of difficult situations. And for me, I went through a lot of trauma. I went through abandonment. And 
my family left me um left me alone and this is my chance to become independent and i can't become independent if i am supervised the whole time and not only that too is that the programs in new haven that i go to are very very helpful they're very supportive and they're um they help me when i need them and i don't think that it's right to um have supervised tls for our whole time that we're out there i think it's better for us to build that independence and become more more in tune and knowing how to use our supports and our community providers and find ways to deal with situations in an appropriate manner without having to be supervised 24 seven. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your testimony. Questions from the committee? Seeing none. Um, let's have a good day. Uh, Jake W. Uh, hello, my name is Jake Washer, and I am in stark opposition to House Bill 5509, specifically uh, Section 3-7 in said bill. To paint a picture on what it's like to be an acquittee under the jurisdiction of the Psychiatric Security Review Board, let me be brief. Throughout our days, we are assigned to multiple groups to help better us on society once we reach that point. We engage in drug rehab groups, AA to be specific. We participate in multiple occupational therapy groups where we learn how to cook along with how to mitigate stress and relaxation techniques. And to top it off, we have weekly meetings with psychotherapists to help rationalize our thoughts and create a better understanding of what we've done that got us to Whiting Forensic Hospital and Dutcher Hall in the first place. We, us acquitties, do so much work to better ourselves and now House Bill 5509 seeks to take all of that away. The passing of this bill will put more sanctions on the equities freedoms for temporary leaves and conditional release, more than convicted felons on probation, parole, and even special parole. It is painfully obvious that us equities be treated as such, not like those that have been convicted. A final statement, the PSRB work group is still in session and has yet to make their final report. Any new legislature about the status of Whiting, Dutcher, and other locations involved with us equities should be held off for the duration of time it will take for this report to be published with knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate being with us today. Christopher C. Hello, my name is Chris Craigwell. I'm here to talk about House Bill 5509. I'm in a proposal for it. Uh, when I heard about Bill 5509 and uh, basically them wanting to give us supervision from staff when we're in the community, we get supervision from the TL people when we're in the community. So it wouldn't make sense, it's kind of contradictory to give us more supervision while we're already in the community. And also I was thinking that would kind of not be good for the state. I don't know who would pay for it, who would fit the bill, but basically the, I don't know if the state would pay for it or if the hospital would pay for it, but I know that it'll cost money. And one thing that I know for sure is if the hospital has to pay for it, it'll slow down the TL process. Whereas many people that are on TLs now, it would be a lot lessened. And um, also the fact that when we get our NGRI uh, sentencing, uh, not guilty reason of insanity, not guilty reason of mental defect, when we come here, we stay at Whiting Forensic Building for years and years and years. We get evaluated by our team doctor on our primary team and we also get evaluated by a group of doctors in the administration before we get approved to come up to Dutcher Building. When we're in Dutcher Building, 
we have to get evaluated for a bunch of years before we get approved for TLs. And then the TL process is years on top of itself too. So it's not a quick process. We don't just get acquitted and we get to just go to the community quickly. It's not, it's not easy. And even though on TL process, the PSRB gives us a lot of stipulations. A lot of people get put on uh, monitored bracelets, probation. The PSRB gives, gives us rules that aren't laws. People will get stip all types of stipulations. Uh, can't get in cars, can't go to, uh, can't have people over your apartment or your group home, wherever you're at. So it is really monitored as it is. So to um, put more monitor on it wouldn't really do anything. It'd just be a lot more money given out for no particular reason. That's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Questions or comments? See you none. Appreciate being with us. Scott T. Concerning House Bill 5509 about Psychiatric Security Review Board, I put forth a vote of zero confidence in the Psychiatric Security Review Board's capability to competently handle information provided to their services. Two words the Senate should know well is information and misinformation. One question the Senate should ask is, what quality of information does the Psychiatric Security Review Board receive and consider? Misreporting and fraudulent reports are classified as misinformation. Misinformation misleads its reader into erroneous decisions which has disastrous consequences to the patients, equities, and human beings who then suffer as a result. What information should the Senate know? Among us patients, equities, and human beings with emotion, it is widely known that reports and testimony to the PSRB are at times full of inconsistencies, inaccuracies, and oftentimes failing to paint the whole picture of what occurs behind the walls and doors of Whiting Forensic Hospital. That means to indicate that us equities can give firsthand accounts of lies, misreports, and fraudulence provided to the PSRB. Two pieces of evidence is the fact that I have been misdiagnosed not once but twice while having a Superior Court judge verify civil suits against Whiting Forensic Hospital and the PSRB. What if it was your child who received maltreatment and could not be released because of non-participation for the purpose of self-protection? The Senate should be asking the question, how does a person obtain clear and convincing evidence that a person is not a danger to self or others? The answer is sinister. A person must incite another person to violence, physical, verbal, sexual. That's premeditation of enticing a person with mental illness to commit a crime. When following through on that premeditation, it is reckless endangerment and risk of injury to a person with mental illness. It is workplace violence, occupational safety hazard, and insurance liability, criminal mischief, and breach of peace. Yet still, it is a form of manufacturing psychiatric symptoms while potentially sowing seeds of future violence. Therefore, clear and convincing evidence standard puts lives and well-being in danger, enough so that one may call it a terrorist threat towards persons with mental illness, and in the very least, violating the right to be free from tyranny, oppression, and fear. I, for one, have first-handedly experienced the breaking of my ribs when my watch was forcibly removed and I was not acting to harm myself with such watch. They assaulted me. That's a crime. They reported it to the PSRB. I was acting aggressive to cover up the reason of my ribs fracturing. That's fraudulent reporting and manufacturing a false character profile. What if it was your child that you are forced to witness their suffering that way? I have firsthand experience that employees do attempt to incite patients to violence to clear and convincingly prove or disprove dangerousness to self or others. Senate should be asking, how does an equity with no income afford expensive doctors in order to obtain clear and convincing evidence that a patient should be released to a lesser restrictive setting? An equity cannot afford such expensive doctors and attorney, and really does an equity have a family who can do so? In Thank, you. Thank you, sir. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? Questions or comments? Seeing none, appreciate you um, being with us and, and your testimony. Uh, Tom Connors.
Tom Connors. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am in a quitty talking about the House Bill 5509. I do not approve of this bill. The biggest thing is, why is out of the 15 members that are a part of the PSRB work group committee, why is there some of them that are still employed by the state and victims on this PSRB work group? This is all detrimental to this equities a part of the PSRB. Even there was one that was part of the CVH Whiting Task Force who still is a employee down at Whiting Forensic Hospital. Within not approving House Bill 5509, focus on abolishment of the PSRB board, Focus on abolishment of the recommitment. Focus um, on the change to the language of the Patient Bill of Rights. Thank you, sir. Are we we're losing them. I'm still here. Oh, okay. Are, are you all set, sir? Is that that is my, that is what I would like to uh, bring up? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, we appreciate you being with us this morning. Thank you. I also submitted one that was uh, written as well. Okay. Great. We'll certainly look at the written testimony as well. Uh, Chaz. I'm here for Bill 5509. I um I'm against the bill. I believe that oh okay. I believe that patients should have the opportunity to be given the confidence to uh to show that they're capable of handling themselves outside of um the uh, the custody of a staff, especially after such a long incarceration. I mean, some of us have been here for over a decade, and uh if it doesn't make sense that all the time we put in with groups, medication, therapy, just core um, core building uh, responsibilities, you know, that we sh we we should have that that overlook. Uh, as we move on, we, we should be able to uh, to build that that um, that self. That capability of, of having the, the freedom to do what we can, I mean, as as a. Uh, as patients that have uh, been through what we've been through and done what we've done to improve who we are, um, I uh, I know a lot of guys that uh, that put a lot of work and care into like what they what they do here, and for for the uh, the ability and uh, the possibility of of having that freedom, so we can feel that just to get that fresh air in your lungs and that that step on the street, just to have that. Freedom is really important to us, and it's what we have fought for. I mean, a lot of people who have spent time in prison because of the crimes that we've committed are are out by now, and and they've 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 finished probation, and they're able to do what you know the average kind of freedom based civilian ritual includes. Um, this is supposed to be more of a rehabilitation process than a punishment, and I feel like what this bill is. Putting into action takes away from the idea that we are working towards something that everyone should have the ability um, to uh, to to manifest in their lives the freedom the idea of of being a um, an unincarcerated and uh, someone who can have privacy to what they want to do and uh, there will always be 
I mean, there's the board and there's there's going to have there's going to be drug tests. I mean, people have the Internet taken away at certain times and they're given privileges um, as they deserve them. But the idea of just constantly being watched and never being able to have that that place where you can really settle into yourself after such a long time of being behind closed doors and around staff and, and doctors, it doesn't seem right. Um, and I think uh, that's and that's why I disagree with this. Uh, Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Questions or comments? Seeing none, appreciate being with us. All right. Uh, Gregory Baylor. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Gregory S. Baylor, and I serve as senior counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom. Thank you for the opportunity to express our concerns with Senate Bill 425. Our primary concern stems from SB 425's reference to gender identity and expression. Let me state at the outset that no one should be denied health care based on simply who they are. It would be wrong, for example, for an emergency room doctor to refuse to treat a trans-identifying patient's broken ankle simply because he identifies as the opposite sex. Our concern is not with such potential applications of the proposed law. Instead, we anticipate that enforcement officials will interpret SB 425 to require healthcare professionals to respond to gender dysphoric individuals in particular ways, by injecting children with puberty blockers, by administering cross-sex hormones, and by performing mutilating and sometimes sterilizing surgeries. Our expectation that SB 425 will be interpreted this way is based on how Section 1557 of the Federal Affordable Care Act has been construed. It bans sex discrimination in the provision of health care, and both executive branch agencies and courts have interpreted that ban to require the provision of these particular responses to gender dysphoria. This likely interpretation of SB 425 is problematic for two reasons. First, many healthcare professionals object on conscience grounds to performing such interventions. A number of federal courts have agreed that the federal ACA section 1557 violates their consciences and cannot be legally applied to them. Second, mounting evidence indicates that the so that so-called gender affirming responses to gender dysphoric children often do not accomplish the goal of ameliorating the distress that characterizes gender dysphoria. Moreover, the multiple downsides of these interventions are becoming more apparent. Just last week, England's National Health Service stopped prescribing puberty blockers for gender dysphoric children because there is, quote, not enough evidence to support the safety or clinical effectiveness, close quote, of puberty suppressing hormones. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Some comments from the committee, seeing none, um, we move on to Mayor Elliker. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's, it's good to be here in person. Thank you for your service. These are really long hearings and I appreciate you uh, sitting through a lot of meaningful testimony. I, uh, I'm here to uh, testify in support of HB uh, 5413, which is an act uh, concerning the illegal use of certain vehicles and street takeovers. Uh, first of all, I want to underscore uh, just how grateful we are that the legislature has um, really given us a lot of additional tools to address ATV and dirt bike uh, uh, racing and riding through our streets. Uh, in particular, there's additional tools that we have to uh, implement fines, $1,000, $1,500, and $2,000, depending on the number of instances. Um, and uh, as we work to, uh, in New Haven and cities and towns across the state, confront this issue, we've realized that there's some other challenges. And uh, HB 413 helps us address a lot of those challenges. Um, specific to dirt bike and ATV riding, the current legislation doesn't allow us to destroy the vehicles. It only allows us to auction them off. And we do not want to auction them off because then they'll just cycle back into the community. We have a, around 125 in storage right now, and we like to destroy those vehicles. And the legislation would allow us to destroy them. Second, uh, if there's a lien on a vehicle, we are required to give it back to the operator, uh, and uh, we uh, the HB uh, 413 uh, will allow a lien holder 30 days to claim the vehicle, and if they do not claim the vehicle, then we can destroy that vehicle. Uh, third, it would allow us to implement fines for street takeovers. Uh, the current uh, statute does not cover street takeovers. 
and the the legislation that's proposed would uh, have a similar one thousand dollar fine for the first instance, fifteen hundred and two thousand for subsequent instances. So we'd allow it would allow us to have more tools to hold people that are involved in street takeovers accountable. Uh, then fourth, uh, it would improve license suspension consequences uh, for people involved in street takeovers. And then finally, uh, we're looking for some uh, grant funding for regional collaboration. We've been working really well with a lot of our partnering towns to increase our resources to respond to these uh, incidents that happen, not just in one municipality, but often these rides will uh, go across many municipalities. And we'd love to see the state help support those regional efforts by providing some funding. Again, want to thank you for your time, and I'm open to any questions. Questions or comments? Representative Fishman. Thank you, Mayor, for coming here today and expressing your um, your comments. You know, with regard to the ATVs that you're in the possession of, approximately 125 of them, um, is it perhaps uh, an opportunity for your municipality to um, have a program through your park and rec or something like that to make some of those available in a in a instructional way for maybe some some kid you know certainly we don't want trails being blazed but you know is that maybe an opportunity that you could undertake with some of that property that you're in possession of because you know, right now you can only auction them or under this bill you could destroy them you know i'm just mm -hmm. asking is there a middle ground where you could retain them to utilize for town services or maybe um I know in, in Wallingford, we had a big thing over um, our uh, fire department getting one. So use one or two for um, public safety. I uh, appreciate the spirit behind your question. Uh, we have no need for these vehicles for municipal operations. And you know, frankly, I think with, you know, for example, of youth and recreation, Part of the draw of uh, the individuals that are interested in doing these activities now is being able to skirt the law, ride in large groups, go through red lights, speed through our neighborhoods. Uh, we actually had um, years ago, some of our officers engage with some of the people that were riding and offer them to take them to ride or drive them to a legal site in Connecticut because there's one or two legal sites where people can ride dirt bikes. And that program did not work because there was just no interest by the people participating because, frankly, I think there's a lot of interest in uh, disobeying the law. And so uh, I can't speak for Wallingford, but in New Haven, we're not interested in that option. Well, I appreciate I appreciate yeah. that and your perspective. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Further questions or comments? Um, Mayor, I could, I could just ask you, I mean, so... Uh, I, I certainly understand where this bill is coming from. We have a similar issue in Bridgeport as, as you do in New Haven, and certainly I've heard from my constituents on this. I think the one section of this bill I struggle with is Section 5, um, which, uh, as presently constituted, would impose a mandatory minimum sentence, which I don't think it's any surprise to anybody in this room. I, I oppose all of them um, uh, for even a mere bystander um is the way the public defender's office is is reading this uh, you know uh, it seems that seems a little draconian to me um seems to go a bit too far um i know this was a proposal that came out of i think a ccm working group and i'm wondering kind of from your perspective as as an urban mayor kind of how critical that provision is or whether you think this bill would still um have its intended effect if if we do what, frankly, maybe to show my hands, but we strip Section 5 out of this bill. Uh, understood. Not surprised that you have that question, Representative Stafter, and we've talked a lot about uh, other legislation in the past. So uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, my understanding of the proposed legislation is that uh, people that are convicted, convicted, I think is an important word, word here, of participating and that could be a spectator have their license suspended for 45 days and if they're driving with their license suspended similar to dui they're caught violating again a, a law then they have the mandatory fine and minimum sentence so uh it, it is someone that has uh gone through a, a legal process and been convicted and then beyond that has still uh persisted in violating uh the law so i think that person has had multiple opportunities to um correct their their behavior and has chosen not to do so 
Um, at the same time, we, we want these tools, as many tools as possible to get across the finish line here. And uh, I can see a pathway for someone that is uh, actually operating a vehicle having such a severe consequence, but someone that may be spectating not having a severe, as a severe consequence. I think the important thing, as you know, or as we, as you know, all know more than anyone, it's hard to get these uh, legislation, legislative proposals across the finish line. We really wanted to get across the finish line. So I just, just to be clear though, so on the, on the mandatory minimum, on the license suspension, the license suspension, the, the license suspension doesn't have to result from street late racing for this to apply. So if I fail to renew my driver's license, right? Maybe I move, I didn't get notice of it, whatever, but I've got a suspended driver's license for whatever reason, right? Could be completely, could be I'd never engaged in street racing. I, I don't have a whole bunch of moving violations. I just forgot to renew my license. I then am a bystander in street racing with a suspended driver's license for something unrelated. As I read this language, the mandatory minimum would still apply. Do you read it the same way? I don't have the language in front of me. So the, the intention as we discussed with CCM was that someone who had been convicted of and being involved in street racing, and that would include a spectator, would then have their license suspended. And if their license were suspended and they operated their vehicle and were caught operating that vehicle within the 45 days would be uh would would receive the mandatory minimum in the five hundred dollar fine. That is that is my understanding of what we initially uh suggested. Uh so if the if okay. the language conflicts with that, you know, I'm I'm fine with changing it. Okay. All right. Well, we'll we'll dig into it a little bit more. But I just I, like I said, that was most of this bill I think is great bill. Totally support it. You know, um happy to see it moving forward. I just that's that one caught a red flag for me. I, I expected it would. Further questions or comments? Representative Quinn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mayor. Nice to see you. Um, again, on Section 5, it, it appears to me that what the attempt is to mirror the statute for DUI. Correct. Um, under a suspension for a DUI, a person can get a work permit within 45 days. Is it the intention that that would also apply in this circumstance, I, I don't, I don't think there is any intention of influencing whether someone can or cannot get a work permit. Uh, we want people to obey the law. The intention is for people to obey the law, and for people that uh, on multiple occasions do not, the intention is for uh, them to have some consequences. But you know, frankly, I think that um, uh, changing someone's ability to get a job is not a very productive way of uh, correcting uh, bad behavior. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you for being here. Uh, next on the list is Jordan Fairchild. And the microphone is on, so you can go ahead with your three minutes. Okay. Um, Good morning. Is it still morning, <laughs> members of the Judiciary Committee? My name is Jordan Fairchild, and I am the Executive Director of Keep the Promise Coalition, a grassroots coalition of advocates with lived experience of mental distress, life-altering trauma, and psychiatric system involvement. Keep the Promise Coalition builds community power for human rights, self-determination, and racial and social justice in Connecticut's mental health system. I'm here today to testify in opposition to sections three through seven of House Bill 5509. Um, and I just wanted to start with some context, which is that in 2022, advocates, including people committed at Whiting Forensic Hospital, came before this committee, or actually the Public Health Committee rather, to urge the passage of what is now Public Act 2245. This bill represented some, but not nearly all of the recommendations of the CBH Whiting Task Force, five years following the abuse of Bill Shahadi by Whiting staff members. One of the important changes that was brought about with the passage of this bill was that the Psychiatric Security Review Board is now required to consider the safety and well-being of equities as a primary concern next to their public safety charter. 
This change to consider the safety and well being of patients was a necessary response given the context of patient abuse, which necessitated the task force and Public Act 2245 in the first place. We're therefore gravely concerned that this bill would now claw back this progress by demoting the PSRB's mandated consideration of equity, safety, and well being to a secondary concern. Whiting is supposed to be a hospital and not a prison, yet without meaningful measures in place to ensure a safe healing environment and with the ability to indefinitely recommit individuals to treatment beyond their maximum term of commitment and little hope of release, the PSRB structure does more to hinder recovery and patient well-being than it does to promote it. The task force recommended abolishing the PSRB. Instead of enacting the necessary changes recommended by the task force, this bill would make things worse for people committed at Whiting. Um, in my written testimony, I've included several other aspects of this bill in sections three through seven, which would uh, really hinder civil liberties of people that are under the jurisdiction of the board, which we are opposed to. As a reminder, Whiting Forensic Hospital's patient population is 37% black, which is twice as black as Connecticut as a whole. These policies will therefore have a disparate racial impact, disproportionately harming black and brown people. Last year, the stated reason for not passing SB 926, which would have ended the practice of recommitment under the PSRB, was that the newly formed PSRB working group had not yet made its final report. We therefore urge the committee to not legislate on the PSRB, and take no further action on sections three through seven of this bill until the working group's final report is complete. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from members of the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Uh, Josiah Schley. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes, go right ahead. Uh, good afternoon to the Judiciary Committee. I uh, first off wanted to thank you for your hard work on SB 444. As it appears to me, it seems like it's HB 6787 from last year reincarnated. And I appreciate the edits to that bill and the changes that were made to remove the five year wait time and a number of the problematic things in that bill. And also in regard to SB 445 and HB 5509, uh, the cannabis aspects of those bills, um, I don't understand why when the entire basis for the um, recreational cannabis program in Connecticut is social equity, why are we writing laws at the same time while well, SB 444 is up, why are we writing laws to make more routes to have cannabis criminalized again and see more cannabis arrests? It seems incredibly counterproductive. And when the harm is known, I do not know why laws like this are trying to be put back into place when everybody knows because it's a basis for the legalization of cannabis and the social equity that these laws are harming minorities disproportionately. So I, I just cannot fathom why the cannabis section of these bills were even proposed again. And I'd just like to thank you again for SB 444. I hope it doesn't die before the end of the session, like HB 6787 did last year. And Thank you for your work, and I just really hope the cannabis language in 445 and 5509 does not get passed, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your testimony. Seeing no questions or comments from members of the committee, thank you again for your time and your testimony. Next, thank we will hear from Gretchen Carlson, who will be followed by Brooke Foley. Welcome, Gretchen. The floor is yours. Gretchen, if you can unmute yourself and uh, turn on your camera, we're ready to hear your testimony. 
welcome. So sorry. Uh, members of the committee, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to testify today on the very important issue of NDAs in the workplace. I'm here today to support Senate Bill 361, an act concerning the impermissible use of non-disclosure agreements in the workplace. My name is Gretchen Carlson. I'm a resident of Greenwich, Connecticut. I'm also the woman who sued the former chair and CEO of Fox News, Roger Ailes, for harassment and retaliation, helping to ignite the Me Too movement. My story may be public, but I have been silenced by an NDA, prohibiting me from ever disclosing what really happened. I may never get my voice back, but I'm here today to make sure others can. After my story, I heard from thousands of women who all shared the same vicious cycle. They had also faced harassment in the workplace, had the courage to come forward, were subsequently pushed out of their jobs, and then silenced. I knew I had to do something about it. So I joined forces with Julie Raginsky, another colleague from Fox News. We created a nonprofit, Lift Our Voices. We became laser focused on eliminating two silencing mechanisms in the workplace that keep these issues under wraps, forced arbitration and NDAs. Silence in America is an epidemic. One third of all Americans sign NDAs on their first day of work. Most people have no idea that they're giving up their voice for anything that happens to them in the future. And let me be clear, we're all in favor of NDAs at work to protect trade secrets and proprietary information, but they become so much more far reaching that it's like you're walking around the office with a muzzle on. It's why we worked so hard to get two bipartisan bills passed in 2022 on Capitol Hill, the Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Act and the Speak Out Act, which eliminates pre-dispute NDAs for sexual misconduct at work. These are two of the biggest labor law changes in the last 100 years. And now we're in Connecticut because at the state level, we can get even more work done. So the bill that I'm advocating for today would eliminate NDAs, not just for harassment and assault issues, but for all toxic workplace issues, including race, gender, age, sexual orientation, disability discrimination, et cetera. This bill puts the power back in the hands of the people. If we've learned anything since the beginning of this movement, the only way to fix bad behavior at work is to be able to talk about it. We need to stop silencing people with NDAs because every worker deserves a voice. I encourage all members of the committee on both sides of the aisle to support these important measures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your testimony. Are there questions or comments from members of the committee? Representative Blumenthal. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Gretchen, for your testimony. Uh, it's good to see you here today, and we appreciate you being with us. Um, I had a couple questions. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to be clear on a, on one thing about your story. So you mentioned that your story is public, but you're silenced. Could you explain that for us, please? Yes, because uh, I had to sign a very onerous NDA upon my resolution at Fox News. Um, which means that movies have been made about my story, miniseries have been made about my story, and I could not participate, number one, um, nor can I even tell this committee today whether or not any of the depictions of my life and my story are actually accurate. That is how far-reaching the tentacles are of the NDA that I had to sign and that th thousands and thousands of other Americans have to sign for simply doing nothing wrong at work but having the courage to come forward. Thank you. So it sounds like basically everyone else on earth almost can talk about your story except you. Is that fair to say? Yes, that, that is incredibly fair to say. Um, and, and I am just one voice of thousands of people who've been silenced. Um, it's become my life's work to make sure that I can work as hard as I can to change the system. Um, anything I do on this issue will be far more important than anything I did as a journalist for 30 plus years. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to ask you a couple questions about the bill um, in regard to, um, first of all, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, so there are some people who would say that, uh, particularly in the business community, that NDAs help encourage settlement in cases where there's, there's a dispute about harassment, abuse, discrimination, or something like that. Um, what would you say to that? 
I would say that that's the old school way of looking at these things. Uh, what we've learned at our organization, Lift Our Voices, after doing a study in the state of New Jersey, which was the first state to ban NDAs for all protected classes, is that originally lawyers were very concerned about that NDA ban because they figured that they would not be able to get to settlement terms with organizations. And it turns out that our study shows that it's exactly the opposite, that nothing has actually changed. And in fact, the, uh, the trial lawyers in New Jersey are now 100% in support of the legislation that was passed there because it's made no difference in their efforts to get justice for their survivors. The best way to describe this is that why do we need to get silence from somebody simply for never working again? That is not where the power should be held. The power should be with the survivor to be able to own the story. They may not want to come forward and many may not ever come forward, but the power should still be with them to be able to own their own story. And it's incredibly important to know that in the future, uh, these settlements are still going to happen whether or not the person has a voice or not. Thank you. And, and you mentioned um, the idea of where power is located in these relationships. Um, would you mind talking about, to the extent you can, in your experience, either in your personal experience or uh, in your work for Lift Our Voices, uh, how the power dynamics in an employment relationship relationship may shape uh, someone's relationship to their ability to tell their story in agreement to an NDA? Yeah, so you know, you're the 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 employee going up against a big company or even a middle sized company or even a small company. Uh, you do not hold the power. Um, and when an NDA can be weaponized against you, it happens like this. We will settle with you for $10 if you sign an NDA and never, ever own your own story. And we will give you $1 if you don't want to sign an NDA. Well, what is the employee going to do? And that's what's happening all across America every day, um, unless, of course, you are part of the group of one third of all Americans that sign NDAs on their very first day of work. So you're actually muzzled before you start your first day of work for anything that might happen to you in the future. Um, but NDAs can crop up at many different times in employment. One third of all Americans sign them on the first day, but then you go to report something that happened to you and an NDA can crop up then immediately. You know, we'll give you two weeks off. Why don't you go rest and sign this document? Um, and many people in a fragile state, emotional state, aren't thinking through completely. They can't afford to go to a lawyer. And so they sign a document. And the number one question I get from survivors is, when do I get my voice back? And unfortunately, if they've signed the document, the answer is never. Had I known seven and a half years ago when I signed the document that I would become one of the primary advocates of eliminating NDAs in the workplace and that I would have actually been able to have had so much success in doing so, I would have never ever signed it because my voice is so much more important than any dollar. Thank you for that answer. And I think you raised an important point. Um, you know, I, you, you've told this part of your story, you know, I, I'm, you're a sophisticated person. You were a journalist at a major news organization. I'm sure you were, uh, well represented by counsel, but a lot of people in these situations are not in your situation. Um, you know, they may be, you know, an employee at Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's or um, in some other situation uh, where they don't even know to go to a lawyer. Um, so I, I think that's really uh, Im important to point out that there's a huge amount of people who sign NDAs um, who don't necessarily have the level of sophistication to know their rights or to know that it may be useful to talk to a lawyer. Um, and um, you talked a bit about the experience in New Jersey, which was the state, the first state to pass a law like that, this. Um, what if any other states have passed NDA uh, bans and do we know anything about the experience in those states? Yes, so after New Jersey four and a half years ago, California passed a ban on NDAs about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, and then Washington State followed suit. Um, and we have been working in the state of New York as well as now in Connecticut. Um, so 
this is, you know, becoming uh, a part of the process of workers being able to um, be able to get their voices back. And it's it's part of the movement. Um, as I always say that um, we should think about that the train has left the station. Um, and, and so we should do what's right for our employees um, and stop this epidemic of silencing them. Thank you very much. Um, and then I just have one or two more questions with the committee's indulgence. Um, this bill, as it's currently written, um, has an exception for, in the case of a settlement after a legal claim, um, the amount of the settlement or other terms of the settlement. Um, I take it that you're uh, okay with that exception to uh, the NDA ban? Yes. Um, all right. I think those are my questions for right now. I really appreciate you uh, bringing your voice uh, to this committee uh, and to this legislature. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I think even lawyers until recently have not thought seriously about the profound costs of NDAs and the ways that they can deprive people of their voices. I think that many plaintiff's lawyers out there have signed uh, NDAs or uh, confidentiality provisions as part of settlements and never really thought seriously about the fact that they were agreeing for their client never to be able to tell their story again. It just hasn't been a focus as much. And so I think that, first of all, you uh, working on this issue across the country is vitally important for everyone to be aware of the cost of NDAs. But I also think that it provides a uh, a, a strong argument for a bill like this one to be passed here in the state of Connecticut as well as across the country. So uh, I appreciate your testimony today and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative. Other questions or comments from members of the committee? Representative Fishbein. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, ma'am. Uh, nice to see you here today. Um, and I don't want to talk about your particular case because I know you know you're you're bound to certain things but you said had i known that i signed away of my rights i would not have am i to understand that you did not review the the agreement that you signed no um it's because it was considered to be the way that things were done seven and a half years ago that uh just as much as NDAs have, be, have exploded in workplace contracts over the last 30 to 40 years to be so much more inclusive than just trade secrets, um, it also became sort of the way that these settlements got done was that the old way of looking at it was, well, we'll hand you a dollar and then you won't have your voice anymore and then we'll both walk away. So what I'm now a proponent of is saying that that is an old way of looking at it. The new way of looking at it is that we shouldn't just automatically move to silencing the person for having the courage to come forward and saying that something's wrong. So no, this had nothing to do with me not understanding. But I will also just add that these NDA clauses uh, for millions of Americans, it's not like it's spelled out when you read it saying you will never own your own voice. I mean, a very highly educated person could read an NDA clause and have no idea that it's more expansive than just proprietary information or trade secrets. Okay, I, I just, I, I think my question was whether or not you read what you signed. Yes, and what okay. I said is that I've been a main proponent over the last seven and a half years of trying to change the old school way of looking at things. Well, when you say the old school way of, I mean, NDAs are used for various different cases. And I'm just trying to, you know, because I've had cases that I've represented people that signed NDAs, and I've had cases that I've represented clients that wanted NDAs. So I've been on both sides of these. And in, in my practice, I usually email that to my client beforehand saying, you know, this is what's going to get signed, or this is what you're you're looking to get signed. I, you know, basically describe what it says, what it means. I give them an opportunity to ask me any questions. And, and I'm pretty clear, at least when I do these cases, that my client knows what they're signing. But 
Um, am I to understand that in your story that you opted not to um, have a trial where you perhaps could tell your story and instead you signed off on the NDA in exchange for compensation? No. Um, but what you don't know about my story is that I also had a forced arbitration clause, which is the second evil silencing mechanism in the workplace that has exploded over the last 40 years. In this year, 84% of all Americans will have forced arbitration clauses in their workplace handbook or contracts. In 1991, 2% of Americans had them. So what that means is that I could not seek justice through my Seventh Amendment right of going to a jury. So okay. to answer your question, I would have been forced into arbitration, which is secret, where the employer picks your arbitrator for you, and where only 2% of the time does the employee actually win. So that is also a dire set of circumstances for employees across America. Um, so no, I was not even afforded justice to be able to go to an open court. Um, and so that, that process was not available to me. Okay, but that's separate and apart from the NDA situation, right? Right. And my argument about the NDA, with all due respect, sir, is that we should give the power back to the survivor to either decide if they want to come forward or not. So why do we need an NDA? Many people will want to remain silent, but at least they have the power within them to know that they own their own truth and their own story if they ever want to speak. Yeah, that no, is the I new way of looking at it. I totally agree, but you're talking about the NDA, at least that's before us today, is the end of a resolution of a dispute. A employee makes an accusation that something happened, um, some lawsuit or proceeding is filed, and in resolution of that case, the NDA is signed. That's That's the process that we're dealing with in this legislation, right? Yes. Okay. So what if the victim wants to have an NDA? They they are comfortable with that. And and you know, my thought along that lines is many times like a, a prenup or something like that. You have certain rules that if there's going to be this um contract that an individual has an opportunity to go talk to a, a separate lawyer um, and, and all of that stuff. I mean, would you be comfortable with some middle of the road so that you don't just shut the door on this process? Uh, under this law, if it passes, people would still be able to request an NDA. It just wouldn't be enforceable. Yeah, so it's worth nothing. It's I mean, <laughs> Well, no, because then they can choose. No, they could request it because they don't want it. To, they don't want to talk about it. Okay, but so, yeah, so then if they don't want to talk about it, then then it's not useless. Okay, but if let's just say they are willing to do that in exchange for additional compensation, why would somebody pay additional compensation if it's worth nothing? They're not buying anything, right? So, you know, sometimes in these cases, a resolution is made based upon uh, not having to publicly defend accusations, not having to, you know, try a case in the press as opposed to utilizing the process. So a purchase is made for that, that closure. Uh, this would bar that, right? No, people could still request an NDA but it's unenforceable. If they don't want to speak, they won't. Okay, but well, I mean, we're going in a circle. Why would somebody pay for something that's unenforceable? So That's the old way of looking at things, sir, but I appreciate your opinion. Right. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you, Representative. Are there other questions or comments from members of the committee? Um, seeing none, I have a few questions. Um, thank you again um, for your time and your testimony today and for your advocacy uh, on these issues overall. Um, I want to just sort of set the table 
um, in terms of the cultural shift that you've been talking about. And I want to emphasize a point that you made um, that as many as one third of all employees on day one of their employment in the midst of signing all of the paperwork that you sign when you start a new job, an exciting time, you're signing a number of different documents and you're telling us that up to one third of all Americans are signing these kinds of agreements the day they start that first job. Um, and you talked about how um, there's been a cultural shift that has happened. And I want to take a moment to thank you for being one of the key brave people to step forward and start this cultural shift that has happened in the way that we talk about these issues. So if you could just walk us through, um, you know, as we've seen more and more brave people step forward and say, I've experienced this kind of behavior in the workplace, it's unacceptable. We've seen an increase in how many employers are asking people to sign these agreements uh, from the beginning. How do those two things seem to be happening simultaneously. Can you talk a little bit about why you see that happening? Why I see the increase in NDAs over time? The increase in NDAs in a moment when more and more people who have experienced discrimination in the workplace are finding the courage and the bravery as you did to step forward and say, this is unacceptable and I'm not going to put up with it anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that it is um, that they work in, in, in tandem, that the more people come forward, um, the more maybe that others want them to be silenced. Um, but but. I have come to find out over the last couple of years that there are companies out there and there are states out there that believe that the real sense of justice is giving the voice back to the person who has the courage to come forward. And a lot of the emphasis that we should be putting on these issues is not about silencing the people, but actually stopping the behavior before we even get to that point. Um, and, and I always say that it's sort of a backwards way of looking at it that we're talking so much about clamping down on the voices of people instead of really focusing our efforts on actually stopping the bad behavior at work. But yes, there has been uh, on parallel paths, more people have had the courage to come forward. Um, and, and hopefully uh, this is a movement that's not going to stop in that direction. Thank you, I appreciate that. And, and my concern is that as we've seen more people bravely coming forward and telling their stories, we've seen this rise in NDAs so that instead of having uh, the silence breaking, making the change in individual workplaces that we all want to see, instead, the increased use of NDAs are contributing to the perpetuation of that silence and not allowing uh, that discrimination from finally coming out in the open and for those workplaces where they have cultures that allow this to this kind of behavior to continue, it's preventing that change from fully taking hold. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, the scope of these NDAs, the limitations? You, you've said very clearly today that everyone in the world can talk about what happened to you except for you. But there's, I think it's, we need to dig down a little bit as to what that really means. You cannot talk to a doctor about what happened, a therapist, a, a lawyer, um, someone in your family. What are the limitations? You can't talk with anybody. Is that correct? Uh, well, I can speak to my lawyer about it, uh, but other than that, it's far-reaching tentacles of silence, yes. And that's the case for most NDAs. Again, a document that many people, a third of all Americans, are signing on their first day of work. Yes, with most people having no knowledge that that's actually what they're signing. And you also emphasize that that these NDAs are are about discrimination, discriminatory practices that are happening in the workplace. This limitation, this proposal is not going to limit access to trade secrets. It's not going to act, limit access to proprietary information. And I assume that's a concern that you all heard in um, New Jersey when you were first advocating for a similar proposal. And I wonder if you could talk through what those concerns were in that state almost five years ago and how that study um, that you also referenced has shown that many of those concerns haven't come to pass. Uh, yes. I mean, the first question is usually asked, uh, shouldn't companies be able to protect their private information? And of course, the answer to that is yes. And that was actually the original intent of non-disclosure agreements in the workplace. 
It was so that if you worked at one particular company and knew a secret formula that you couldn't walk across the street and give it to the competitive company. But over time, there's been an explosion of these NDAs uh, becoming far more expansive as to anything that happens to you at work. And people are not aware that that's what they're signing. That's one way that NDAs can be used against you in the workplace. But as I said earlier, they can also crop up at many other times during employment and be used as power over you. Um, you know, if you sign this document, we'll give you this. And that's not the way that that things should should happen inside the workplace, in my opinion. And just to, to, to add more to it, uh, you asked about the, the New Jersey study on NDAs. Um, and, and that study showed that there has been no change in the settlements that employees have been able to receive in that state, nor has there been any change in the dollar amount, even though they're not able to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for your time and your testimony. Seeing no further questions from members of the committee, thank you again. Thank uh, you. Next, we will hear from Brooke Foley, who will be followed by Mary Valdovinas. Good afternoon, Chairpersons, Ranking Members, and Honorable Members of the Committee. My name is Brooke Foley. I'm from the Insurance Association of Connecticut. The insurance industry is one of the largest industries in the state and is vital to the state's economy. We oppose Senate Bill 361 and Section 3 of Senate Bill 4, which address non-disclosure non agreements, as we just were talking about. Um, non-disclosure agreements, or NDAs, are important tools for businesses, including insurers. This legislation is overly broad and would harm businesses, including insurers. It would prevent businesses from protecting their reputations and the damages provisions are needlessly punitive and would create a new cause of action for employees and encourage unnecessary litigation. Senate Bill 361 broadly prohibits NDAs. It doesn't limit the prohibition to employment situations involving incidents of sexual harassment and misconduct. It prohibits NDAs uh, relating to virtually any negative employment situation, including where the employee subjectively region reasonably believes to be an impermissible discrimination, harassment, retaliation, or against a clear mandate of public policy. It also expands the definition of employee to include not just employees, by, but independent contractors. And it further erodes longstanding distinctions between employees and independent contractors. Section three of Senate Bill four makes it a discriminatory practice for an employer to enforce or even ask for an employee to sign an NDA or a confidential agreement in a settlement situation. Both of these bills would make an employer liable to an employee for a minimum of $10,000 in statutory damages and attorney's fees. Further, Senate Bill four does not address the issue of retroactivity. Contracts that predate the effective date of this legislation should be able to be enforced and this language should be explicitly included in the bill. This legislation would disincentivize employers from settling actual or potential claims. Keeping matters confidential helps businesses avoid unwanted publicity about a negative event or occurrence. These agreements allow an employee to be compensated for an underlying harm while protecting the business at the same time. There's little value to employers in settlement if an employee can collect a payment and then publicly disparage the employer any way they see fit after the agreement is signed. This language makes the standard of liability for an employer completely uncertain and rest on subjective belief of an employee who, would who then has a monetary incentive to make unfounded claims due to the minimum $10,000 of damages in the bill. We recognize that the goal of this legislation is to prevent unlawful discrimination, sexual harassment, and other misconduct in the workplace, and we support those goals. However, this legislation would harm business and would prevent businesses from protecting their rep reputation and expose employers to increased litigation, and we urge you to vote no on these bills. Thank you for considering our comments. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Uh, Mary Valdofinos? Yes, hi. 
Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Winfield and Staffstrom, Vice Chairs Flexer and Quinn, Ranking Members Kissel and Fishbein, and Distinguished Members of the Judiciary Committee for granting me the opportunity to provide my testimony in support of House Bill 5508, an act concerning recommendations from the Juvenile Justice Policy and Oversight Committee. My name is Mary Valdivinos. I am a Norwalk resident and wear many hats as a community advocate, care coordinator, credible messenger, and a member of Full Circle Youth Empowerment's JJPO community expertise work group. I am also a justice impacted woman who spent over a third of my life in the system starting as a teen. As a young person who found herself stuck in a decade long revolving door of our legal system, I faced great difficulties navigating services and agencies, particularly with the stipulations of probation hanging over my head at times. Stints of homelessness and incarceration intensified my own struggles, and I often felt turned away by the very agencies meant to help me. At the time, it would have been incredible to be connected with a support system upon reentry, especially one that I could relate to, such as a credible messenger. While this may not have been the sole solution for me, having someone to support me and understand my experiences could have made a significant difference in preventing my recidivism and pulling myself out of a dark place. Today, I am a credible messenger myself. I mentor at-risk youth. Recently, one of my mentees who was on the brink of arrest herself was able to switch schools with my help and is now thriving academically. She just made the honor roll. Prior to us working together, she was suspended constantly and fell out of place, triggering her to rebel more. However, she now knows she has at least one strong support system to turn to in times of need or isolation. This is just one example of the difference a credible messenger can make in the life of a young person. Despite my own turnaround, the system still restricts individuals like me from fully serving as mentors to those in the juvenile justice system due to our criminal history. Yet, our experience should be valued. I am proof that individuals can change and find a way out. Young people crave relatable mentors who will listen and care. And as a care coordinator, I see firsthand the positive impact of support and guidance in reentry. Some of the individuals I work with come home after spending a decade or more imprisoned, and employment opportunities offer them a lifeline that aids them in avoiding return to the lifestyle that got them in trouble in the first place. HB 5508 not only expands mentorship programs and connects youth to employment opportunities, but it also incorporates gender responsiveness. This is crucial in today's context as we recognize the unique needs and experiences of young people in the justice system. Gender responsive approaches acknowledge the intersection of gender, trauma, and justice involvement, ensuring that services address specific challenges faced by young people. By incorporating this into reentry initiatives, we can better meet the needs of all youth and provide equitable opportunities for success. Supporting this bill is a vital step towards creating a more inclusive and effective juvenile justice system by Thank empowering you. youth reentry. Thank you for, Thank you for your time. testimony. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us. Tanya Hughes and Cheryl Sharp. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, Representative Fishbein, Senator Kissel, and the distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding Senate Bill 4. My name is Tanya Hughes. I'm the Executive Director at the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunity. And with me is Deputy Director Cheryl Sharp. And we thank you for the indulgence in allowing us to testify virtually this morning or this afternoon due to competing interests. We're testifying in support of SB 4, in particular session, Section 3 related to the impermissible use of non-disclosure agreements in the workplace. Several states already prohibit non-disclosure agreements for good reason. Non-NDAs appear when some employers require prospective or new employees to sign an NDA as a term of beginning their employment or in settlement agreements that prevent victims of discrimination and harassment from not only discussing the details of that agreement, but can also prevent the victim from discussing whether or not the harassment even occurred. We believe this is problematic. We heard earlier and often find that there is an immense power differential between an employee and employer, which results in many individuals feeling as if they do not have a choice in signing on to an NDA, even when they may not want to. 
employers frequently insist on having an NDA in any settlement agreement for fear that others would learn about the settlement and file their own lawsuits. I have an aunt who used to say frequently, secrets keep you in bondage. It was her way of empowering me to speak up and speak truth to power, meaning that secrecy permits bad actors to continue to discriminate against others. And as we have seen during the Me Too movement and during the numerous other sexual abuse cases that have been in the news for years, individual settlements of harassment claims with confidentiality clauses permit the harasser to move on to their next victim with impunity. Multiple other states, perhaps most notably Washington in 2022, have already passed legislation prohibiting NDAs, and we agree it's time for Connecticut to join those states to remove the secrecy and protect employees instead of harassers. With respect to SB 425, the commission also supports this bill, which makes it a discriminatory practice for a health care provider to discriminate against an individual based on their protected class status. We fully support the explicit jurisdiction in SB 425. However, rather than creating a new section, we suggest adding this language to Connecticut General Statute Section 46A64, which covers public accommodations, discrim public, discriminatory public accommodations practices. And we thank you for the opportunity to offer this testimony. Both Attorney Sharp and I are available to answer any questions you have for us. Thank you. Um, so I do have a question, actually. I was just uh, noodling up here. So we we heard a question earlier that I I don't have the answer to, and I'm, I'm so I want to ask it again. So say you have a situation where you have an employee who or, or an individual who does want um, an NDA wants wants the fact that they may have brought a claim against a former employer. Uh, to be shielded from disclosure. So take, for example, someone alleges harassment at employer A. They go and they take a job at employer B. Um, but they were other, they they had a good relationship with their former boss, per se, and want to use that person as a reference. Uh, and they're worried about the employer uh, at employee B calling employer A and them saying, well, yeah, you know, that person was a really good employee. They worked hard, you know, very trustworthy, very honest. Um, and then the employee says, okay, great. Is there anything else from their time? Why did they leave? And they say, well, they left because there was an allegation of sexual harassment and we ended up having to settle that out. Um, and they don't want that to be disclosed, which I think under this language, the you know, without the NDA, um, the first employer, particularly if asked a direct question, I think we actually have law in this state that says you have to give a honest and truthful recommendation when asked for one. Um, uh, how do we avoid that situation? Good morning, um, or good afternoon now. Uh, that is a very interesting question and one that I actually posed um, in the discussion about the NDAs and the language. And uh, what we were wondering is, is whether there's an opportunity for us to, um, if that is a scenario, uh, to uh, to work on the language a little bit to uh, create that exception when the uh, individual who's been uh, subjected or makes an allegation of being subjected to a legal uh, uh, discriminatory uh, actions by the uh, employer um, that th we carve out that as an exception is is that a uh, possibility that uh, this uh, committee would be willing to uh, create um, the the harm uh, or the likelihood of a complaining party wanting that type of uh, protection is uh, certainly a, a reality however it is much um, uh, uh, fewer people will be impacted uh, than the number of people who will be impacted by the protection of having this um, uh, law passed. Um, when people are subjected to illegal discrimination is a very painful process. 
whether the, their claim is um, actually found to be a uh, reasonable cause and then found to be uh, that they were actually subjected to discrimination. Um, and so the protection needed for that, uh, and if when we're doing a weighing uh, process, um, you know, is very great. Uh, so that is the same question that we were, uh, uh, I think you used the word noodling around or batting around. Um, we, we had that same uh, conversation. So that was the outcome is whether there is an opportunity to work to, to carve out that ex exception if necessary. Um, we are certainly willing and open to d doing that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, so to answer your question, um, yes, uh, there is an opportunity to work on language. We're still relatively early in, in our process here, but, um, you know, if you could get us some revised language, um, preferably before our deadline next week, that would be helpful. Um, but, it, you know, it just seems to me that it, I agree with you. It's probably not the majority circumstance. But right. I would think we'd want to give a victim of sexual harassment um, the opportunity to say, look, I, I want to put this behind me. I don't want anybody to know about it. I don't want, uh, you know, future, you know, I don't want to have to ask for a recommendation from the pre previous employer and it somehow comes up or or whatever. Um, and if they want the option to uh, uh, to have a non-disclosure particularly against the employer, uh, then then I would think we would want to provide that option to the person. Yes, and, and like I, I said, we, we have thought about that as well and agree that um, that is something that we should certainly discuss and, um, and, and work uh, through. And uh, we have our team of attorneys who will um, are now watching and will start to work on it right now um, and get that language to you before your deadline. Amazing how people find time to get us language before our deadlines around here. Uh, questions, comments, concerns, uh, Vice Ch uh, Chair Flexer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Thank you both um, for your testimony today and for your work um, on this legislation with us. Um, I just wondered if you could speak to whatever degree is possible about how many people come to your office, they've experienced workplace discrimination. And I think it's important to point out that obviously your office doesn't just deal with issues of sexual harassment, but all forms of workplace um, discrimination. If you could just speak to how often people come to you and they're surprised that they can't talk, that they can't um, that they can't speak out, that they can't say anything. You know, what's what's the experience of the people who are coming to your office and the, and they're frustrated um, that they find themselves in this situation? So we have um, under our law twenty eight uh, protected classes. Um, you know, many many people are covered, and we receive, um, investigate, um, and initiate in investigations, prosecute, adjudicate thousands and thousands of complaints of discrimination uh, every year. There's a lot of frustration. Uh, Tanya and I both have been doing this for about 30 plus years. Um, so you can imagine during our the course of our uh, being civil rights uh, advocates, attorneys, uh, that we have had our share of uh, sad stories and our share of people who have been devastated by uh, the fact that they are voiceless, uh, where, uh, where they should have a voice and they should be able to tell their story and heal. Uh, from what they believe was discriminatory conduct. Um, it doesn't mean that every single complaint filed with us is a finding of cause or a finding of discrimination, but everyone who comes to us believes that they are the victim of illegal discrimination and believes that they should be able to share their uh, story, lend their voice, um, call for uh, you know improvements in uh, workplaces and places of public accommodation and credit transactions and the housing context and schools and hospitals. Um, and when you take away someone's ability to uh, heal, to share their story, uh, to assist other people who have been subjected to uh, what they believe is illegal discrimination, um, uh, it's it's a gut punch, uh, certainly. Um, and so we have both heard, um, and I can't speak for Tanya, but I know that we yeah. have both heard our share of stories. Um, and it's not just the story, but uh, it's the, in some instances, the violation of the law um, that has occurred. Uh, we have a substantial number of our cases that, you know, settle um, uh, during during our process. But then uh, when we're uh, sometimes trying to work our way through the process, we have individuals who have signed these types of agreements 
um, and they're shattered. Um, and we always have to, I think, as a society, as a state, as a commission, uh, make sure that we're protecting one another uh, from being shattered, uh, because then we still have to live amongst one another. And it's very difficult uh, when you have shattered people um, trying to move on, and then more people are being shattered because the law is not protecting them. So it is our mission to eliminate any discriminatory practice in the state, um, and this uh, legislation uh, certainly lends itself to assisting us with meeting our mission. And I don't know if Tanya had something to add. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I would concur with everything that uh, Attorney Sharp has said. Over the 30 years that I've been with the Commission on Human Rights, I've served in many different capacities, and I've had opportunities to speak with a number of complainants, and many of them have felt trapped in their positions because of the NDAs and trapped not only because of the NDAs, but because of their personal life circumstances. And so they're bound to the job that is creating um, very offensive um, predicaments for them. And, and now they're bound by the NDAs. And then we heard in the Harvey Weinstein case where most people feel like they can't speak out. They feel shamed by the treatment that they've received. And they sometimes feel like they're the only people that are subjected to that type of treatment. But when they hear that there are others, sometimes it's empowering to learn that you're not the only one that was treated that way. And while that may cause others to file complaints, it's our job to make the determination as to the validity of those complaints. And as Attorney Sharp mentioned, many of them are not found to have cause, but the people do have the right to file a complaint and for us to investigate those complaints of discriminatory conduct. Thank you. Thank you for that response. And I wonder if, um, or for those responses, I, I wonder if related to that, if you also hear from folks who are coming to your office um, that they're concerned that they can't warn their coworkers. They can't talk about what has happened to them in, in an effort to, in real time, improve their workplace and protect other people from experiencing that same discrimination. Can you talk about that yes. a little? Bit? Yes, of 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 course. You know, those are the uh, stories that we hear. Those are allegations that are made. Um, there's a power dynamic that exists because uh, most people are employed because they need to support their families, support themselves. Um, they are interested in having a, having a career. They're interested in whatever area they are uh, working in. Um, and to feel uh, uh, that you cannot uh, warn fellow coworkers about um, uh, things that are uh, discriminatory or upsetting um, in a society where uh, we have a history of um uh, of discrimination, uh, you, you can uh, imagine dismantles a person piece by piece, week after week, month after month, year after year. And uh, so again, I'm just gonna you know pivot to our mission, uh, which is to eliminate discrimination in employment, housing, credit transactions, and in places of public accommodation. Um, and how can we do that when uh, individuals don't feel protected by uh, our state or don't feel but protected by the provisions we have in place in, in the law to uh, stop other individuals from being harassed, sexually harassed, racially harassed, harassed based on uh, the, the fact that they have a disability, um, the, the fact that they belong to the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, there are many, many reasons why uh, individuals file complaints with us, veteran status. Um, we have uh, children who are filing complaints with us. Their parents file on their behalf because of believing that they're being subjected to illegal discrimination. So there is just a panoply of people who are being affected by, um, you know, discriminatory practices or alleged discriminatory practices that we uh, that we need to uh, protect, and we have to uh, be, uh, you know, very uh, uh, supportive of individuals who are filing uh, complaints of discrimination, uh, whether the outcome is going to be that we actually find discrimination or not, um, and uh, we need to have in the provisions of our law. Uh, things that protect individuals so that they feel comfortable with coming forward, uh, like the Me Too movement um, exemplified for us that need for individuals to be able to come forward and to be able to warn and protect their uh, fellow, you know, uh, coworkers, constituents, um, uh, colleagues, and friends. Um, 
once you put barriers in place that make it so that uh, discrimination goes from being an isolated incident to becoming very pervasive um, in an environment, uh, we are creating a society that is not um, really a good society for any of us to uh, function in. Um, and that's not what Connecticut has ever been. We've always been, uh, for all the years I've been on this earth, a very progressive state, a state that wants to protect its um, citizens, a state that wants to protect its children, its veterans, um, protect all protected classes. Um, and so I think that this is just another step forward, an incremental step forward um, uh, with this legislation so that we can uh, do just that. Uh, we don't want to create environments where uh, secrecy allows uh, the problem to just get worse and worse and fester. Um, and so that's why I think that this progressive legislation is right to be passed in our progressive state. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the questions or comments. Seeing none, appreciate both being with us. Thank uh, you. Katharina Ohm. Good afternoon. My name is Katharina Ohm. I'm the executive director of the Torrington and the Winchester Youth Service Bureaus. I'm in opposition of both House Bill 5506 and Section 3 of Senate Bill 445. House Bill 5506 proposes that juvenile court is the most appropriate place to send families with service needs cases, which is a major step backward. The kids involved have not committed criminal acts, but rather have behavioral health needs, struggle in school, may need special education services, or are stressed with basic personal or family needs. These kids are best served in their community and need intensive case management, something the court cannot provide. Some of the supports our youth service bureaus provide that cannot be offered or court include Responding to family emergencies, assisting parents with problem solving, often not doing regular working hours, building trust and relationships with youth and their families that exist long after goals are met, supporting families in their home on their own schedules, researching resources together with families so they can access them on their own in the future attending manifestation meetings, PPTs, IEPs, and expulsion hearings. Being hands-on, for example, cleaning out a near hoarding situation, providing critical needs such as groceries until families can be connected with long-term resources. We are often the one constant long-term connection. A youth positively impacted by this program is John, then age 15, who was referred to the TYSB by the high school social worker because he became disengaged with school during COVID. He refused online learning, would not leave his basement, apartment and isolated himself in his room. He was aggressive toward his mother who is disabled with mobility limitations. Prior services included ICAPs, DCF and counseling. Some, but not all supports provided were frequent home visits with mom individually and the family to assess needs. Individual visits with John, initially through the closed door of his room to hear John's voice. Cleaning and organizing the apartment, including John's room, as there was no suitable space to do schoolwork. Taking John for walks and trips to the grocery store once or twice a week. While at first reluctant, he ended up looking forward to these trips, which provided mentorship and social connections. In September 2021, John agreed to re-engage with school. We continue to check in, making sure all is well. John currently is on the honor roll and will graduate in 2024. Research has shown that juvenile court is not the appropriate place to send family with service needs cases. I strongly agree. We should continue to make every effort to keep our youth out of the court system whenever possible and keep kids in their community where they belong. Thank, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate your testimony. Questions or comments? Seeing none, appreciate it. Senator Looney.
morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to <clears throat> Chairman Sastrom, Senator uh, Kissel, uh, Senator Winfield, uh, uh, Representative Fishbein, the leadership of the committee, and all other members of the committee, uh, both present here uh, and uh, and perhaps uh, online at the same time. I'm Martin Looney, Senator from the 11th District, and uh, representing New Haven and Hamden, uh, and here to testify in support of two bills, Senate Bill uh, number four, uh, and also uh, House Bill 5413. Senate Bill number four is uh, critically important because it will allow us to expand uh, the right to counsel in, in civil matters where a person may be uh, seeking assistance in uh, housing, health care, employment, or family matters. And in those circumstances, access to justice is only as secure as the quality of the counsel involved in many cases. And um, in order to help victims of domestic violence in particular, uh, this committee helped pass Public Act 22-82 to provide legal aid to low-income uh, applicants for temporary restraining orders. As you may recall, that came out of a case where a, a woman had sought a temporary restraining order uh, and in the hearing in court uh, was unable to uh, satisfactorily articulate all of the statements that actually were contained in her application. Uh, and if those had been uh, brought out more forcefully, perhaps uh, an order might have been granted and instead the judge in that case just directed the course to, uh, the case to be shifted to uh, family relations uh, docket to uh, arrange for a custody uh, arrangement. And what, of course, what happened then was that the uh, the father of the child and the target of the purported order uh, instead uh, jumped off the Aragoni Bridge, and he was uh, the child was killed. He was injured. So uh, out of that came that bill, and now we have an opportunity to expand it from the initial uh, judicial districts of Bridgeport, Hartford, uh, New Haven. Stanford, Norwalk, and Waterbury uh, to now include Danbury, Middletown, uh, and Torrington. Uh, ultimately, this should be extended to uh, every court in the state. Uh, the second component of the bill deals with the, the subject of cyber flashing, one of many sexual offenses that's increasing in frequency due to technology. Uh, unsolicited sexual pictures uh, uh, of an in intimate kind are sent via text message, uh, airdrop, direct message, uh, and so on. Women are the most likely victims. A 2017 report found that 31% of Americans say that someone has sent them explicit images they did not ask for, but uh, over half of women ages 18 to 29 have had someone send these explicit uh, content messages without their consent. Uh, a study by the dating app uh, Bumble in 2018 found that uh, one-third of women report receiving unsolicited lewd photos from someone they've not met, and 96% of those were unhappy uh, to have received that photo. So Section 2 of the bill creates a, a private right of action against someone who sends an unsolicited uh, intimate picture uh, and provides uh, uh, for a fine of at least $500 to the victim plus attorney fees uh, and court costs. And uh, while there are other remedies uh, in tort law, such as claims for intentional infliction of emotional distress, those claims are often too costly and difficult uh, to bring. So this is a way to try to bring uh, uh, expedited, although perhaps limited, uh, relief in these circumstances. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a, a key component of the bill. The third key component of the bill has to do with workplace discrimination. Uh, more and more employers are requiring employees to sign uh, non-disclosure agreements simply as a condition of employment. Um, in 2022, President Biden signed the Bipartisan Speak Out Act that banned pre-dispute non-disclosure clauses uh, involving uh, sexual harassment or sexual assault. And Section 3 of the bill, with this bill, Connecticut will have an opportunity to go uh, further and to protect an employee's ability to speak out openly, not just about sexual harassment, but about any kind of workplace discrimination uh, that, uh, that might otherwise, uh, uh, they might otherwise be intimidated or suppressed about uh, articulating or bringing forward. So it ensures that uh, any clause of a contract for employment or in a settlement for workplace discrimination that prohibits the employee from discussing discrimination is void uh, as a matter of uh, public policy. Uh, and uh, Senate Bill uh, 5413, an act concerning the illegal use of certain vehicles and uh, street takeovers, addresses a problem that is of, of growing concern uh, over the past several years and would increase the tools that municipalities can use to uh, deter this behavior. Uh, also, there was a, a companion, a related bill uh, that has already been reported out of the uh, Public Safety and Security uh, Committee, uh, raised bill number 337, which I believe was JF yesterday. Uh, so I would hope that uh, uh, the, the content of those bills would uh, would go forward in, in one way or another. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions from the committee? Um, 
Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Senator Looney. Good afternoon, Representative. Good to see you. Um, I just wanted to see if you could expound a little bit more on, because I, I missed much of the uh, public hearing this morning. This is the first time I'm hearing testimony in support of 5413 um, to address what we have going on in our urban centers. It is my understanding that there are some penalties that would impact bystanders. Could you uh, well, talk about the, that? <clears throat> what the, the bill would do would, would revise the provisions that uh, regarding forfeiture of uh, certain illegally used uh, vehicles make it easier to uh, pursue forfeiture uh, and authorize municipalities to uh, adopt an ordinance related to street takeovers and established uh, uh, penalties for driving while a person's license is suspended or revoked specifically due to a violation related to a street, street takeover uh, and also establish a grant program uh, to provide funds to municipalities to enforce laws related to street takeovers and the illegal use of uh, of certain vehicles. So uh, that's the the primary content of uh, of the bill. You know, obviously, if, uh, if there are bystanders who are uh, are supporting or uh, uh, assisting or uh, in some way uh, interfering with uh, uh, with uh, with police and the enforcement of the action, that certainly would be something that could be uh, brought up as well. So as I said, uh, SB three three seven has already been JF out of the uh, Public Safety Committee. So I would hope that the content at some point could be merged. Thank you. I think my concern is around understanding how we're defining bystander and how that would impact people that don't necessarily have anything to do with the activities going on. Um, and it is also my understanding that the penalties would go as far as revoking a bystander's license forever. Uh that is, uh, you know, obviously up to the committee's wisdom to decide how far the penalty should go. But, but as you know, uh, this problem of of street takeovers has become a huge one. Uh, and what it means often is that so many people are gathered that it overwhelms the resources of the police to deal with them. There are just too many gathered at one point, and, uh, and they do so in a way that uh, they they severely outnumber the police, and and local enforcement is often uh, unable to deal with the problem. So you have a, a public a situation that is out of control. Yes. Well, being a representative in New Haven, I am very familiar uh, with the issue that we're dealing with here and the and, and the warranted concern. But I also have concerns about people that get caught up in those instances. Um, sometimes this is happening in front of someone's home. Um, big crowds of people. I may come out. I just really want more clarity. So I will um, delve into that with the, the proponent of the bill, because this is a concern that is coming from several people around how this would be detrimental to them if they were defined as a bystander in agreement when they weren't, right? Well, so. I think that, that's the issue. Uh, no one who is not uh, doing something to aid or support the activity uh, should have anything to worry about. And the, the burden of proving that they they are somehow involved or, or either interfering with the police or doing something in support of the activity, um, uh, the uh, uh, liability would only attach in those circumstances when they were actively engaged in doing something that was uh, in opposition to police enforcement or in furthering the, the gathering. True, and in a perfect world, that would make perfect sense, but my constituency has a different opinion on that. So I thank you for your testimony sure. and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Just just as a follow-up, uh, Senator Looney, uh, obviously great to see you. Thanks for being before the Judiciary Committee as always. I was afraid we were going to get through the whole session without seeing you, so we're, <laughs> we're, 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 glad, we're glad you made it in for our last hearing here. Um, I think the section of the street takeover bill that Representative Porter is referring to is Section 5 of the bill, and under that section, we're extending um, the penalty for operating um, under a, a suspended license, and the current penalty for that includes a mandatory minimum sentence mm -hmm. of 30 days. And I think, um, at least from my perspective, I, I certainly, Bridgeport struggles with the issue of street takeovers just the same as, as New Haven does. And, and I support almost all of this bill. Um, but, you know, as you know, I, I, I look very leery on mandatory minimum sentences yeah. because I think they – high judges' hands. They take away discretion of the judges that we spend a lot of time vetting on this committee um, and limits an ability to consider many of the mitigating circumstances you discussed. So I, I guess 
where I'm at, and I and and I did ask Mayor Alec about this as well, is um, at least from where I sit, Section Five of this bill would probably have to be either substantially reworked or amended before it, it came out of this committee with the mandatory minimum in there. And I, I guess, Mr. Chairman, I would have no objection to that. It, it is, of course, it is a House bill, and. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I, I think you're, do, you're do with it what I will is what you're saying. Your point is well taken. Right? Yes. Well, well, thank you, sir. I think I think we have a consensus then. Yes. All right, uh, Senator Flex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Senator Looney. Nice to see you Senator. here Good today. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you just a brief question and also just thank you um, for your continued leadership um, of our caucus and, and ensuring that our caucus is leading um, on, on the issues that are outlined in Senate Bill 4. I'm um, very grateful to you for that. Um, I think Connecticut can be proud, largely thanks to your leadership of the great work we've done in these arenas over the last um, several years. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the what was initially a pilot program for the civil representation for um, victims of domestic violence and 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 the initial study that was done and the improvements that that victims saw. Uh, in those three um, judicial districts where the representation was available. And and my only frustration with the uh, legislation before us is I wish we could expand it broader, and I'm sure you do too. So I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Uh, uh, absolutely, Senator Flexer. I think as a matter of, uh, of policy, uh, we have seen an effort over the last, uh, uh, last uh, uh, 90 plus years, since 1932, to expand uh, uh, access to legal representation for indigent people. Uh, up until from the time of the founding of our of our constitution and uh, uh, our nation in 1789 and the adoption of the Bill of Rights in 1791 until, until 1932, the language of the Sixth Amendment regarding right to counsel only meant the literal language of the Sixth Amendment that you could not have your right to counsel that you had secured, uh, could not be, that could not be interfered with. But there was no provision to provide counsel uh, beyond that, in any circumstance, civil or criminal. In 1932, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, I think, in the uh, 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 Scottsboro Boys case in, in, uh, in uh, Alabama, there were several young men who were uh, accused of, uh, uh, of rape, and they were convicted and sentenced to death and created such a national storm that the Supreme Court said that in, in circumstances where people are facing a potential capital penalty, uh, and uh, if they are uh, indigent, uneducated, unable to access their uh, their legal rights under the Constitution, that counsel has to be provided for them in that circumstance. And then it was expanded about 30 years later in, in uh, Gideon versus Wainwright in 1963 to provide uh, that there should, needs to be counsel when somebody is faced with a felony, uh, that in, not necessarily a capital felony, but a felony that uh, could involve prison time. And then finally, uh, there was a, a, another case, I think nine years after that in 72, the last expansion of that right occurred that said that as long if someone is facing a possible uh, imprisonment, possible incarceration, even if the charge is a misdemeanor, not a felony, the right to uh, uh, to counsel attaches. And of course, out of that came out of all of the uh, the public defender systems that we have around the country, and the uh, and the uh, counsel that are hired as uh, uh, as uh, uh, adjunct public def uh, uh, defenders in, in cases like that. But now, what we're talking about under what we passed in 2022, and now recognizing that there are circumstances beyond that. Uh, that, that strictly criminal matter where uh, the right to counsel uh, and, and it is important to have and the absence of it can create tragedy. Uh, and that's what we we, uh, we started to go down this path in uh, 2022. Uh, this bill allows us to expand upon that. And I'm hoping we'll get to the point where, where all judicial districts will be covered. Thank you, Senator. Thank you again. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions or comments? If not, well, um, Representative Fishback. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, good afternoon, sir. Thank you for coming. Sure. I just wanted to good ask afternoon. you on, on uh, Senate Bill 4. I don't know if you have the language in, in front of you. I think I do. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm focusing on the paragraph that starts at 247 to 266, which is all new language. It appears in line 251. It appears that if an employee reasonably believes they've been disparaged by the employer, certain things are to happen. I'll wait for you to. 247 starts, you said? Yes, yeah. sir. 
And I'm focusing on line 251. That's where the... Right. Okay, okay. So I see that uh, for an employer by the employer or the employer's agent to uh, refuse to hire employee, discriminate, and so on, or bar discharge from employment, uh, any employee or independent contractor because such person disclosed a conduct the person reasonably believes to be a discriminatory employment practice. Okay. So reasonably believes is subjective to the the stater, right? It's not a a court hasn't adjudicated that issue, right? At least that's the way I'm seeing it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, obviously the a a reasonable belief is one that uh, that would be found that an ordinary reasonable person would find uh, would uh, would hold. In other words, uh, we always have, have this issue that comes up in terms of, uh, of of stalking cases, something where you have the uh, somebody who really is uh, in fear of what they're seeing, thinking they're being followed, and all that. So the fear is legitimate, uh, but they they may be a hypersensitive victim, and uh, and maybe it's not a fear that a reasonable person would have felt under those circumstances. No, I appreciate yeah. that because that's exactly what, what I was thinking. So yes, yes, great minds think alike to to a certain extent. Taking that thought process, that ability, <laughs> I will remind members of the committee there to be no verbal outbursts. You, that was you, certainly not directed at me. No, it was not. It was directed to my left. Uh, um, how, how does an employee in the employee employer relationship deal with that in the context of the rest of this? Because I'm seeing how once somebody subjectively determines they have a reasonable belief, which I think you agree is challengeable at a level, if we go down to line 258, it says an employer who violates the provisions of this subdivision shall be liable to an employee or independent contractor for actual or statutory damages of $10,000, whichever is more. So I'm trying to put this all together and see how in the employment area, how this would work. Do you, do you know? Well, I would uh, uh, defer to the wisdom of the, of the committee in wordsmithing the, this section if it uh, believes that, uh, uh, that language um, uh, more strongly than reasonably believes, uh, whether or not it has to be uh, a language that uh, uh, maybe objectively reasonably believes and making sure that's not based on a subjective belief, uh, but that there is some evidence that the person could cite. Uh, that is, uh, uh, I would uh, leave it to the wisdom of the of the committee in dealing with that. But obviously the intent is, is to is just establish uh, liability for discriminatory contact that goes be uh, 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 conduct that goes beyond uh, that goes beyond sexual harassment in the workplace. No, I agree, and and I guess part of my problem is. And I don't know that we have this anywhere in our statutes. It appears to be a liquidated damages clause. Mm -hmm. It says ten thousand dollars, right? Or actual damages. I don't know what the actual damages calculation could possibly be. But if the actual damages are, let's say, somebody lost a day of pay, their their job has been restored. Their actual damages are, let's just say, a, for a minimum wage worker approximately for that day, approximately $100, right? That's the actual damages. But but this language says if your actual damages are $100, because it's less than $10,000, you get $10,000. I don't know how we could possibly have a statute that says that. Well, I think it is uh, one that uh, uh, if someone, uh, a low-wage worker had a limited uh, loss and... Uh, uh, it probably wouldn't be worth their while to uh, pursue something unless the unless the, the the possible recovery was was greater than their actual damages if it only amounted to a couple of days' pay and their uh, their pay was only a couple of hundred dollars. So I think it is uh, sort of a it's a public policy declaration of this kind of discriminatory conduct uh, is important enough to uh, uh, to to grant people a greater recovery than perhaps the the the, uh, uh, the actual documentation of their actual loss might involve. Oh, and I, but usually in our statutes, we have punitive damages, which yes, is usually yeah. trouble damages, which is, you know, your damages times three right. is trouble damages. And I'm just trying to figure out 
I mean, where this kid, you know, maybe somebody cut and pasted from some other state or something like that. I've never seen a liquidated damages clause in any statute in Connecticut. Um, so maybe it's possible that the uh, the language we use in treble damages cases could be uh, could be used here. It might be more in keeping with our practice. Yeah, the other section um, is towards the end, line three three four through three three nine. It, it's relatively short. Um, it appears to go one way. It says any provision in an agreement between an employer and a prospective current or former employer or independent contractor shall be void if it prohibits disparagement. Now, what if the employee disparages the employer? I, I think the... Uh... Uh, the intent is, uh, is here in, in many cases uh, that uh, there are agreements that uh, uh, provide the sort of uh, uh, gag orders, right? So that you don't have uh, uh, both parties agree not to, uh, uh, to say anything more about the, the case once it's, uh, it's settled. Uh, the concern, I think, is that sometimes that will uh, uh, prevent uh, important information from, from coming forward. That might be important as a matter of public policy for uh, for uh, for the state to be uh, aware of. You know, there was a case a few years ago, and admittedly, it's somewhat different because it was in state service. I believe there was a, a senior administrator, I believe at Southern Connecticut State University, uh, who, uh, uh, as part of his separation agreement, there was an agreement with the uh, with the uh, with the university or the university system uh, that there would be a non disparagement agreement. And uh, uh, concern I had at the time was that might mean that. Uh, information that that individual might be aware of that could be important for the state to know as a public agency that would not be able to be brought forward because of the circumstances of that agreement. Uh, I think that's that's uh, sort of what's uh, the intent to get at that here. No, I understand that's the intent, but a lot of times there's mutual agreement. Mm -hmm. neither, you know, neither party shall disparage the other. Right, right, yeah. So, you know, certainly we don't want people to litigate their cases in the street Right. We would rather have them litigate in a courtroom because um, that's our system. So I'm just concerned about, first of all, the one-sidedness, but perhaps the draconian result from this language. But I thank you for coming here today to have the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Always thank enjoy you. Representative. Seeing no further questions, thanks for being with us, Senator Lennon. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Cheeseman. Get it eventually. Thank you very much for hearing my testimony today, Chair, staffs from Ranking Member Fishbein, and other distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. I'm here in support of Ray's Senate Bill 445, specifically Sections 4 and 5. The sections included in this bill are essential for public safety and to allow our police officers to keep both motors and pedestrians safe. As we all know, the roads in Connecticut are becoming particularly unsafe. Marijuana use with impaired driving plays an important role. Marijuana use coupled with alcohol is even more dangerous. In 2022, traffic fatalities in Connecticut jumped 25% to 380. And as of March 4th this year, there had already been 60 traffic deaths on Connecticut. So we're on track to surpass the terrible total. As we all know, impaired driving as well as increased speed are behind many of our fatal traffic, traffic accidents. And the issue, particularly with cannabis, marijuana, is that drivers underestimate their ability to drive safely. Studies show marijuana users typically think they're safe to drive, whereas studies indicate four and a half hours must pass after the last marijuana use. There was recently a mega study done published in The Lancet, and it's the association between the physical availability of retail cannabis outlets and frequent cannabis use and associated health harms. The search 
found 5,750 citations. They included 32 studies with 44 unique primary analyses. And this study of the mega studies found a positive association between greater cannabis store access and increases in cannabis harms, including the increase in fatalities. An associate systematic review of US studies examining the association between access and traffic related outcomes found 67% increase in fatalities. And finally, I'd like to cite a piece that occurred was published in the Hartford Current, I believe yesterday. There was a fatal traffic accident, a car ran over a motorcyclist. Investigators used surveillance footage from the accident and DNA samples from the marijuana cigarettes in the stolen car to identify the 20 year old suspect who is now facing a dozen criminal charges and being held in lieu of a $1 million bond. Surely evidence of the use of marijuana while driving should be a reason for a traffic stop. If you can't drive with an open container, why should you be allowed to drive while smoking a substance that has been proven to result in impaired driving? And with that, I'll conclude my testimony. I thank you again for Question hearing me Mr. today. Um, just one. I heard a bunch of statistics. What I didn't hear is how many traffic fatalities were caused in Connecticut last year by folks who were high while driving. I did not find those statistics okay. offhand. Right. I would be happy to supply them to the committee if I find them. And surely if there were two or three that were killed, that's too many. Understood. I just, yeah. there seems to be this implication that fatalities are on the rise, which I think we can all agree mm -hmm. traffic fatalities are on the rise. And that's, that's awful. What I'm trying to figure out is whether there's a correlation that data supports that shows the rise in traffic fatalities is related to more people who are driving high. Well, so that's why I was looking for a statistic sure. that would show how many traffic fatalities were caused by folks driving high in 2020 versus 2021 versus 2022 versus 2023. Certainly, I do not have Connecticut statistics. On the other hand, the Colorado studies have shown that following. Right, I'm worried about Connecticut as legalization in Connecticut is relatively new, I think we'd be well advised to look at the outcomes in other states when we craft well, public I, policy. I, I assume people either drove or didn't drive high, whether cannabis was legal or illegal, right? I mean, if it's illegal to drive high. The studies I cited showed an association between increased access to cannabis retail stores and cannabis harms, including increased fatalities. We don't have Connecticut specific data on it. Correct. I just want to make sure because I I do not. Yes, I, I do not have Connecticut specific data. If I find Connecticut specific data, I will certainly pass it on to the committee. Excellent. Thank you. Thank Questions you. Mr. Commons, Representative Fishman. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess just by way of, of comment, um, you know, when we went down this road and this committee specifically talked about the ability of an officer to detect whether or not somebody had been ingesting this substance prior to a motor vehicle accident, we were assured that there was going to be 200 DREs, drug recognition experts, hired in this state. And all I'm hearing from police officers across the state is they're not in place. We can't do that. They weren't hired. So to now say, well, we're going to have to figure out on a fatality case whether or not that person who may have died also I think there was a block up here on drug testing of individuals after they passed away. I think it's going to be very difficult, perhaps intentionally, to ascertain whether or not the utilization, the ingesting, the ingesting of cannabis is direct, directly related to the dramatic increase in fatalities on our highways. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I, to, to your point, Th Representative Fishbein. Thank, thank you, Representative. Um, thank you. Further questions or comments? Representative Dubitsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was just wondering if you had submitted any written testimony. Yes, I have. Okay. 
Thank you. And is is there statistics that you cited? Are they in that written testimony? The statistics I have cited, and uh, I would also like to refer this committee, I believe it was New Jersey, uh, recently passed a bill that would uh, require implied consent for blood tests when a, a officer stops someone whom he believed he or she believed had been using marijuana, the same way you have implied consent for a breathalyzer test. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming thank you. in. Appreciate it. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Charlie Black. Charlie Black. Uh, Hal Basso. Good afternoon, um, the Judiciary Committee. My name is Hal Basso, an acquittee of the PSRB, here to speak on HB 5509, Sections 3 through 7, PSRB, Psychiatric Security Review Board. Today in our nation, we mark the Constitution, we mark the 20th anniversary of 9 11 and a long-standing war was put to end. Souls finally at rest. Connecticut's National State Hospital of use of patients throughout the COVID-19 outbreak. So many friends and family lost. Even the Evaldi slash Sandy Hook school shooting, an attack on the most innocent of our citizens is deeply disturbing to so many. Then and now we all learned how we felt during these times of hurt and how we all came together. I envision living in a world with people whose minds are built on the solid foundation of lending a helping hand to their fellow brothers and sisters in their time of need. I stand proudly and boldly here with you today to tell you all of us equities under the PSRB, I speak for everyone when I say we have completely changed our lives through goal-directed mental health treatment slash recovery out of our criminal mindset. We've replaced the cycle of crime in our lives with a cycle of renewal. To all of our victims, we apologize for the pain, trauma, challenges, obstacles, and heartaches we have caused you. We mean that. It's like breathing fresh air for the first time when this is said. We feel compelled to get back to our communities rather than hurting slash taking the community as we once did in the past. We have seen the errors of our past mistakes. This message is to bring a worthy attention to you. Education can break the cycle of the stigma placed on people who are considered mentally ill. By educating Connecticut's communities about the mental health system in our state, better yet, a beautiful place we call America. House Bill 5509, sections three through seven, regarding the PSRB should have never been put on the table. The PSRB working group had not yet finalized their report to the same Judiciary Committee. And when and if that happens, nothing should be done or discussed or revised about the PSRB. Maybe at some point we should have a serious talk about abolishing the PSRB in our state as they cause more damage than fixing the problems of Quiddy's face. The Quiddy see the review board, which in turn every two years just keeps making the victims review the pain and trauma over and over again of what happened. If you listen this far, thanks for staying with my message. It's hard for me to condense my pride into this testimony until a couple of paragraphs. Now I get it. It has to go through legislation. It has to go through the House and so on and so on. But accountability must be more obligation to the people, equities and society. And it must start somewhere and somewhere has to be right here, right now. Sure. Don't pass HB 5509, Thanks. section 3 through 7. Thank you. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us. Appreciate it. Any dios? My name is Anthony Dias. I'm a Vietnam veteran. Here to testify against House Bill 5509. Sections three through seven. Ladies and gentlemen of the Connecticut State Legislature, Judiciary Committee, and other distinguished members. 
feel free to call for a packet of information about the Psychiatric Security Review Board here in the state of Connecticut at my private voicemail, 860-415-1130, and or a free conference on that particular subject, the Psychiatric Security Review Board here in Connecticut. The bill that you are asked to consider today takes a very bad situation and makes it worse. The Psychiatric Security Review Board was enacted after John Hankley attempted to assassinate President Ronald Reagan, shooting him and his press secretary in 1982. John Hinckley is now free of his commitment and tours the country with his band. I tried to warn people of a vision of war that I had in 1983, the following year, by holding hostages. I did not hurt anyone in that event, and I was told by my lawyer to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. It has been 40 years, even though the Superior Court gave me not to exceed 25 years. The PSRB, or Psychiatric Security Review Board, requested an additional 17 years, and each time the court went along with their request. I asked the Superior Court if I had to raise my right hand and swear to tell the truth, then why is the Superior Court not held to at least the same standard? Imagine you were drugged by someone without your knowledge and you broke a storefront glass window. You were not in your right mind at the time. So you plead not guilty by reason of insanity. Then you find out if you just plead guilty, you would only get probation for the crime. But since you pled not guilty by reason of insanity, they give you 10 years. That's what the PSRB, Psychiatric Security Review Board, has done to the people who plead not guilty by reason of insanity. And we have no communication by cell phone and internet, even when some agencies can only be accessed this way. Agencies that you report abuse to, they can only be accessed through the internet. We don't have that. We don't have that here in this writing facility. We have thank no protection from SDBs, even though we are incarcerated for decades. One more second, please. The average stay for those placed under the Psychiatric Security Review Board in Connecticut is 22 years. My not to exceed 25 years has been extended by the PSRB to 42 years. Please do not approve any part of this bill, 5509. Thank it will you, not help me now. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The future thank of you. those committed depend on you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Ricardo Pagan will be next. I guess there's no questions for me. Good afternoon. I'm going to try the best I can to speak the best that I can. I got, I'm illiterate. Hey, my name is Ricardo Pagan. Um, I'm in, against the bill myself, 2 HB 5509, excuse me. The reason I say that because I, I'm a client here. I've been a client here for 23 years. And it's not fair to a lot of the clients here and a lot of the people that have been here for facing many, many years, and if we do have resort for the victims, we we feel they can too. It, they need to understand too that we behind this wall, and a lot of people from the community don't know what's going on behind this wall. I witnessed a lot of abuse through the years that I've been here, and even when the truth came out back in 2017 about another client that was here, and I witnessed plenty, plenty of those things that he was going through. And the, the thing is, I'm not completely familiar where a lot of the stuff is going on with the bill. And I know for sure it's not going to help none of us in here, especially clients that have been here 
more than 20 or 30 or 40 years behind this wall when they're trying to go back in the community and have a life and have a future. And thank y'all for listening. I'm hoping I'm not speaking to deaf ears. I'm hoping that whoever I'm speaking to, they will listen clearly. A lot of us don't have illness. A lot of us don't take medication. A lot of us have remorse and pain too for what we cause and others, people, and victim. And a lot of us here have been, excuse me, um, victim too. And a lot of clients in here been been hurt, victimized themselves. And now we have to deal with a lot of um, trauma. A lot of trauma that we saw for many years behind this wall. Because that only client, he wasn't the only one that got abused. It was a whole bunch of clients that was abused. And now we have to live every single day and not even get the treatment the help to deal with the pain we are dealing with. And I know we feel what the victims feel because we feel it ourselves. And plus, we was victim ourselves from a childhood. And a lot, a lot of people out there in the community today don't know us, don't talk to us, don't understand us. Because why we be kept away from the community behind this wall. And they speak about us like we saw danger and criminal and psychiatric when we not. It's a lot of people here that want their life back. It's a lot of clients in here that even myself, with even with the learning disability that I have, thank, I thank try you. to help the clients that I can help. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Porter with a question. I do not have a question, Mr. Chair. I just want to make a comment. Um, Mr. Pagan, this is Representative Porter, and I just want to state for the record, personally, I want you to know that what you and the others there at Whiting have said today is not falling on deaf ears. I hear you and I wanna acknowledge you. Um, and I thank you for your testimony and for the testimony of the others who have come before this committee today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, you, Representative. And, and yes, I do believe this is our last um, uh, uh, individual who's joining us remotely from Whiting today. So I wanna thank all of you for taking the time um, and, uh, and educating us on this issue today. Um, Sarah Egan will be next. Good afternoon, my name is Sarah Egan. I run the state's Office of the Child Advocate, which is charged with conducting independent investigations of the efficacy of publicly funded services for highly vulnerable children. Wanted to testify briefly on House Bill 5508, an act concerning recommendations from the Juvenile Justice Policy and Oversight Committee. We strongly support the provisions of this bill, one which would uh, continue to strengthen reentry services for incarcerated and detained youth. Our office is charged um, by state law with investigating conditions of confinement for detained and incarcerated youth age 15 to 22. And while it is imperative that we ensure the provision of developmentally appropriate support and treatment services to incarcerated children, the ball game is really what we do for them as they're leaving. And that continues to need enormous improvement. And it's, I, I always say in our office that children need three Ps. They need a plan, they need purpose, and they need a person. And the provisions of this reentry plan will continue to strengthen those services and ensure more children are connected to credible messengers and mentors as they navigate sometimes a very complicated and, and, and challenging reentry to their community. Second provision around gender responsive programming, several of the recommendations in this bill uh, regarding these provisions co correspond to findings and recommendations issued by the Office of the Child Advocate in our October 2023 investigative report regarding DCF licensed STAR homes, which are state licensed shelters for abused and neglected children that girls and boys often find themselves in because they've unmet behavioral health needs and no place else to go. 
Uh, we made recommendations in that report, which are reflected in this bill, and that call for a state plan to ensure a continuum of gender responsive services um, to these children. Um, lastly, I wanted to testify in opposition to Bill 5506, an act concerning family with service needs petitions, which would roll back reforms that uh, Connecticut and many other states undertook to decriminalize status offenses involving children, which resulted in a 63% decrease in the estimated number of petition status offense cases, cases nationwide from 2012 to 2021. States did that, including Connecticut, uh, due to evidence demonstrating the relative ineffectiveness of involving lower risk children in the justice system versus directly connecting children and their families with community-based supports. And while there is absolutely substantial concern regarding chronic absenteeism and truancy in public schools, this is a time when community-based services are strained to an historic degree. So I think the answer is investing, investing dollars in community programs that work directly with children and families to address those unmet needs with a framework for continuous progress monitoring, which I understand is underway at the Youth Service Bureaus. Uh, thank you, and that's the end of my testimony. Uh, Senator Kissel. Thank you very much, Chairman Staffstrom. Sarah, it's great to see you again. Seems like just yesterday that we were over in all the probes for that JJPOC uh, community building or self-awareness uh, meeting, which was terrific. Uh, I'm sure you submitted testimony, but if you could just uh, do me a personal favor and just email to my office what you had submitted so I can sure uh, make sure it's on my radar. That'd be great. Absolutely. And Senator Kissel, every time I see you, I think of that day <laughs> in Old Judiciary, which was a really good event. Here Further go. questions or comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing none, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Uh, Walter Blum. Good afternoon. Thank you all. Uh, my name is Walter Glum. I am the executive director of the Connecticut Council on Developmental Disabilities. I am also a parent of an adult who lives with developmental disabilities here in Connecticut. I'm here to testify in support of uh, Senate Bill 425, an act prohibiting discrimination by health care providers in the provision of health care services in the state especially the inclusion in the bill of intellectual disability, mental disability, learning disability, and physical disability. This one's simple, right? We know that individuals with developmental disabilities face significant health disparities, including higher rates of disease and lower rates of uh, preventive care. We know that this is due in part to individuals not receiving necessary accommodations for essential primary care. Failure to provide accommodations for health care is discrimination. Now, what recourse is there for a person who is denied health care because of their disability, for a person who's denied accommodations that they need to access health care? What remedies are available? As I understand it, this bill would allow a person to file a complaint with the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities so that the state can take action with the healthcare provider. We need this. We need this tool because this is not a level playing field. Individuals with disabilities need the assistance of the state in order to uphold their civil rights to large healthcare corporations. Please help us to ensure that no person in Connecticut is denied health care because of their disability. Thank you. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? If not, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Uh, Christina Quaranta. Representative Staffstrom, Senator Kissel, members of the Judiciary Committee, which is really Representative Dubitsky. <laughs> My name is Christina Quaranta. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Justice Alliance. We are a youth adult partnership, public policy, 
an advocacy organization that works statewide to end the criminalization of Connecticut's youth. Today, I'm testifying in opposition of House Bill 5506, which is an act concerning family with service needs. CTJA does understand does understand the intent of the proposed legislation to ensure that young people are receiving services and that Connecticut remains a safe place for all people. However, as the child advocate just pointed out, research and data done in both Connecticut nationally show that the pieces of this legislation that aim to end behaviors such as absenteeism in school, running away from home, and a couple other pieces actually exacerbate those issues. We know that in June of 2020, Connecticut fully eliminated having the court become involved with cases for behaviors like those I just listed. We know um, that having appropriate service providers, especially those that are staffed with folks that are credible messengers, those that have been through situations that the young people that are a part of that program have also been through that they can relate to, work very well when those are funded and those are run by different providers here in Connecticut already, and there's great outcomes. And we have them sort of on the diversion end too that are running really well. I think that we can replicate that for young people that are running into issues like absenteeism, et cetera. Um, removing the court system from the process also takes out the unnecessary delays through that red tape of getting a young person and their family into a program that does exist. So we know that research shows that youth that engage in status offenses, minor offenses, often age out of that behavior. And instead of intervening in the wrong way, which would be court involvement or arrest and further kind of ratcheting up the, the consequences, we know that that behavior desists, they grow out of it. If you intervene in the wrong way, you're going to end up with a young person who falls further into the legal system and maybe even into the adult court system. The outcomes there are even worse. In late 2023, the Boston Consulting Group, in partnership with Dalio Philanthropies, we've all seen at this point that they've released a report that showed that Connecticut had over 119,000 disconnected young people. That report has tons of recommendations that folks in Connecticut and organizations are already implementing, and we should be doing more of that, of addressing the root causes of youth behavior and youth crime. Youth service bureaus already exist, and mind you, they might need more resources um, and more funding. However, we know how to work with young people, and we know that court involvement is not the answer. The answer is addressing the root cause of crime, investing in young people, continuing to show up for them, and not showing up in a punitive way. Thank you. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, thanks for being with us. Maisa Tisdale. Um, Erica Bromley. Uh, Representative Stastrom, Senator Kissel, Representative Fishbein, and members of the Judiciary Committee, my name is Erica Bromley, and I'm the Youth Justice Consultant for the Connecticut Youth Services Association. I will be speaking today primarily in strong opposition of HB 5506, but will also touch on support for 5508 and both support and opposition for Senate Bill 445. To begin, I strongly oppose uh, HB 5506 in its entirety. This bill completely rolls back the reform that we have worked for many years to put into place, those changes all being based on research outcomes and experiences. Returning family with service needs cases back to court is a major step backwards and one that is not at all warranted. There are many reasons why family with service needs cases were removed from court jurisdiction in the first place. These behaviors are not delinquent or illegal acts. Youth exhibiting these behaviors may be high in need, but they are low risk and do not need to enter the court system just to receive services. This entire bill focuses on utilizing court proceedings, supervision, and even confinement for youth who have unmet needs. The proposed changes in this bill do not have an impact on public safety, as youth exhibiting these behaviors are not engaging in delinquent behavior. They might be young people who have behavioral health needs, they struggle in school, may need to receive special education services, or struggling with other issues. The age-specific nature of these behaviors suggests that young people have developmental and behavioral health or family needs, not criminogenic ones. These young people need services at the community level and need intensive case management, something the court cannot provide in the manner necessary for youth to succeed. No system is perfect, but please remember in Connecticut, we've made great strides in uh, juvenile justice reform over the last decade. Connecticut is widely considered a model for how a state can improve 
its juvenile justice system while improving <clears throat> public safety and overall youth outcomes. As someone who has spent the last 25 years in this field working with this population, I'm confident that rolling back this reform is not the correct decision. Instead, I think it means we need to identify and address any gaps and weaknesses in the system, adequately resource our providers, and continue to utilize data and research to make informed and smart decisions. We oppose reinstating FWISN, which will criminalize status offenses, make families wait longer to access services, and increase the risk that young people will return to court. Regarding, bill, Senate, regarding Senate Bill 445, I am in favor of Sections 1 and 2, but in strong opposition of Section 3. Section 3 includes language to establish truancy clinics and probate courts. The language would allow for referrals to the probate court by school, and the court would be able to prepare a citation and summons for a parent or guardian to appear in court. Similar to earlier testimony, court of any kind is not the appropriate setting for youth with attendance issues. It is also completely inappropriate to issue a summons for a parent to appear regarding attendance. There are many unmet needs of youth experiencing truancy that contribute to their attendance issues despite the efforts of a parent. Again, youth identified as having attendance issues need support, case management, and services in their community absent of court. Finally, I'm in support of House Bill 5508 uh, in its entirety. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Representative Fishman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming here. Um, looking at 5506, um, at what stage, you know, should this become law? At what stage does a truant kid actually get sent to court? Right now, that is not the case. They don't. They don't. They don't go to court at Correct. all. Correct. They have right. been removed from court jurisdiction yep. as of 2017. Sure. And since that time, truancy across the state has dramatically increased. Which the pandemic had something to do with it. I, I don't disagree. Yes. But we're a year and a half post pandemic, mm -hmm. and truancy in some of our cities is like 50%. So obviously, what happened hasn't helped. So I'm just trying to figure out under the language that's actually in the bill. You read the bill, right? Yep. Okay. At what stage does a truant child actually go to court? Currently? No. Under, should this become law? You're here in opposition mm -hmm. to this bill. Yes. It, it seems to me that a lot of things have to happen before a child under this bill goes to court, that that this says that there will be services in the community, correct? After entering the court system. So I want to... Okay, can you just point out that language in the bill? Uh, I'm not sure exactly where it is, but there is a piece in here that says that the schools can refer the child to the court system in which they would enter probation or supervision. And then, yes, they could. In my full testimony, I did mention um, the language about sending a, a youth to the community, but not only are they having to enter the court system, they are processed in the court, they have a probation officer, they're under supervision, there are other uh, potential consequences if they don't follow through um, that are much more serious. So I think even if they and even if they were to go through that process and be sent to the community, it's also a delay in services for the same or similar services that could be provided that are already provided in the community. Okay, so I just want to unpack some of that. Mm -hmm. So, and I get these calls. Mom just called me last week. Her kid refuses to go to school. Mm -hmm. child doesn't have any mental health issue they just don't like being told what to do like most kids right yep. what can a mom do in that situation under our current system uh well the hope would be for and one of the the overall solutions that we would say is appropriate is for these youth to be, to be identified earlier. So if that mother is having trouble instead of waiting or the, instead of the school waiting for 30 absences, 40 absences, whatever it is, the earlier that person is intervened with, then the better off um, their potential solution. So again, a lot of it has to do with when we're identifying kids and the types of support and sending them to court is not, it's not a criminal behavior. There shouldn't be consequences of 
confinement or going in front of a judge just to receive services because even before um, these cases were removed from court jurisdiction, those services were voluntary through the court. They were sent into the community to what I think at that point was family support centers. I don't know. There's been a lot of names since then. Um, and those were all voluntary services. So the same thing was happening. The court would tell us the exact same thing, that young people are being sent there, that it's voluntary, and they can choose not to attend as well. As far as it goes for the mother, the community-based services are the most imperative for that young person and for that family because they can be advocates for their child. They can go into the school and advocate for changes that might need to happen. They can identify behavioral health issues. They can provide other kinds of services that might have been missing. So I think there's, you know, there are potential solutions. Is every single child going to miraculously return to school? No. But a lot of times it's about receiving the services for their unmet needs. That's the first part. Okay. So I, I'm um, I'm listening to you. I'm still not hearing. So let's say we identify the child earlier, right? Mm -hmm. The kid has missed seven, uh, we'll keep it a very low number because, you know, seven is not necessarily truancy, mm -hmm. um, you know, seven days in school because they're out gallivanting, smoking pot and cigarettes on the corner instead of going to school. Um, what does mom do? She, she, can she call the police? No, the suggestion okay. would be to call a community agency. Okay. Provider. So the, sure. So the community agency provider is called and under the old system, which a portion of this is looking to restore, mm -hmm. that community agency provider would be able to do an application for a family service needs program. What happens now with that child? So part, so there is no family with service needs program. Because it got rid of, right? Well, no, so, there was never a program. There was a petition that could be sent to court. Sure. But there was never any specific programming specifically for family with service needs status offenders, which was part of the problem is that they were trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. They were trying to send kids to programs that were meant for kids who were delinquent, which is a completely different population of young people. And so there were never those appropriate programs to begin with that were court sanctioned, you know, in terms of court sponsored programming. So that was part of the challenge was that there needed to be other kinds of services outside of just those, the ones that the court was supporting in order to, you know, make sure that their behavioral health needs were met, to make sure that the family has advocacy at the school level, to make sure that they have intensive case management, which is a critical part of any status offense was in case is the need for, for case management, which the court can't necessarily provide. They don't have the manpower for that. So the question was, what happens with that kid now? Now they would be referred to, the, to a youth service bureau. If there's one in their community, they would have an intake, they would have a screening, and then they would work with the family to provide the services that are necessary for whatever unmet needs or behavioral health needs they might have. They work with the school. It's different for every single child. And then Agreed. they would work together with them to try and create a plan to identify their needs and have them return to school. Well, how, so how how does that how does the 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 kid does not want to go to school? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the, these community programs have some way of of making this this child go to school? No, nobody okay. is going to make a child go to school. I think the important issue is that the reasons why kids are often most likely not going to school is because they have unmet needs, mostly behavioral health needs. And so when you would begin to address those needs, then the child is more comfortable going back to school. There's plans put in place with school personnel. Maybe they need to change something about what was happening. It might be anxiety. It might be other issues in school. So by addressing those other unmet needs, that's what leads to a child returning to school. So the child is now cajoled to go back to school. There's no force involved, which I don't advocate force. But now the child says, well, I still don't want to go to school, so I'm going to chew gum during class and I'm going to put it in the girl's ha hair next to me. And I'm going to do that because I don't want to be in school. So now the child has been forced to go to school. What, what happens to that child under our current system, absent this legislation? 
Well, I would like to believe that a child is not being forced to go back to school and that by addressing their needs, they are returning to school voluntarily. That is the purpose of providing necessary services to young people. Most kids are just not saying, I'm not going to school because I don't want to. Most of them are dealing with massive behavioral health issues, especially since the pandemic. And those are the things that need to be addressed in order for them to feel comfortable to return to school. So they are returning voluntarily. Once their needs are addressed, it's easier for them to return. For a child who goes back to school and is still having issues, then it is part of the process with the case manager, the youth service bureau, with the schools to work together to find alternative solutions whether it be changes in classes, whether it be a different schedule, whatever the whatever that one individual child needs, that's part of the larger process, a process that court, frankly, cannot do because they don't have the manpower to have somebody case manage at that level. Okay, well, I'll tell you, this language does not, is not as draconian as you present here. It has a lot of steps before a court ever gets involved. It also, one of the biggest changes that, you know, I, I think is is a good thing is it takes the role of the police officer totally out of the process. It allows a parent who is concerned, you know, we had a mom come before us last Friday whose child, similar to one that I've presented here today, what happened to that kid? They found him. They found his body because there weren't services. And these parents have to have some ability to save their kids. So I, I would really appreciate if, if you took another look at this language and looked at it from that mom's perspective. I don't want to see more kids getting into trouble. And I don't want to see more kids... I want to see kids living as adults in this state. So we got to do something. And I'm looking forward to that something. But right now, there's a lot of frustrated parents out there. So I thank you for coming here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Um, so, you know, for the question, uh, Representative Porter. Thank you. Um, good to see you, Erica. Thank you for coming before us today. Um, I do apologize for missing your testimony. I am not going to make any assumption. I'm just going to ask you, um, are you in support or opposition of this bill? Strong opposition. Okay. And I believe I heard some of what your concerns are. Um, and some of what I heard concerns me as well. I get where you're going and there are statistics to support a lot of what was said. So your concern is, and, and please tell me if I'm correct, around the youth touching the system and how they touch that system mm -hmm. and what it means when a, a youth touches a system only once, mm -hmm. right? The statistics are one touch with the system increases a youth likelihood of going to adult prison by 50%. So I believe that the root cause is really what we should be looking at. And I would hate to think that we would consider giving children and their families the supports, the wraparound services that they need, trauma-informed counseling, et cetera, housing needs, whatever it is. Kids are dealing with bullying. That's a big one in my district mm -hmm. right now. Um, and they're not really equipped to process mentally and emotionally mm -hmm. what is being put on them. So how do we help them get where they need to be without what this policy or piece of legislation is suggesting. Yeah, I mean, I think, as I mentioned earlier, one of the big pieces is earlier identification. The earlier we can identify kids, a lot of times we're seeing kids who are being referred for truancy or attendance issues who have gotten to the place where they're 40, 50, 60 absences in, and they're a junior in high school. If you look back at their records, you will likely see that they have had issues in the past as well, and they just were not identified before. So the first piece is always earlier identification, not waiting until it's so late that it makes it very challenging to do that. The second piece is, you know, I think part of the solution is to no system is perfect. We we have, you know, everybody has a long ways to go. But right now we have a way to provide services at the community level, absent of court, 
but we need to better resource those services. We need to support our providers and we need to make sure that we have everything that we need in order to provide the amount of services. These cases are intensive. They're time consuming. And in order to do that, we need support and resources. So I think the more that we can, you know, support and be behind our community-based services, it, it's going to only be more successful in how we're going to continue to keep our kids out of the court. And, you know, as you said before, one touch, I think there's, there's always an argument between what a touch of court means. It's not necessarily just going in front of a judge. It is once you have entered the system, you're, you're, in, your name is in the system, you've been in front of a probation supervisor, you're on supervision or probation, that's entering the system. And so even if that probation person is going to then send them to the same community services that we would use in the community, they have entered the system. And so I think that's a critical piece. I, I absolutely agree. And it just um, brings me back to a personal experience where <laughs> my son was bringing home failing grades. So when I went in, what I discovered was and this is an, I'll have a follow-up question for you because I need to know the answer to this. Um, we, we A's and B's, right? That's how I raised my household. Like the C's and D's, we're not bringing them here. So that was a red flag, went into the school only to find out that my son had been classified as a truant. He had been absent from this particular class up teen days, right? And there had been no notification to me. I was unaware. They had my cell phone number. They had my house number. They had my work phone. I was very involved in the school. So when we talk about parents being concerned, some parents don't have a reason to be concerned because they're not even being kept in the loop. Mm -hmm. And when I did further investigation in this class, my son had a 92 average because what he was doing was going in because his classmates would tell him when the tests were. And he'd go in and he'd take the tests and do exceptionally well, but he was bored. Mm -hmm. He wasn't being challenged. So, I mean, we can talk about reasons why kids are not showing up to school and participating, but I think we also have to talk about the responsibility of everyone, all the stakeholders, including parents, but also the educators and the principals and the assistant principals, the counselors. Everyone is supposed to have a grip on what's going on with these students. So I really do thank you for highlighting that because that is critically important. And I think a lot of times we look to blame, right, the children, blame the parents, blame the school, when all we need to do is get to a table and figure out what the root cause is. What is this stemming from? And we have to stop with the knee-jerk reactions to dealing with what's happening on the surface. Mm -hmm. We've got to drill down and we have to pluck it from the root because if we don't, we will continue to see this behavior show up time and time again. And flattery, that is not what I'm looking to do to get kids into school. Sure. I'm looking to get them back into school because that's where they need to be. That's where they deserve to be. And there should be equity when we talk about how we deal with kids. And I don't see that in my community. That's why this is really disturbing to me because the scales of justice are not equal. And when we pass laws, they don't impact every community in the same manner. Every child is not given the same opportunities. They're not given the same resources. They're not given the same chances. In some communities, we're coming down with a hammer. And I don't think that we should be pushing kids out of school and into the system when they are crying out for help. It is a cry for help. And I know as a mother and a grandmother, when my babies cry out, I pull them closer. I don't push them out. Mm -hmm. So that is what I want us to see us doing. When we look at policy to address the issues that we're seeing, especially post COVID with our children in school. So thank you for the work thank that you. you do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So no further questions, appreciate being with us. Um, all right, I think we dealt with our technical issues with Maisa Tisdale. Maisa Tisdale with us. Uh, yes, I'm here. Hold on, let me get my um, camera going. There we go, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Um, my name is Maisa Tisdale, and I'm the president and CEO of the Marion Eliza Freeman Center for History and Community in Bridgeport, 
I support HB 5507. Founded in 2009, the center owns the historic Freeman's Houses in the South End, historic Little Liberia, one of the nation's oldest settlements of free people of color. The houses under restoration are on the National Register for significance to African Americans and women. Leveraging this restoration, we plan to create a national heritage site with a museum, education, and research center and housing. The Freeman Houses, are located within 500 feet of UI's proposed line in a pole and within two blocks of the substation that will serve them. Bridgeport South End has over a hundred structures listed on the National Register or eligible for it, including Seaside Park. Ordinary people live and work in them. This makes the South End a strong candidate for preservation-based equitable development. Our center has worked with the nation's leading architects at NCA, and mass design, utilizing 50 years of development research and case studies to create a vision that matches those voiced by the South End residents. Allowing utility infrastructure to expand and move on to neighborhood blocks on a new and massive scale, onto land essential to economic development, affordable housing, and healthy communities stifles private and public investment in the South End, which desperately needs it. Easements impact private property and revitalization plans underway by residents and nonprofits for years and will end remediation and re reuse over 10 acres of Bridgeport land. 275 Warren Street in the South End, private property eligible for the Connecticut res Register and pres preservation tax credits. There's gonna be a monopole there. It's tearing down one of the most historic buildings there and the asking price dropped from 9.5 million to 6.5. The mixed use um, development plans, including affordable housing and a supermarket have been scrapped. E UI's land use is ill-advised at a time when nearly $200 million in state and federal funds are being invested in this very community for redevelopment, health and education, climate resilience improvements. The South, uh, um, the siting council delivered a split decision, a decision that's meant to satisfy residents in wealthy Southport. Nothing changes for Bridgeport. This is what we like. Make UI underground the cables to allow economic revitalization and protect low income residents from the effects of, of EMF, um, the radiation. Embed in an EJ hearing and all siting council procedures. Find out what energy and EJ considerations are factored into projects. There should be metrics, um, evaluations, reports um, when it comes to project siting, financial analyses, and, and alternatives too. The siting council must include an expert on environmental justice, energy justice, and equity. Um, so we we. We want um, also legal representation, funds for that, it's, similar it's, to let me, let me add, your, your time's elapsed, but I, okay, I, do, thank you. I do want to ask you a couple questions sure. that I want to drill down on. I, I first want to thank you for taking the time to, to be here on, on this bill today. But um, let me ask you, prior to submitting its application with respect to the Monopole Project Bridgeport, did UI ever reach out to you or to your organization? Um. Prior to submitting an application, did they did they reach out? Reach out. Um, did anybody anybody come anybody from UI come and and give you a call or knock on your door and say, "Hey, we're no goes and coming through, and we're going to put these, you know, very tall monopoles and and high intensity lines over the top of." Uh, your historic property? Did anybody no, they didn't. Um, back on October 30th, well, in October, actually, we requested um, that UI, when we got wind of this, that they come out to the Freeman um, houses and walk the land with us. Um, and we initiated that. Okay. No that one was, ever That was after now. It had already been submitted to the Siding Council, correct? Right. And did you... Um, did you submit any um, any sort of alternative or or proposals with respect to how this would affect your property to the siting council as part of their deliberations? We weren't able to because by the time um, it was in front of the siting council, they weren't accepting any more um, 
pre-file testimony and it was too late for us to have an intervener, we would have had to go find the um, legal fees and that sort of thing anyway, but it was too late. They weren't taking any more evidence. We did uh, comment. We did uh, send in public comments, but we weren't able to actually take part in the proceedings. Do you believe the citing council took into account the public comments that you submitted? No, I was told by several attorneys that basically the citing council doesn't look at them, that they go into the circular file. So, so here, here we have a, a historic property, one that, hey, could you just, just, I mean, I'm familiar obviously because it's, it's my district, but, but for those listening, what, what are the Freeman houses? What is the historic significance of the Freeman houses? So the Freeman houses are the last remaining structures of an 1820 settlement known as Little Liberia. And it was extremely significant because it played an important role in the colored conventions movement, which fought for abolition, fought for economic um, development, um, also fought for um, voting rights for indigenous and black Americans at that time. It raised troops to fight later on in the Civil War. And Mary Freeman, who owned one of the houses, was an accomplished entrepreneur, as was her sister. She left um, a paper trail documentation um, that showed that her, she and her family were actually responsible for the development of Southern Main Street in Bridgeport. This was an Underground Railroad's um, destination settlement. It was also involved in um, sailing the Black Atlantic. There were schools, there were churches, there was um, also um, a luxury hotel for wealthy Blacks from New York City. And when Mary Freeman um, died, the only person in Bridgeport who had more money than she was um, P.T. Barnum. What's also really interesting and ironic about all of this is that when Thomas Edison invented the, the light bulb, it only stayed lit for a few seconds. So it was commercially a failure. A Black man named Louis Latimer invented um, a better kind of filament. He also wrote the patent for the light bulb and he lived in Little Liberia. His family settled there, escaping slavery and came to this very Bridgeport community. His invention allowed for this growth of the entire you know, utility, electric and lighting industry, um, you yeah, are. And yet, here, and yet, here, and here, yet here we want to do is basically um, put a monopole in the middle of it so that nobody can come and visit it or appreciate that. It's exactly. Um, look, I, I just, I, I want to thank you for being here. I, I think that there's probably no better example of um, the, um, significant you know the the racial injustice significance of this project the economic impact and detriment that this project will impose and and frankly the environmental impact that this this project uh will have and the fact that there has been no week outreach from the utility to you the fact that you believe your comments were not taken into account by the siting council as part of their deliberations um is precisely the reason this bill is before us, um, that these transmission lines need to be treated like any other um, environmental justice uh, in, uh, uh, move in, in a city like Bridgeport. Uh, there has to be greater public outreach. There has to be greater ability for um, uh, the city to represent your interest and the interest of, of taxpayers and, and frankly, the economic impact. Um, I am I am dismayed that uh, UI never reached out to you, that you feel like you were not heard by the Siding Council. And frankly, I'm more dismayed that at least as far as I can tell, UI is not here to testify today to explain themselves. Um, that is just that is that is absolutely unacceptable. And and um, but I, I really appreciate you being here, giving your voice to this um, uh, and uh, and your support and advocacy for this bill. So thank you very much for being here. I, I appreciate all of you for giving us time to be heard. Next up will be Kathleen Shanley.
Oh, wait. Uh, hold on. Uh, Represent Porter. Uh, Ms. Tisdale, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay. At first, I do want to um, align my comments with Representative Stastrom and thanking you very much uh, for coming before us today and testifying on this bill. Um, I'm not at all dismayed because this is what happens in our communities. You brought up a very good point, and I just wanted to ask if you would elaborate a little bit more on the importance of what what you mentioned around underground wires, because I'm actually I ha I'm, I'm watching this happen in my community as well. Um, can you just talk about the importance of them taking these wires underground? Right. It's really important to put the wires underground um, because it makes them more climate resilient. For example, there are, uh, you know, different kinds of weather events that could impact them, but also they're easier to maintain. So sometimes it costs a little more to put them underground initially, but later on the upkeep is, is lower. It also allows the, um, it allows the cables to take a different um, route underground, which can avoid taking these permanent easements on people's properties. And it doesn't have the wires overhead. And over, over time, the wires begin to sag and it brings those that radiation closer to the people who live there. The, the best way to reduce that radiation is to underground the wires. So for maintenance, for climate resilience, for public health, um, in order to have less impact on private property because underground they can um, oftentimes follow the roadways, it's, it's a better way to go. And it doesn't impede the development of the neighborhood. It doesn't um, propose also uh, potential obstacles to, evaluate, to evacuation routes in times of climate emergency when the utilities would want to pre-position um, their, you know, their vehicles in neighborhoods that are, are densely populated with maybe very, very narrow streets. So putting it underground is the way to go. It's, it's seen as um, the, the more desirable option in our in our time for for all of these reasons. So putting them underground just allows a lot more um, consideration for health and um, development issues and also for climate resilience. I, I thank you for expounding on that and giving um, a deeper explanation around the importance of the underground wires. Um, we talk about environmental I say injustice in, in our communities. And this is definitely one that strikes a chord with public health. And it does impact the health of the people that live in these communities, such as myself um, and the people that I represent. The last thing that you said that really struck a chord was that there should be metrics and evaluations. And I will agree with that, but I will also add that those metrics and evaluations should absolutely be available to the public. Um, so thank you again. I really do appreciate you. you taking the time to come before us and educate us on what's happening in communities like ours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for hearing us. Further questions or comments? Uh, seeing none, thanks again, Ms. Tistel, for being with us. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen Shanley. Good afternoon. My name is Kate Shanley, and I'm manager of transmission siting for Eversource Energy. I'm providing comments today on Bill 5507. I've already filed written testimony on this bill. I'll therefore limit my testimony today to a few high level comments. I have some concerns about the language in this bill. The bill singles out electric transmission lines to be included in the list of affected facilities under Section 22A. Dash 30A. However, electric transmission lines are not sources of air emissions and are not defined as a major source of air pollution under the Clean Air Act, which is the foundation requirement for an affected facility under this section. Adding electric transmission lines would not serve the underlying purpose of this section of the statute. 
However, there are some other language and some other sections of the statute could meet the intent of this language. The requirement to submit copies of appraisals for acquisition of property rights needed for a proposed project prior to and at the time of the application and to certify that an applicant has completed negotiations on the amount of fair compensation serves no purpose and will actually delay submittal of an application by many months, if not well over a year, as many times such negotiations are occurring in parallel with the application's review. Further, this requirement intrudes upon private land negotiations between parties, as many times property owners request that Eversource not make such negotiations public. And last, the signing council is not a realtor or an appraiser and has no charge to evaluate individual property transaction and compensation to be paid for property rights, nor is it an arbiter with respect to real property values. The proposed requirements to submit various categories of actual load and forecast information for existing transmission is superfluous as this information is in part already readily available in the Siting Council's annual 10 and 20 year forecast of load and resources report. And it is typically incorporated in applications by administrative notice. Further, this reproduction of data would not serve a useful purpose for many new transmission projects because they have no connection with respect to past loading or forecasting. Moreover, the outage history and restoration of existing transmission lines is similarly not at all related to current or projected load forecasts as line outages are typically caused by lighting strikes or from contact with trees or branches blowing into the right of way. The requirement to describe the economic impact of the proposed facility is vague. It's not defined and Eversource routinely provides an estimate of the increased tax revenue that the municipality would receive from construction of the project. So, um, so Ms. Shanley, thank you uh, for being here. I, and, and I mean that sincerely. Um, frankly, I wish that the other utility in the state was here as well um, uh, to discuss. So I'd like to ask you a few things sort of in generalities. Um, with respect to Eversource, recognizing that you can't speak for the actions of, of anyone else. Um, but we just heard from Ms. Tisdale, who um, runs a uh, nonprofit, historically recognized uh, site in the South End of Bridgeport in an economically uh, disadvantaged area that uh, is surrounded by a couple existing power plants as it is. Um, is clearly an environmental justice community. Uh, it, it, the law, as I currently understand it, is that someone can go into the siting council, can submit an application to put monopoles um, on either side of that property with you know, high-voltage transmission lines running practically on top of that site without anyone reaching out um, maybe there's a formal letter that gets sent that has a whole bunch of legalese to it, but that's not community outreach, and we know that's not community outreach. But as I understand the current state of the law, as long as that letter is sent, that's it. There's no obligation on behalf of the utility to actually reach out to Ms. Tisdale or the Barnum Museum or um, the gentleman we heard at the outset who had invested in in art lofts and art studios in the West End, or frankly, all the other folks we're gonna hear from today who are affected by a project like this that have no knowledge of it until a month, two months before the siting council makes a decision. I mean, I, is, that, is that the current state of the law in Connecticut? With respect to the absolute I, I would say that just with respect, I'm not asking whatever source would or would not do. I'm asking, I, I get, I'm going to hear it. We wouldn't do that. We would do, and, and full disclosure, you and I did have an opportunity to meet we did. this morning and, and to discuss some of these issues, but I'm looking for just what is the bare minimum required under the law? Under the law, notification is required to be in the newspapers a certain amount of time. It is required to be in the bill inserts at least twice. It is required 
that the applicant have a municipal consultation period with the municipalities that are affected by the project and could seek further direction from the municipalities to other individuals or stakeholders that should be engaged in the outreach. But to your question, engaging with the CEO of the municipality, providing those notices as required in the newspapers, even the weeklies, requiring that there be notification to abutting property owners for substations, but transmission lines notifications are frequently happening within the, bills, the bill insert and with other notifications that are required in publications. Right, but with respect to a transmission line itself, right? There's not a requirement that if there's going to be a line running adjacent to a property, that there be a direct outreach to that to that particular home. No. Okay. Um, and there's also not. Uh, you talked about a, a municipal consultation. That is just an option for the chief elected official in the town to have that consultation. If they don't respond to the invite. That municipal consultation may or may not occur. Correct. We are required to provide the applications to the chief elected official, to other members of the administration. I think we provide it to the head of DPW. Uh, we have to file it with the library. Uh, so the application gets a little broader circulation than just to the CEO of the municipality. Um, so, we heard, particularly with respect to the siting council process, if someone doesn't sort of jump on this initially when they get that first letter, right? Um, there's a time limit in the siting council process, right? That somebody can't intervene after a certain period of time with respect to the siting council process. That's right? correct. The siting council is bound by their administrative. What obligation does the siting council have to take into account economic impact of a project and by economic impact i don't mean sort of there's going there may be some additional tax revenue generated to the town but what is what is the cost differential so for example if you're taking property if you're imposing easements on private property that are now going to be uh, in the right of way of a transmission line that can't be redeveloped for a six-story apartment building for example what obligation does the siting council have to take that into account? The siting council's obligation with respect to cost is relative to the cost of the project and to the ratepayers of the state of Connecticut. So they are, when looking at a project under an application process, they're balancing the need for the project against the cost to the ratepayers of the project and the environmental impact to the resources of the state of Connecticut. And so, that would also include cultural resources. So in, other, so in other words, they're not supposed to take into account what the economic impact of a project is to surrounding properties. No. And they do not insert themselves in any landowner negotiations between parties. So for example, if a public utility were to come in and say, we want to build a transmission line that's going to bring power from the south end of Bridgeport to lower Fairfield County and that transmission line is going to cut straight smack through the heart of the downtown of our state's largest city and smack through the heart of the West End redevelopment area. Um, the siting council can't take into account what the negative economic impact to that state's largest city would be. If there is testimony that is provided by the municipality, by others relative to that, the siting council absolutely will take that into account because it is judging community impact as part of the environmental impact equation when they're trying to balance the need for the project against the cost of the right pairs. Okay. All right. Well, we'll ask, you know, I think Ms. Bachman's going to testify later. I'll ask her that question, but because um, that wasn't my understanding. My understanding was they're supposed to look at the environmental impact. Um, but the actual economic impact in terms of lost development opportunity for the city 
cannot be taken into account under current under current law. It's not explicitly stated, but if okay. a CEO of a municipality says this is going to be a huge economic impact to my municipality, and here's all the reasons why, the signing council absolutely would take that into consideration. But let me ask the question this way then. So would Eversource have an objection then, if it's already sort of implied, I assume Eversource wouldn't have an objection to specifying in statute that the siting council is supposed to take into account the economic impact to the municipality. I mean, if that's already, if that's already, if you say they're already doing it, um, then shouldn't we put it in statute to make it crystal clear that that's one of the siting council's responsibilities is to consider the economic impact of a project? As part of the entire community impact, yes, because I can see where it might be in conflict with this council's current charge to consider the cost to the ratepayers. So you can't, the, the council has to has a tough job yeah, in have, trying uh, to They have to weigh it, they have to weigh it all. Right, okay, all right, fair enough. Um, further questions or comments? If not, appreciate being with us. Thank you. Uh, Melanie Bachman. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Good afternoon, Representative Sassroom, ranking and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Melanie Bachman. I'm the Executive Director, Staff Attorney, and Legislative Liaison for the Connecticut Siting Council. And I thank you for the opportunity to provide comment on Bill number 5507. I'll be brief as we also submitted written testimony yesterday. However, for the members who aren't familiar with us, we were created to regulate energy and telecommunications infrastructure on a statewide basis due to competing interests, costs to electric ratepayers, and litigation. We balance the public need for adequate and reliable public utility services at the lowest reasonable cost to consumers with the need to protect the environment and ecology of the state. We have nine members supported by nine full-time staff. Members and staff have experience in fields such as government, electrical engineering, environmental science, and other related fields. We adjudicate applications for gas transmission lines, electric transmission lines, substations, cell towers, and electric generating facilities, including renewable fuel facilities, such as solar, wind, fuel cells, and battery storage. Our process is quasi-judicial. It involves afternoon evidentiary public hearing sessions and evening public comment sessions to develop a substantial record upon which to render a decision. If approved, Facilities are often modified from the original proposal through the siting council process. Any party or intervener to our proceedings may appeal a siting council decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bachman. And, and I know we do have your written testimony, which um, frankly was, was quite extensive and, and I found to be quite constructive. So I, I appreciate that. Um, two quick questions for you. First, um, I assume you heard the testimony of the last couple people who spoke. Um, so I want to ask you specifically about sort of historically significant properties, including um, uh, the Freeman Center and, and Ms. Tisdale's testimony. Um, to what extent is public comment, particularly public comment from a um, historically significant property taken into account by the uh by the siting council, because certainly at least here we we have testimony from uh, Ms. Tisdale among among others that they feel the siting council does not adequately take into account um, the the public uh, comment they receive on an application, and and uh, I'm wrestling with how to uh, how to assure the public that the siting council is taking into account what what is being heard. So, could you just explain that process for us, please? Certainly. We are required to consult with other state agencies that include uh, the State Historic Preservation Office. However, um, as part of our process, applicants are required to submit uh, historic reports uh, consistent with the requirements of the State Historic Preservation Office. And the Freeman Houses were indeed identified um, in that analysis, and they were taken into account. And our condition uh, of approval relating to state historic uh, resources is for UI to continue 
uh, to communicate and negotiate um, with the historic agencies, including state agencies and city agencies on uh, protection of local resources and any type of mitigation measures. I know in Fair, uh, Milford, um, docket number 508, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office did submit their own uh, alternative design to the transmission line and also um, advised for mitigation that would um, consist of research and um, in the Milford Cemetery. So if if there's a negotiation between, say, UI and the Freeman Houses, um, for example, or I guess, you know, any utility and a, uh, a property owner, particularly significant historical property, um, and those negotiations reach an impasse where the utility says we want to do something and the, uh, the property owner says, no, that's that's not sufficient to address our concerns, um, then what? We would look to the State Historic Preservation Office to somewhat act as an arbiter as to what would be appropriate um, among the among the two parties. But what's what's the standard at the end of the day? You know, like normally sort of there's a, you know, if it's in court, you said you have a quasi judicial process. There's a, a you know, preponderance in evidence or or uh, clear and convincing evidence or sometimes in the constitutional sense, we talk about kind of heightened scrutiny. Is there any sort of heightened scrutiny or, um, or, or uh, extra emphasis that's placed on historically significant sites in, as part of one of these applications? We operate under the Uniform Administrative Procedure Act. So we're required to render a decision based on a uh, record of substantial evidence. Our statutory evaluation criteria are extensive, um, mostly related to state policies, which include, uh, but aren't limited to cultural and historic resources. But we also have to balance those competing interests with other environmental interests. Uh, so it is it is a balance and it's a difficult balance and the members do take their job very seriously. But we do rely very heavily on community input uh, state agency input, municipal input, and any other, um, you know, neighborhood group or environmental organization that comments. Let me, yeah, let me ask it this way. Do you have, do you have any opposition to a requirement that there be a uh, substantial weight given to sort of above just in, in the event of an impasse between the utility and the historic property that, you know, it's not a sort of a 51-49 split, but but substantial weight has to be given to the argument made by the historical property of how the um, uh, how the proposed facility would would impact them. I wouldn't find it advisable to hold one competing interest uh, over any others, um, but certainly if there is an impasse that is reached among uh, the owner of the property and the applicant, if the project does get approved. Um, we could further um, explore any options that may have been presented and possibly assist in that. Yeah, and I, I do want to keep moving. I, I apologize for monopolizing this, but just last question for you. Um, on this economic impact question, I, it, it was my understanding that the, the siting council is not supposed to take into account sort of the overall economic impact of a facility, that, that just because it may have an adverse um, impact on an ability to say develop a neighborhood or to um, uh, or or neighboring property properties etc that that the overall economic impact is not part of, or is not a significant part of the uh, uh, of the calculus am I am I incorrect on that we certainly take into account uh, testimony and comments from the municipalities and the property owners. Uh, but economic impact is not one of the statutory criteria by which we are to render decisions. Um, we, the only real reference to economic in our whole statutory scheme is more in terms of costs to the ratepayers. 
So um, beyond cost to rate payer, what I'm talking about is sort of what is what is the lost development opportunity? Again, if you're talking about running a transmission line through the heart of your state's, the downtown of your state's largest city, for example, there is clearly a lost economic impact to that. Um, is that something that is taken into account? Uh, it seemed like, at least from the testimony from Eversource, that they believe the siting council is informally taking that into account, even if it's not statutorily written into the statute um is that is that correct or 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 would it be advisable to put that into statute to make sure it's clear that the siting council is considering what is the overall economic impact to a city to a region and to the state as a whole uh, as part of its deliberations i believe Ms. shanley characterized it um appropriately the in, in one of the suggestions in our written testimony, perhaps we can expand the municipal consultation uh, to include, you know, something that may, you know, reference maybe the delta between, you know, I leave that to the municipal experts as to how to adequately represent um, what that economic impact would be. Certainly through the consultation, there should be discussion about, we have plans to develop you know, this certain area for, you know, whatever purpose. And, I, you know, it could be a recreational well, purpose. It could be. But if I heard you, if I understood your testimony correctly, what you're telling me is is the economic impact is not something the siting council is allowed to base its decision on. It's not one of the several factors it considers. It's just looking at, at, at rate payer impact and environmental impact. And I would submit there needs to be a third bucket, which is economic impact. But I, you know, if the siting council isn't going to take that into consideration at the end of the day, if it's not one of the factors it considers in making its decision, what good is it even to bring it up at the municipal uh, meeting? I think it has value in a municipal meeting because before the application arrives at our door, it gives the municipality and the utility an opportunity to perhaps collaborate on a solution um, in terms of you know, redevelopment areas or areas to avoid, or can you, can you move the line over here? Or can you get this structure out from the front door of, you know, this historic resource? Okay. Well, look, I, I just think somebody needs to be taken into account the economic impact. And if the siting council isn't willing and able to do it, then maybe we need something else. But I, I think the siting council needs to consider economic impact. I mean, we are trying to, our job as a legislature is to, you know, uh, in many respects is to, is to improve the lives of people of the state of Connecticut. And, you know, that's growing jobs, more housing, better communities. And if we're not taking into account economic impact as part of what we're doing, then um, frankly, I think we're, I think we're failing our residents, but um, thank you for being with us. Appreciate your testimony. Um, Next up will be Stacy Ober. Good afternoon, chairs of the Judiciary Committee and honorable members. My name is Stacy Ober. I am the New England Government Relations Manager for the American Kennel Club. We represent more than 5,000 dog clubs nationally, including 56 in Connecticut alone. And those clubs make up the Connecticut Federation of Dog Clubs and Responsible Dog Owners, which represent thousands of dog owners in Connecticut. Uh, speaking of economics, I'll share with you that AKC licensed and sanctioned 328 events in Connecticut in 2022, where more than 37,000 dogs participated. And on average, exhibitors spend $982 per um, show weekend. So these facts leave no doubt as to the impact purebred dog breeders and owners have in Connecticut. I'm here today because I wanna support Senate Bill 427, which concerns police dogs and canine search and rescue teams. I know you've received my written testimony on the value of these dogs. I'll just acknowledge that AKC does in fact um, value the contribution that working and detection dogs make to national security and the extraordinary role that these dogs play in protecting the peace and security of individuals, communities, and the nation. Um, AKC honors these breeders, trainers, and handlers, and supports expanded scientific research and breeding programs to ensure that sufficient numbers of high quality domestically bred dogs are available to law enforcement. 
Um, that being said, I have, while waiting to speak, reviewed some of the testimony that's been submitted to the committee. Uh, there are some concerns with subsection D of section one of the bill. I'll just acknowledge that the bill would insert uh, the word killing in the current law that penalizes the intentional injuring of a police canine or search and rescue team, and then would increase the penalty from a class D to a class C, allowing up up to 10 years prison and up to $10,000 fine. Um, I just acknowledge that the committee might, might want to review the text of the Federal Law Enforcement Animal Protection Act that was adopted in 2000. It's public law 106-254, which imposes a similar felony penalty, but it specifies in the language not that type of felony just for an injury. It would apply for an offense that Permanently, ma permanently maims, disables, or disfigures the animal. So I think that more likely reflects the intent of Senate Bill 427 in enhancing the penalty there. I'll go on to just acknowledge that for the past 10 years, AKC has hosted a Adopt a Police Canine grant program, and Connecticut has been the recipient of 14 of those grants. Our partnering kennel clubs raise at least 25% of the purchase price of a police canine and the AKC Reunite does a contribution match of donation at a three to one ratio up to 7,400 per grant. Thank uh, towns Thank and Thank ma'am. Thank you. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Questions or comments? Seeing none, um, we appreciate your testimony and certainly if, if you had more, feel free to submit it in writing. Um, Victoria Fingley will be next. Victoria Fingley, okay. How about uh, Sabrina Smeltz? Sabrina with us? Okay, um, we already had Senator Wong, so Mark Donald. Mark Donald. There he is. Hey, Mark. How are you? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, members of the Judiciary Committee, happy to be here in person today. And I'm uh, here speaking on support of 5508 um, in its entirety. Uh, most specifically, um, speaking in support of the uh, youth re-entry program. Um, uh, I didn't fully introduce myself. I am the president and CEO of RIASAP, a um, youth services organization in Bridgeport that uh, serves the spectrum of disengaged and disconnected youth through diversionary programming, direct service, including credible messenger programs, as well as we run the hub, which is the uh, regional behavioral health organization in southwestern Connecticut. Um, so in support of the youth reentry, a uh, big fan of the credible messenger aspect of it. For over 20 years, I've seen the impact of that work in person. And uh, most importantly, uh, rather than anecdotally, that is supported with evidence from the Urban Institute um, showing that over 69% um, of young people who are engaged in credible messengers, working with credible messengers over the course of their first 12 months are not rearrested. Uh, that number holds true 57% of those young people uh, for over two years. Um, it's an impactful program uh, that allows uh, returning citizens who are adults typically uh, engage with young people when they're coming out or before they go in. And it gives the credibility and that mentorship that often uh, is not available from people that uh, with my own experience, whether I have advanced degrees or not. Um, another good aspect of it is the restorative justice component. Um, when it comes to restorative justice, uh, the typical kind of, um, shall we say, uh, reputation for those who aren't familiar with the work is that it's soft. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. It gives the young people the opportunity to, to take ownership of their work, understand the harm they've caused, and in particular, repair the harm they've caused to make the relationship whole whether that's involved with a representative of the victim's uh, family that they've worked with, the victim himself, or even a representative of an institution that they've harmed. Uh, another key piece of 
uh, this aspect is the workforce development. Uh, as we've all seen through the most recent unspoken crisis report that's been re uh, referred to by several um, speakers today, uh, the workforce development that currently exists doesn't always serve a returning youth or young people who are the most severely disconnected as well as it should be. And it's something that we need to invest in so that it shows that we are putting our money where our mouth is, quite literally putting the resources uh, where our mouth is in support of these young people when they're coming out so that there is a plan in place for them to take advantage of. Uh, another great uh, aspect of this would be the transforming uh, behavioral health for young people. And I will leave it at that because I could go on and on uh, for a few minutes. Mark, we, we love your advocacy. We love your passion for this, but yes, we'll leave it there. Uh, question from uh, Representative Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Mark. Thank you for coming here today. Um, Mark, have you had a chance to look at 5506 on our agenda, which is uh, similar? I have. And um, what's your position with regard to that, Bill, if, if you have any? So uh, I'm a former uh, principal and teacher um, as well. So I'm familiar with the uh, family with service needs process. And in, in my experience, it wasn't effective. Um, often left parents more frustrated um, as at the result of it. Um, additionally, I, I think when we're talking about young people who are struggling, um, the diagnosis and um, as I've heard root cause, you know, the, the trauma informed language of all behavior has meaning is not well served by the family with service needs process. Okay. And I'm just, I'm trying to get past the title, right? Because the title becomes a little electric, um, did you have a chance to read the bill? I, I did. Um, okay. I, so I, what, what particular, because although it's titled in a certain fashion, it's totally different than what was there in the past. So I'm just trying to, what is the problem with this particular path should the legislature decide to go down it? So I, I think any time that um, we're involving, you know, the petitioning and the language and and to be to be fair to the bill itself, I didn't study that one as closely as I studied this one, um, particularly as I had engaged in the process. And, and in my mind, when we're looking at um, issues that we can head off ahead of time, um, using the process is not as impactful as it could be. And I think when we are uh, you know, for me, uh, wearing the, the hat of an educator as a teacher, someone who worked um, with young people who are really struggling, um, it it doesn't support the families in the way that it needs to. Um, you know, and in reality, uh, I feel very strongly that it's a public health issue um, versus uh, an issue with uh, judiciary. Okay. And I'm just trying to figure out you know, because I, I read, I think, all of the testimony, a lot of it was boilerplate that somebody just said, send this stuff in. Um, and I'm just trying to have the talk about this. So let me give you the scenario. Um, you know, 14-year-old kid, just as, as we were all 14-year-old kids, right? At one point. I have one myself. There you go. Um, you know, I don't want to go to school. I... You know, what do I need that stuff for? I'm going to be a star football player or whatever. Um, I'm not going to school. I don't care. Um, you know, a lot of uh, single parent homes in this state um, and other states, right? Um, you know, young man's growing up. He's bigger than mom. What does mom do under our current system? <laughs> under the current system, it would be getting support from the Youth Service Bureau. Um, I think, uh, you know, Erica Brown, we stated that it, it's that process itself is still imperfect. Um, you, the the term all behavior has meaning can sometimes, I think, become a, a platitude, but it, it has real meaning for that person. And that's also why I think it's a public health. I think some of the issues are with the value and the inability um, and or unwillingness of our education system to be changed. 
So is the young person refusing because they're turned off from school? Are they struggling in school? Are there mental health issues? Are there behavioral health issues? Um, it, it, it's hyper complex and very much individual. And you know, again, that's kind of where I say it's a public health issue because I think it, it includes our educators uh, really looking from the ground up. I think it's supporting uh, educators in the classroom. Uh, I was trained as an English teacher. I was not trained in any mental health diagnosis. I was not trained in any trauma informed or trauma responsive um, practices. I learned that on my own and am now trying to translate that. So for, for that mom, uh, you know, it, I would not be being glib when I would say, give me a call. Um, because we have programs that can support across the spectrum, including some of the um, assessments in those uh, situations, whether it's social emotional, whether it's academic, whether it's behavioral, um, whether it's just basic mentoring. Uh, it's, it's a complex issue and very often individualistic. Okay, so right now, mom, the only outlet she has is to reach out to their her local youth services bureau. If if that particular town has one, right? Um, so the 14 year old kid, because it's not a, a crime, um, you know, the police don't get involved. Um, youth services, what can they do? Um, they, I mean, yeah, there, there also is the 211 process, which can be both a phone call and um, you can go online and look for resources that are available. Um, Youth Service Bureau um, in Bridgeport in particular, um, they will make referrals to programs after they do their assessment um, with the family and the young person um, that they think is the best fit. Um, for example, if we get a referral for truancy, um, we will engage with the family. Um, we will look at what the issues are. We will connect them with pro-social activities. Um, you know, oftentimes that comes through our juvenile review board program. So DCF provides funding where we can connect them um, with pro-social activities that are um, customizable. Uh, you know, we've connected young people with um, art therapy. Uh, we've connected people with boxing, with gym memberships, with uh, um, uh, extra tutoring support, with um, mentoring um, trying to think the other laundry list. But I also think that's our ability as a nonprofit to be flexible. Um, and and they all my staff has the proper training to make these assessments to support the family, which I think is what we're all aiming for. Sure. So um, once again, the child doesn't want to go to school. The Youth Services Bureau has now hooked them up with um, an activity, art, boxing i'm still trying to figure out where this child is learning to read and write in in the concept that we're dealing with it's two months down the road the child is comfortable they're not going to school they're painting which is not limiting painting right they're learning footwork for boxing that's that's the future of our kids. I'm just trying to figure out because right now there is nothing because this application, this petition, this cry out for help went away. So that's what I'm to tell my constituents when they've got the 14 year old kid who's not going to school, refuses to go to school, that they're going to be an artist or a boxer and live with it. Yeah, so it's it's not just the referral. We do intensive case management. Uh, you know, the the JRB program that we run is successful over eighty three percent of the time. You know, the reality is eighty three is not a hundred, right? And we want to continue to get closely to one hundred. So what we do is we can we continuously we study our case notes. We go back to the drawing board. We try different aspects. Um, we have uh, our JRB case managers are actually credible messengers in and of themselves. Um, while they don't have necessarily live justice experience, they're from Bridgeport. They grew up in Bridgeport. They we have a female, we have a male, right? We have Latina, we have um, a, a black uh, man. 
And so we will look at those case notes to try and figure out what we're missing. So, and we work with the family on it too. So it, sometimes it's, and I think this is, uh, you know, kind of a philosophical problem I have is if a young person misses 13 days in um, by Christmas, right, then they're chronically absent the rest of the year, whether they have perfect attendance or not. So we will look at victories. We will look at um, gains that they've made. We'll look at gains they haven't made and try and fill in the gaps with that and do that case management one on one. Um, I wish I could say, I mean, you know, again, 83% successful. I'd love to hang my hat on it, but I can't until we get to 100. So this young person that we're talking about, a 14-year-old who has a lot of agency, especially in a, a single parent household that's working that, you know, quote unquote, is a, you know, latchkey kid is how do we get them? And, you know, knowing teenage behaviors, you know, my, my expertise is working with young people and they will not listen to their parent. However, they will listen to another adult who cares about them. And, and that's what our model is and trying to close all these loopholes, I think, or, or I think better, better way, not loophole is close the gaps to ensure that they are being successful. And, you know, the other piece of it, as you, as you mentioned, is they do have to read and write if they're traumatized, if they feel unsafe, if they're not hungry, if they don't sleep well, if there's, you know, issues in the neighborhood, gunshots, right? It's, we, we have to take care of those needs before we can get them in the learning mode. Yeah, I just, I'll just represent that the language of this bill um, does not engage the youth in any criminal justice system until it gets very severe. Um, and I, and I would hope that somebody would look at the language because these parents don't have an avenue right now. And I mean, part of the problem with the poison process was it was police driven. You know, police officer could not arrest this child for doing something. That was the avenue. So it was sort of like a scapegoat process. And I understand the bad part of that. But what's before us in the legislation allows a parent to be part of the process and to reach out to try and engage those services through a different vehicle. Because at some point with some of these kids, listen, I was one of them, right? I mean, I'm in a different place today, but I had a D average in high school. Um, and... You know, I am where I am today through different means. And I see these kids falling through the cracks. And I see some of these kids that are not surviving. And it's not their fault. It's the fault of the system. And avenues that have been taken away, just because people say that there's a bad specter I don't think is working for us at all. When I look at the truancy rates in the cities especially, those people, those kids looking to escape the cities and get a decent job where they can assimilate and you know be part of society, truancy is not the answer at all. I want everybody to flourish. I think we have to do something here. And and just to say no because of the title, I don't think is helping our kids. So I thank you for coming. I really very much appreciate you being here today. So thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you both for, for the questions. Seeing uh, Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you for being here today. And thank you for the work that you do. Critically important to um, the communities that we're discussing. Um, I didn't get to ask this question of Ms. Bromley, so I want to ask you, because you have stated you are a principal and a teacher and an educator. Can you tell us what constitutes truancy in the state of Connecticut? Uh, it's uh, over 10% absentee, uh, represents chronic absenteeism. Uh, I, th I think the definition and the reality is, is what 
concerns me the most. Uh, you know, I could pontificate on this issue um, as somebody who's worked with, um, you know, gifted students who should can master the content in one or two days a week, unfortunately, and therefore they don't do it. But then there's students that need eight days a week. Um, so I, I think you know, with with staying within the means of the question, I, I think we need to determine why. Um, we all know that the youth mental health is is exponentially uh, getting worse, and uh, which plays into a fact. We know we now have competition for attention through devices that are within our hands, within our homes. Mm -hmm. um, we also know that there was this funny thing called hybrid learning that. Um, young people experienced and uh, i would guess they didn't thrive in it either um so how do how do we get back to that and that's that's again why i think it's a public health issue because we got to look at it from a prevention an intervention and a response level i absolutely agree and i thank you for restating that um the other thing that you know just listening to the dialogue going back and forth another question that arose for me well what what does um, what does it engage this language, this bill that you were discussing? And I'm talking about not the one you support and but I believe it's 5506, um, the youth in before it gets to the court engagement. Like I, I miss that. So, yeah, I mean, I think for me and, and this is especially my historical, um, opinion and and to uh, representative fishbein's point i didn't dig into this bill as much because i i think anytime a young person is going towards court um i have an issue which is why i, I believe in diversionary um non-court uh, uh related interventions mm -hmm. um because we have uh the opportunity to look at it from a, a comprehensive health uh perspective and you know the initial quote unquote assessment um, may not be a diagnosis. Uh, it may be that true assessment to meet that young people, that young person and the family where they are and provide the supports um, that we're familiar with in the community. I think mm -hmm. that's one one thing that my case managers do really well is because they're from the community. They know who to call and they will call people who may not even be directly serving to offer a lending ear, offer, you know, discounted right. lessons or whatever that looks like. Right. And you you miss it. you mentioned the credible messengers. Um I call it the village. <laughs> you guys call it credible messengers. But I think the the thing that I really want to stress because it hasn't really been discussed is the village, right? I've heard conversations around what do we do with this kid who just refuses to obey the rules, right? Just going to do what he or she wants to do. What do we do with them? And and you and Erica and others have talked about you know, the J the JRBs and um, all the different programs, diversionary programs that we currently have in existence. But I would like to hear you talk a little bit more about the community involvement, because personally, you know, I have plenty of these kids in my district and I can tell you what we do is we show up. I've went and sat in Panera for weeks on end because they were coming in that store just totally being disrespectful and disruptive. The police were being called and, and and we got a call. So we intervened. And I'm talking about the adults in the community, well-respected people, pastors, parents, legislators on both the local and the state level. And that manager thanked us profusely about three weeks in. He said, I just can't believe the difference in how they're coming in here, knowing that you guys are going to be every day we rotated a shift to show up, to let them know not on our watch. You were raised better than this. And if you weren't, we're here to teach you something different, right? We held them accountable. But I think the biggest piece of it for them, and one of the students actually said this to us one day at a table, you know, I guess we do matter to some people because nobody's ever showed up like this for us. Yeah. So, so can we talk about not just programs, but the community, the people that really care about these kids, showing up and how that impacts their behavior and puts them on a different trajectory. 
Yeah, I, absolutely. And, um, you know, I've, I've seen it with my own eyes. Uh, that was my own conversion 20 years ago, seeing how impactful somebody from the community was on the behavior. Um, I was a principal in your district okay. and I saw a parent who was a bus driver and all she had to do was raise an eyebrow at some of these kids and they, they would snap into it. Right. And, you know, also, you know, in similar veins, when it comes to the parents, they're teenagers, right? What do all parent, uh, teenagers do? They tune out their parents, <laughs> right? It's a natural rebellion. Yes, stage. it is. So, you know, tomorrow we have one of our credible messengers who who's going to speak on a panel um, at the uh, uh, at the JJPOC. Right? He's lived it. He's done it. He spent time. Um, I, uh, I teach a community college class at, at Garner Correctional facility. And I've got 11 young men, excuse me, they're not young, they're not even close to young, but they are begging me, can we talk to these young people that you're working with from, and we've got internet, can we make this work? And I'm thinking, you know what, I'm going to damn sure try because those kids will listen to you more than they will listen to me. And they're passionate because they screwed up in their own life and they own it and they want to make a difference. Thank, thank you, Mark. Actually, I wasn't done, um, Mr. Chair. Representative Porter, I, I'm not trying to hurry you along, but we do still have quite a lengthy list to get through here. So I just want to make sure we're staying on the language of the bill and, and are refining our questions accordingly. Well, I'm going to go ahead and thank you since I've been um, interrupted. And I do appreciate the work that you're doing. Look thank forward to much. furthering conversation outside of this committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Aaron Romano will be next. Good afternoon, members of the Judiciary Committee. It's uh, My name is Aaron Romano. I'm a resident of Bloomfield, Connecticut. I'm a, uh, an attorney for 26 years. I've been practicing in criminal defense. I'm a member of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, a member of the Connecticut Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, but I'm here appearing in my individual capacity. I'm here to support, um, to urge your support, and I also uh, commend Senate Bill 444, and that I do have some problems with Senate Bill 5509, Section 2. But more importantly, I want to address uh, the proposed changes to the law in Senate Bill 5505. Uh, 5505 deals with individuals who are charged um, in criminal court and raise a self-defense claim. And there are two changes to the law that are proposed. One is with respect to bail. Uh, currently, the way bail is set, the, the bail commissioner's office and the court considers the strength of the state's case. Now, this is very difficult for folks who are facing uh, charges when they're raising a defense of self-defense because they're admitting to the conduct. And so it's a very strong case against them. Uh, however, that uh, ability to raise self-defense in one of the conditions or one of the uh, variables that's um, considered in bail is not currently considered. What this bill does is it allows the bail commissioner's office and the courts to consider self-defense in setting bail, in uh, evaluating the strength of the state's case. In addition to that, it also it also um, allows for a motion to dismiss to be filed uh, in cases where people are alleging self-defense. And what this does is it is a mechanism to relieve the backlog of cases on the trial list and enable attorneys to apply for this dismissal of their case prior to a trial. Uh, currently, the way it works is unless a prosecutor agrees to unilaterally withdraw prosecution, an individual charged with a crime must go to a full trial with a jury. This has an obvious impact when the jury lists currently are two years long. It has an obvious impact on the individual's life, affecting their ability to attain employment and educational opportunities. They basically must wait their time. This bill will empower a court to make the decision to dismiss a case involving self-defense. Currently, people who act in self-defense, they commit a crime, and they have to go through the process of an arrest, a prosecution, and a trial, even though their actions are claiming that they've, they've acted in a lawful manner, that they're justified. And this, uh, this would help 
uh, alleviate the backlog within the court system. And then also it would help to uh, reduce the impact that it has on these good citizens who act in self-defense. Thank you, sir. Questions from the committee, Representative Khan? Thank you. Um, I have two questions. So I'll start with um, section one since you just ended on section one. So um, I know you spoke specifically uh, about how this would reduce the backlog. I know I had heard some concern that um, folks had that it would do somewhat of the opposite where it would create a, um, an additional, um, they, it would create a lot of unnecessary cases and, and place a burden on the judicial system. So can you speak to the the way that you believe that it would reduce the backlog? Well, with two, in two ways. Right now, there are motions to dismiss that are filed in the civil context. So in the civil court, when a case is on a trial list, motions to dismiss for various reasons can be filed. We don't see that actually creating uh, a burden on the civil uh, docket. Instead, what it's doing is it is eliminating a lot of cases from the civil docket. So from a civil context, we see that the motions to dismiss, they, they actually have a beneficial effect on clearing the docket. Secondly, from a criminal context, in order for someone to ask a judge to dismiss a case, the typical strategy of a defense attorney is to hold their cards close to their chest and not reveal their defense strategy. A motion to dismiss would basically be a preview of their case to the state. So I can only envision contexts or, or cases where the uh, self-defense claim is so strong that a defense attorney would advise their client that this would be a good idea to move forward. In those cases where the self-defense claim was not strong, it would go to a trial. Uh, so I really don't see um, that creating a backlog, uh, it would be a strategic decision and only in those cases from an attorney, defense attorney standpoint, I certainly would not want to reveal my hand uh, to the state, um, knowing that very well the judge could deny my motion to dismiss and my client would have been exposed to cross-examination, um, my entire case would be revealed to the state and then they would have a dry run basically at the trial to win the trial. So I, I don't see uh, a context where, unless the case is extremely strong where an attorney would advise his client to move forward with a motion to dismiss. Okay, um, thank you. And then uh, my second question on 5509, you mentioned some concerns you had in section two. Can you just elaborate? Yes, I, uh, this section was covered by another uh, citizen who testified. Uh, in section two, sub A, sub one, uh, there's an, a proposed amendment for the odor of uh, cannabis or burnt cannabis to um, to actually uh, amend that so there there could be a reasonable suspicion uh, to support a stop and search of a person who is under the age of 18 in a motor vehicle. And, and I think the context here is now once we have um, once we have legalization in the state, there are people who adults. Uh, who might um, imbibe of cannabis inside a car. Uh, they might not be permitted to do that in the home that they live in, and it might be too cold outside, so the car might provide them that refuge. They're not certainly driving the car, but they're using it as a shelter. Uh, the next day, if a minor child then drives the car uh, and gets stopped by the police, obviously that would give rise potentially to a search, an unnecessary search of the car, whereas uh, this child is innocent um, in from any potential wrongdoing. So it what it may have an effect, it may have an effect that there will be increased searches of cars, especially with minors. And I think what we're trying to do now is we're trying to create an environment where uh, there's uh, more of a, more of a, a cohesive interaction between police and young people here. And if we give the police an opportunity to then be searching minors' cars, it's not going to uh, really encourage that 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 feeling of cohesiveness within the police and uh, minor kids who will eventually be adults. We want there to be positive interactions with law enforcement. Okay. I'm I'm all set. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further questions or comments, Representative Quinn? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for being with us, Attorney Romano. Um, I had some concerns in 5505 in Section 1 that oftentimes in a breach of peace situation or uh, an assault third, uh, you do have defendants representing themselves, and I'm wondering if we aren't opening the door for um, uh, more people to claim the affirmative defense of self-defense to get themselves a hearing within 45 days and then potentially overburden the court system with these. So thank you for the question. So uh, I guess your concern is that a self-represented party would make uh, an unnecessary demand or, or, or they would start making demands in a yes. domestic violence situation? Well, no, is in that... any situation. Um, you know, I mean, oftentimes it's a fight between two people and sure. nobody gets particularly hurt. You aren't into the upper assault uh, charges, but in the lower charges, um, I mean, are we going to have a system? Are we going to create an avenue where uh, anybody who thinks that they were acting in self-defense is now going to, you know, file the motion to have a hearing within 45 days and thus create possibility of uh, of an overburdened GA as a result of this. Yeah, um, Representative Quinn, I, I cannot uh, conceive of a scenario where um, self-represented parties would, would do that because they would be exposed to cross-examination by the prosecution. Um, and, and I think if there is a self-defense claim that's being raised, it may very well be legitimate and perhaps it would force the prosecution to reevaluate their case and the docket could clear. In the cases that I've represented people with uh, self-defense matters, I had one homicide several years ago that took uh, close to a year to resolve. And during that year, that person was under house arrest with a GPS monitor, basically because they admitted to committing the homicide. Uh, once the investigation was complete uh, from the state's attorney's perspective, they withdrew the charges. But for that entire year, this person was basically under house arrest. What this would do is this would force the case to move forward in a more efficient manner. So people who have acted lawfully, and I want to just qualify this, self-defense is where someone commits a crime, usually an assault or it could be a homicide, but there is a justification for committing that, that assault or that homicide. So they've committed the crime, but they have a justification, a lawful justification for doing it. So the court process works through and they get they eventually get to a jury trial. But this would this would circumvent the need to go that far uh, with the two year waiting period with people's lives being uh, hampered. Uh, by doing the right thing in a particular situation. So if I see someone in, in need, and I see someone in distress, a victim of crime, I intervene on their behalf. I'm now potentially facing an arrest, a prosecution, and I could be waiting for a period of two years for that case to resolve. And so this will help people understand that if they act, if they intervene and they're doing the right thing and they're a good Samaritan, they have an avenue to have the case dismissed rather than to go through that entire process. Okay. And, you know, I understand exactly where you're coming from and, and the circumstances that have led to this and, and certainly agree that in that circumstance, something should happen much quicker. But I, again, I just have a concern that self-represented parties aren't necessarily going to be thinking like attorneys and and you know realizing that by going for this they may be hurting themselves down the line so that's just my concern on it but again i understand where you're coming from thank you representative if if, if i may just make one comment on that representative Quinn. yes the self-represented parties many times in the court system right now are a burden because they do not understand uh, the court rules. And so unfortunately, the judges, prosecutors um, have to be very patient with, with that process. Uh, it, I don't think there are many self-represented parties who want to bring cases to trial or have hearings. They're looking to resolve their matter. Um, so I, I don't have statistics to support this, but just my own 
experience in observing court. Um, and I know self-represented parties in many cases, as you said, they, they're not making a wise decision by going to court alone. Uh, there usually are some other issues um, that accompany, unfortunately, uh, the, those circumstances. Thank, thank you, sir. Further sure. questions, comments, seeing none. Um, appreciate being with us. And um, Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Tim Acker. I got to give you credit for getting quickly through your agenda here today. Uh, Not very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Compared to my other committees, you're doing great. Uh, Chair Senator Winfield and Representative Staffstrom, Ranking Member Senator Kissel and Representative Fishbein and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee, I am Representative Tim Acker. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of House Bill 5413, an act concerning the illegal use of certain vehicles and state takeovers and street takeovers which I hope to be amended to include additional language suggested by the House Republican Caucus to increase the penalty for organizing or actively promoting a street takeover to a Class D felony for the first offense and Class C felony for subsequent offenses. Street takeovers are a product of a large trend of increasing lawlessness on the highways and back roads of our state. This lawlessness has led to human consequences that far exceed the instances of reckless, aggressive, and discourteous driving that each of us use daily while driving in the state. In 2022, Connecticut experienced a 33 high of 380 lives lost on our state's roads and highways. Indeed, in the context of motor vehicle safety, 2022 was infamous for the dramatic increase in the number of pedestrian fatalities, motorcycle deaths, and wrong way crashes. While thankfully some of these data have shown signs of improving in the past year, the underlying trend of lawlessness, sometimes manifesting in street takeovers, continues to plague our roadways and highways. Municipalities across our state have experienced street takeovers. In Milford, around 100 vehicles uh, assembled in a supermarket parking lot in the middle of the night. While an officer approached a group of parked cars, the group responded by surrounding, hitting, and punching the officer. During a street gate takeover in Meriden, the group attacked and damaged uh, private vehicles and a police cruiser. Over, a police cruiser. The town of Tom, uh, Tallinn, in which I represent, experienced a street takeover in which some participants climbed on top of a local woman's car and jumped up and down. During a West Haven street takeover, participate, participants threw fireworks at responding uh, police officers, resulting in injury to an officer. With advance warning, the town of Shelton was able to proactively respond to and disperse an attempted takeover involving over 500 vehicles. In, in perhaps the most egregious example, 1,500 vehicles trap holiday shoppers in parking lots and backed up Interstate 91 in both directions for a mile during a street takeover in North Haven. Let's be clear. These street takeovers are an example of a dangerous lawlessness. Imagine being a parent in a vehicle with young children that is surrounded, with no avenue of escape, by individuals with no apparent regard for the law or the safety of others. Then imagine that those individuals begin to attack your vehicle, throw fireworks at your vehicle, jump on the roof or hood of your vehicle. Imagine the terror that this would cause to a parent or anyone else in this that situation. In reality, it's a form of terrorism creeping up in our communities. I will close by pointing out the obvious that the street takeovers that close public roads or highways prevent ambulance, fire, or other emergency services from getting where they need to go in the event of an emergency. This is fundamentally a public safety issue, and it's important that the law-abiding citizens have the right to freely navigate the roads and highways thank, thank uh, of Connecticut. Rep thank you, Representative. Thank you, Questions, Mr. Chair. Seeing uh, Representative O'Day. Just real quick, saying thank you very much for coming out um, and uh, bringing this to our attention. I agree with you wholeheartedly and hope to get this uh, going through and do a vote and on the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the questions or comments. Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next will be uh, First Selectman Gerber from Fairfield. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead, sir. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today in support of raised bill HB 5507, an act concerning state agency and court proceedings relating to electric transmission lines. This is certainly not the first time that legislators have had to grapple with questions around notification by corporate enti entities to the public or approval act actions sought by corporations that impact the public. 
thresholds for justifying those actions or standards for proving that such thresholds have been met. Take the very strict standards for getting a drug approved by the FDA, for example. Those standards are, are meant to protect our health, to ensure appropriate benefit versus cost, that certain thresholds are met, and the underlying methodologies and results are clear and transparent to the public. I hope that most people would agree that property rights, like our health, is very important to Americans, generally protected. So why do we have a system in place in Connecticut that so deprioritizes our property rights versus corporate interests? When we buy a regulated FDA-approved drug, for example, we expect to get a piece of paper, usually stapled to the bag, that tells us the bad things that could happen from taking that drug. Those bad things, along with the potential benefits, are disclosed after a rigorous, detailed approval process, reviewed by experts and disclosed in detail to the public. This is the law. In essence, the message I got from the Citing Council regarding our property and community rights was, we know better, trust us, we talked to some engineers, they confirmed the project is good, we're taking you on at its word, their calculations and analysis look good, but we're not going to disclose the details regarding how we came to that conclusion. How the $1.2 billion cost to underground the lines was calculated, which would probably make this the most expensive undergrounding project of all time, was never disclosed. That is pretty far from transparent. It's not something the public, especially citizens who may lose rights to their property, can believe in. The public needs independent, credible validation. We are not getting that from the Citing Council under the current regulations. What about notification to our affected property owners, our businesses, our houses of worship, our schools, and so on? In Fairfield's case, the electric utility claims to have done everything right, according to the existing regulations, to notify the public about their plan to build massive monopoles requiring new permanent property easements that would drastically scar the view plane and could ultimately sap the financial resources of anyone who decides to battle this Goliath in court. Yet somehow our residents were not aware of this impending disaster to them. How is that possible given the Siting Council opined UI followed the current notification requirements? Are our residents illiterate? No. Thank you for a second, Gerber. Um, I know it's hard on remote to hear the bell. I, I assume you've submitted written testimony as well on this? Uh, I've, I've submitted several, but I will submit um, written testimony um, on this as well. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Thank you. And um, thank you for your advocacy on, on this issue. Uh, you know, it has uh, been a, my pleasure to work with you in the, the short time you've been in office. Um, Across our shared border there uh, on on this and, and several other issues and, and appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your schedule to be here with us today. Thank you. Likewise, thank you, Representative. Uh, next will be John Poriello. Yes. My name is John Poriello, and I'm the spokesperson for Safe Streets Connecticut, which is a grassroots organization. We stand for legislative changes that will make both cities and suburbs safe places to live, work, and play. I'm in favor of three bills today, starting with SB 445, sections four and five, which will allow police officers to stop a motor vehicle when cannabis use is observed either by sight or smell by a police officer. Impaired driving, whether a driver is drinking alcohol, smoking a joint, or handheld cell phone use should be treated equally. To not treat all methods of impaired driving equally is putting all residents of this state in danger. I view this bill as a correction to the law that prohibited police officers from doing their job by not allowing them to stop obvious offenders. I was glad to hear that uh, Representative Cheeseman is also in favor of this bill. I'm in support of House Bill 5413 which um, involves both graduated penalties for repeat offenders, as well as confiscation of ATVs, dirt bikes, and cars involved in street takeovers. I'm in favor of crushing ATVs and dirt bikes and auctioning off cars that were involved in street takeovers. 
my car, my office is on the Silestine Highway in Weathersfield, and on a weekly basis, there are a parade of ATVs and dirt dirt bikes that drive down the Silestine without stopping for traffic lights. It's only a matter of time before the operators of these vehicles either are killed or kill others through their negligence. Lastly, I am in support of House Bill 5509, which lowers the age of prosecution for the crime of enticement of a minor to commit a crime from age 23 to 21. That being said, I do not think this change goes far enough. I believe the age should be lowered to 18 or 19. Any adult who is enticing a minor to commit a crime is training that minor to be a career criminal. If we are in favor of protecting minors, then punishing any adult that encourages them to commit criminal acts needs to be punished harshly. What I would like to see that aren't before the um, before this committee today are instituted uh, graduated penalties for repeat juvenile car thieves. Our current catch and release program of of uh, dealing with sir, can you stay on the bills that are before us today, please? We don't allow uh, testimony on bills that aren't before us today. Okay, then I'm all set. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Questions or comments, Representative O'Day. Uh, John, thank you very much for your testimony. I, I agree with it wholeheartedly. I was looking for your written testimony. Did you submit any written testimony? I did not. Would you like me to? Please do and okay. include what you would like to see in addition to what we have here. Uh, okay. or at least send it to me and I'd love to see it and, and hear from okay. you. And, and I don't want to take up any time, more time here, but I would love to uh, uh, buy you coffee and hear more what you have to say about what you'd like to have done for safety. Absolutely. Seats. Thank you very much. Thank further, you, Mr. Chair. Further questions or comments from the committee? If not, thanks for being with us today. Uh, Wyatt Bosworth. Good afternoon, Chairs, Staff, Sturm, Winfield, Ranking Members, Fishbein, and Kissel. Good to see you. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. My name is Wyatt Bosworth. I'm Associate Counsel with the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. I'm here to offer some comments on Senate Bill 4 and Senate Bill 361. Um, my written testimony is online, but I'll, we'll summarize key provisions right now. So we, the business community, strongly supports the goals of Sections 1 and 2 of Senate Bill 4, which are intended to protect victims of domestic violence and deter the unsolicited transmission of intimate images. Um, we applaud the committee for its proactive approach to supporting victims of domestic violence and protecting individuals' privacy and dignity in the digital age, but we are opposed to Section 3 of Senate Bill 4 and all sections of Senate Bill 361. So first, um, it's important to note that employees who oppose or object to unlawful or unethical activities in the workplace are already protected um, under current state and federal law. For example, Sections 46A-60 of the general statute, um, an anti-retaliatory provision um, prevents an employer from taking uh, retaliatory measures against an employee who opposes to discrimination in the workplace or um, files a claim with CHRO, participates in an investigation, or is interviewed. Um, likewise, you know the EEOC, the Civil Rights Act, the Age Dis uh, Discrimination Employment Act, the ADA, all have anti-retaliation provisions as well. But Senate Bill 4 and 361 uh, unnecessarily create new causes of action that are overly broad and vague, leaving room for interpretation that is likely to result in unintended consequences um, or abuse of the law. Um, so what specifically? So the new causes of action are predicated on the subjective belief um, that the employee um, you know, reasonably believed and disclosed uh, that discrimination occurred. Um, this is problematic because it opens the door for disputes based on perceptions rather than concrete evidence. Um, and both bills would also prevent an employer from taking any kind of adverse action against an employee for making claims of discrimination, no matter how unfounded, outrageous, or incredible those claims are, solely based on the employee's subjective beliefs. And I put two examples um, that I think could have unintended consequences on attorney-client privilege, for example, and confidentially in HR complaints as well. Um, you know, the bill also effectively bans NDAs uh, in the workplace. Um, the reality is that the ban would unfairly restrict the ability of employers to protect against reputational harm, um, even in the case of the most frivolous cases. Uh, without the option of an NDA and preventing an employee from publicly disparaging them, employers may also be more reluctant 
more reluctant to settle discrimination claims leading to prolonged legal battles that are more costly and time consuming for both the employer and the employee. Um, and lastly, um, you know, the statutory damages provision as well as retroactivity. So, you know, just a brief survey of other laws across the country that deals with deals with these NDAs. Um, there's it's it's I could not come across a state that puts statutory damages in place for noncompliance of these provisions. Um, so I think if the committee were to move forward, it would be um, sufficient uh, just to require that the NDAs aren't enforceable. There's no reason to put statutory damages in place. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your testimony. Are there questions or comments from members of the committee? Seeing no comments or questions, I'm just checking online here. All right. Thank you for your time and your testimony. Thanks. Next is Leslie Wolfgang. Is Leslie here? I don't believe they are. Moving on, Stephanie Coakley. Welcome, Stephanie. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, Chairman Winfield, Chairman Staffstrom, Vice Chair Flexer, Vice Chair Quinn, ranking members, and other distinguished Judiciary Committee members. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. My name is Stephanie Coakley, and I have the honor of serving as Executive Director of Pequot Library Association, a nonprofit 501c3 located in the village of Southport in Fairfield. Thank you for the opportunity to provide in-person testimony in strong support of Bill 5507. Having a fair amount of experience, likely upwards of probably 20 to 30 hours of attending Connecticut Siting Council public hearings, representing Pequot Library as an intervener in a recent Connecticut Siting Council proceeding, I can attest to the seemingly unbalanced and perhaps outdated nature of the current procedures around the siting of much needed electric infrastructure in our state. In addition to the other points, you'll read and submitted testimony in support of the following revisions from some of my community peers, like adding local representation and expertise to the council, stricter certification requirements in environmental justice communities, removing all conflicts of interest, updating and expanding notification requirements, considering adverse economic impact, granting proposed project abutters automatic intervener status. I respectfully request that this bill's language also include libraries, museums, historical societies, historic sites, including cemeteries and the like to section three. This is language that goes along with settled areas, parks, recreational areas, scenic areas, et cetera, private or public schools, childcare centers and the like. I believe similar language about schools, daycare centers and playgrounds is also in section F of 16-50P. As you know, and I'll wrap up here shortly. Libraries, museums, and the like are destination sites. They serve many children and families. They're not necessarily the quiet, sleepy, sleepy libraries and museums of the past. And in conclusion, I do sincerely hope future interveners and parties across the state may benefit from the hard lessons learned as part of our recent experiences with the Connecticut Siting Council, and that we make significant progress in law reforms around the siting of high voltage electric transmission lines. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any comments or questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, again, thank you very much for being here. Uh, next up is Representative Leeper, who's not with us. Uh, how about Terry Ricks from the ACLU? Welcome and whenever you're ready. And you, and you know the drill. I know the drill, but I only want to be the only, only half a resident to do the drill. But my name is Ted. Welcome all distinguished judiciary members, Representative Quinn Hissel. My name is Terry Ricks. I'm a resident, as you all know, of Hartford, Connecticut, and mentor to young 
at risk youth in the Smart Justice League with the ACLU of Connecticut. Something that I've been doing since I was 14 years old. I am now 60. I am to testify in support of HB 5055, an act concerning self-defense, defense of a third person, and assisting in, in or affecting an arrest as affirmative defense. I want to thank the committee for raising this bill for a public hearing and share a story about what I experienced and why this bill is super important to me. On September 21st, 1991, I was in a club celebrating with friends before I was ready to be deployed for Desert Storm. It was a crowded club and I accidentally stepped on the man's foot. I apologized to him, but then he hit me several times. And at first I was shocked and didn't understand what was going on. And then defensively, I hit him back. Before anything, my best friend who was with me started hitting the guy as well. And in, in return, he fired a gun through his coat and shot me in the stomach several times, which I have permanent life damages from 18 stomach surgeries and all of the above. My friend Stephanie was arrested because she stayed by my side through the whole entire incident. And because she was from Brooklyn, New York, with the assumed shooter at the time, which we didn't know, because he went on a run, was from, they arrested her and assumed she was with him and on the crime. So they held her for three days while I was in a coma until my family said, no, she came with my sister to the club. So it took for me, and give me a second, because this is very emotional, and I, I know I'm on the clock, but I normally don't take your time, but this is serious. <laughs> At some point in life, we are going to be forced to pick a side. How can doing good by another human led to an arrest, jail, and criminal record? That doesn't make sense. If you ask us to help our fellow neighbors and fellow citizens, you ask us to see something and say something, then we shouldn't be punished for it. Anytime someone asks in a manner of assisting anyone in any bodily harm, which the police can't get them for, what would you expect for a human to do? Stand there? I thank y'all for hearing my testimony. Please, I urge this community to consider HB 5055. This is one of the hardest testimonies I had to testify in my life because this guy that I didn't press charge on is now out and looking for me. I've laid eyes on him, but my thing is Stephanie. Her life was ruined for being a best friend to me. That's not fair. And we can't ask if you see something, say something. If you see somebody being assaulted, do something. And then expect for that person to go to jail willingly with no help. And a lot of these people don't have bond money. So that process is a process that a judge should be able to make to push this process along. And I went completely off my testimony because it's oh, personal. That's that's this okay. is personal. We understand. This we is understand. personal. It's really, really personal. I know y'all like, this is a young lady that had went through hell in her life. Yes, I am. I've come from the mud. They say blood is thicker than water, but nothing thicker than mud. Right. And all these years I'm shedding and I'm telling these stories so we can make changes. So these things don't continue to happen to no human being. Because for that matter, what are we here for? It has to be a world of peace. Right. And to put some of these things in place. No, we, we thank you for sharing this with you. Are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? I'm sorry, Gus, I couldn't. I had to do it. Representative Porter? I have no questions. I just want to thank you, Terry. I know yes, the trauma. 
I know the triggers and I just really want to salute you in this moment for being vulnerable and for coming before us and sharing such intimate details around your life and what you've been subjected to. They haven't fallen on deaf ears. Thank you. And God bless. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Thank you, Representative Porter. And again, Ms. Ricks, thank you very much for sharing your story. Oh, sorry, Representative Khan. Okay, thank you. Um, Terry, um, thank you for sharing your story. Um, I know you said you went off script, so I just wanted to give you an opportunity if you did want to speak to the bill. If not, um, thank you so much I for did. being here. I did want to say, you know, a thing to the bill. If you could give me like 20 seconds just to stop shaking, I would really have like two lines of that I specifically would like. If a person is arrested in the act of coming to another person, then there should be an, an option for a judge to dismiss a person's charge rather than make a person go through months of court days, perhaps a division aid program, possibly a conviction. There needs to be an option for the judge to dismiss the charge. And when it comes to HB 5505, it is important to note that this is in regard to situations where people are acting with the intent to protect another person, not with the intent to harm another person. That is what I wanted to make this bill be a point of, not intentions to harm, to help, to save, to serve. I'm a six year army vet. We are, we are taught to serve. So any person that's from the military see somebody being hurt, we are going to jump in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions or comments from members of the committee? All right, seeing none. Again, thank you very much for sharing your story. I appreciate y'all for always listening. And I hope one day that I won't only be the only one from Hartford standing up. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Representative Leeper. Thank welcome. You. Thank you for uh, welcoming me this evening. And that's hard testimony to follow. Um, so good evening to the chairs and ranking members and all the good members of the Judiciary Committee. I'm State Representative Jennifer Leeper. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak before you today to testify in support of HB 5507, an act concerning the state agency and court proceedings related to electric transmission lines, and also propose some additional considerations I've had the occasion to learn quite a bit about electric transmission and the siting council process over the past seven months due to a transmission line proposal that wants to cut through the center of my district in Fairfield, as well as through Bridgeport, creating a new right of way down the post road in Fairfield and through Bridgeport's West End. And taking 19 and a quarter acres of privately owned and municipally owned land along the way. What I've learned is that transmission is a relatively black box for our regulators and also for our impacted communities. While the community I represent is not an environmental justice community, I have experienced firsthand how difficult it has been to be informed about the project, to get clear answers about the impacts of the project, and to have a seat at the table to represent those interests. This is a reality despite the fact that by almost all metrics, my community is both better resourced and able to mobilize than most communities to represent our own interests. For communities that do not have these benefits, they have been, in my opinion, steamrolled by the existing process. It makes very good sense to add transmission projects to section 22A-20A so that EJCs can be afforded all of the considerations provided to them under that statute for transmission projects as well. I very much support this bill's proposal to enhance the maximum amount available to municipalities in the municipal participation account. I would ask that we also ensure that enhanced limit is available to each impacted municipality. In the interest of time, I will state that I am in very strong support of all the amendments in sections three, four, and five, and I would love to request a few additional considerations for the committee. First, in EJCs, all alternatives should be required to be ruled out before land can be taken via permanent easements or eminent domain. Two, all impacted municipalities should receive automatic intervener status on the docket for any transmission projects. Three, projects that are taking new land 
should not be allowed to be classified as rebuilds since this allows our utilities to sidestep FERC, but rather they should be classified as upgrades. And four, we should have the capacity to add fines and financial penalties for utilities misclassifying, misrepresenting, misleading, or omitting components of a project, such as a permanent easement, land taking, height, scope, location of the infrastructure to be cited. Any such penalties should not be recovered from ratepayers. And thank you very much for your consideration of this testimony. Thank you, Representative Leeper. Any comments or questions for Representative Leeper? Seeing none, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, next up is Simar Kuar, who's testifying remotely. You wanna, okay, go right ahead. You have your three minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Simmer, and I am a Justice Advisor at the Connecticut Justice Alliance, and I'm writing to urge, urge your support for HB 5508, an act concerning recommendations of the Juvenile Justice Policy and Oversight Committee. Our current youth and adult legal systems are broken. HB 5508 would take small steps to begin to make the period of re-entry less daunting and resources more accessible. In turn, the recidivism rate for young people would be lower. In the 2019 cohort of young people released from the custody of the Department of Corrections, ages 15 to 17, a shocking 72% of them returned to prison in three years. This statistic shows that incarceration does not address the root causes of crime and that when young people are returned to their communities, they do not have the resources needed to succeed. Further, a Seattle study found that incar those incarcerated in adolescence were almost four times as likely to reoffend in adulthood when compared to youth who experience effective alternatives to incarceration. The racial disparities in Connecticut's youth and adult legal system are also vast. 84% of youth in detention centers operated by the judicial branch in 2019 were of color. There's also a basis in gender as well. I would be remiss to not acknowledge the plights of many young girls and gender non-conforming youth in the system who are often isolated with little resources. This is especially true in a state like Connecticut, which has abandoned its many incarceration alternatives in recent years and left young women who need different levels of care with a few and poorer options. The many problems in our current system have a myriad of stems. One of the biggest is the system inability to rehabilitate and lack of firsthand knowledge of what young women are experiencing. HB 5508 will take steps to remedy the root causes that bring young women into the legal system by creating mentors for youth, job readiness programs, and a gender responsiveness work group in the JJPOC. These measures have been proven to work in several other states. The Credible Messenger program in New York City made participants 57% less likely to commit a crime. A similar program in Kings County, Washington led to so much safety that youth detention was cut by 49%. We have seen the great and vast impacts of reforms like the ones proposed in this bill across the country. Isn't it time that Connecticut joined these other states in our battle against injustice and crime? Our system is violent and incredibly costly for our state. However, we must remember who it is most costly for. Ultimately, poor people of color experience the highest rates of victimization from crime and the most severe treatment from the legal system. We must ask ourselves, what do we value? Punishment and guilt or safety and justice for all? This bill is a step towards the latter. Thank you, and I urge for the passage of HB 55. Hey, thank you very much for your testimony. Any comments or questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, uh, next up we have Luis Vega. Hello. Okay, you can go right ahead, sir. All right. Uh, thank you very much to the members of the Judiciary Committee today and allowing me to speak. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on a couple different topics and um I wanted to say I wanted to testify in support and hopefully garnish your support in uh, SB 444. Uh, more importantly, this is raising uh, this is raising a bill. Uh, I apologize. I'll introduce myself. My name is Luis Vega. I'm the CEO of Nautilus Botanicals um, as, and a social equity owner 
in the cannabis space. Um, one of the only justice impacted individuals in the space and who has been fighting towards rectifying uh, some of the, the harms caused on the world war on drugs to myself and my family. Um, as a Section 149 cultivation owner and resident of Bridgeport, I wanted to support SB 444 and it, that it allows the individuals uh, an opportunity to actually not fall through the cracks, have things removed from their records so that you can actually move forward in a professional setting and able to start and create work and have the ability to find jobs without this holding you back. I understand that there's some provisions that allow for a petition, but you have to meet certain standards and there's a gap in between the automatic expungement and the and the uh, the petitions that I myself fall within for some of my um, my guilty and uh, my guilty uh, convictions. I was able to get two removed in the automatic expungement and then I don't have the option because they weren't long enough sentences to go through the petition process. So it leaves me in this little limbo and it would also help other individuals that need sentence modifications. I know that it's been brought up a couple of times that there's usually outlying cases that come with it, but there's, there's a, there's a section that really opens up a huge gap that people are falling through currently. And this bill would actually close that gap and allow the state to push forward and really help those individuals. Um, I also wanted to support SB, uh, I would also like to support SB 631, um, 361, NDAs in the workplace for protected classes. Uh, a lot of us enter into these corporate dealings without ever knowing what we're signing as we're signing them to take a job. And it usually sets up the individual for failure. Um, and it's really tough, you know. And I wanted to also suggest uh, support, uh, not to support 445. Um, this will help, this will continue to recriminalize individuals. And as we move forward in a just and fair space for the cannabis uh, user or medical patient in this state, we can't continue to re, um, re-harm those individuals. I'm not looking to take up a bunch of your time, guys, and I really appreciate the, the time and day. It's been a long day, and you've heard a lot of testimony, and I appreciate you guys taking the time to hear me. Um, readily available at any time. So please feel free to reach out as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions from members of the committee, Representative Porter? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Vega, for your testimony. No questions. Just wanted to say thank you. I appreciate your input and great to virtually see you today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And seeing no other questions, thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Vega. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Uh, Cecilia Plaza. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Okay, great. Good afternoon, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Cecilia Plaza. I'm an attorney and currently a doctoral candidate. I study sex and gender disparities in healthcare and biomedicine, and I'm here today to make a statement in support of Senate Bill 425. I've submitted a more detailed written statement, but for this hearing, I'd like to highlight three important points. First, the context of healthcare service provision in this state and in this country is one with a lot of baggage. There's a lot, a, a long history of discrimination in medicine, and it still shapes patients' lives and their health outcomes today. Patients carry that history around with them in their health records, and it leaves certain patients, women, gender minorities, racial minorities, the poor, the elderly, more vulnerable to missed, wrong, and delayed diagnoses, which also means delayed treatment and worse health outcomes. The discrimination and the material impact of discrimination is well documented. For instance, in the average diagnostic delays for women across virtually every disease category, in the withholding of pain medication from women and especially racial minority women, and in mortality rates. Second, the costs of discrimination are serious, not just for the patients who experience discrimination, but for everyone. Discrimination in healthcare leaves the entire population sicker and in more pain. It contributes to more missed days of work, worsening chronic disability, and increased burdens on an already overtaxed healthcare system. Third, current legal protections are not enough. They don't protect patients who can't access federal protections like social security disability insurance without a proper diagnosis. 
Federal discrimination protections have been rendered essentially toothless by narrow interpretations of gender discrimination as HHS's initial interpretations of sex and gender discrimination under the Affordable Care Act have been rolled back in response to litigation. State medical malpractice law disadvantages older patients, especially older women, and is largely ineffective in addressing pervasive biases that treat some patients, including women and gender and racial minorities, as unreliable reporters of their own pain and symptoms. In short, those patients who most need the opportunity for legal redress and protection have the least access to it. State legislation is a necessary step towards addressing biased healthcare service provision. It's necessary to adequately protect all patients, their access to quality healthcare, their dignity, and their health and well-being. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, any comments or questions from members of the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, next up, Sarah Steinfeld. Sarah Steinfeld. Right here. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Looking for you on here. <laughs> okay, go right ahead. Thank you. Members of the committee, my name is Sarah Steinfeld, and I'm a member of the Connecticut Trial Lawyers Association and an attorney at Koskoff, Koskoff and Beter. I'm here to testify in support of Senate Bill 425, an important bill to prohibit healthcare discrimination and provide all victims a path to justice. I refer the committee to my own written testimony as well as to the written testimony submitted by the Connecticut Trial Lawyers Association. Uh, I did wanna mention at the outset that the Connecticut Hospital Association has offered some suggested language to this bill that I, that I think would be fine. Healthcare discrimination is real, it is wrong, and it causes tangible harm. In many cases, the most significant harms to healthcare discrimination victims are emotional or psychological, harms that have been well documented in various studies that I cited in my written testimony. The US Congress recognized these harms and the importance of redressing them when it enshrined a provision barring healthcare discrimination in section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, the ACA. However, in 2022, the U.S. Supreme Court hobbled the power of that provision in the case Cummings versus Premier Rehab Kelly. Cummings ruled that plaintiffs bringing health care discrimination claims under the ACA could not recover damages for emotional distress. This bill, however, would restore the status quo of the ACA's health care discrimination provision. It would provide a remedy under Connecticut law for health care discrimination, which include damages for emotional distress. This means that victims of healthcare discrimination will have access to legal remedies in Connecticut courts and under Connecticut law. I echo the written statement of the Connecticut Hospital Association that it, quote, wholeheartedly supports protecting people from discrimination when receiving healthcare services. To fully accomplish this goal and restore the anti-discrimination remedies originally created under the ACA, I would request two changes to the bill. First, the bill should target not merely refusal of health care, but also discrimination in the provision of health care. I refer the committee to my written testimony, which includes specific proposed language to that end. Second, a longer period of time should be granted to, indi to individuals filing a complaint under this bill. The 300-day time limit currently in Connecticut statute for filing other types of discrimination claims is not sufficient in a health care context. Medical patients are often at a knowledge and expertise disadvantage compared to their healthcare providers. And as a result, patients may not learn about the discrimination that they were subject to until much later than uh, would, would apply in a non-medical context. So once again, I refer the committee to my written testimony to address that. I urge your support for this bill uh, to incorporate the amendments that I suggested above and to restore anti-discrimination remedies to Connecticut patients that were formerly available under the ACA before the Cummings decision. This is critical to ensuring fair and equal medical treatment for everybody. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you. Comments or questions from members of the committee? I don't have to call on him if you don't want me to. You certainly can. Okay. Then go ahead, Representative Blumenthal. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I appreciate your indulgence. Uh, Attorney Steinfeld, it's good to see you. Good to see uh, you as well. Thank you for your testimony on this bill. Uh, unfortunately, this is not the only issue uh, we're having to correct uh, with regard to a, what I view, erroneous court decision around a provision of the Affordable Care Act. But it, this certainly is a, uh, a worthwhile one, and I appreciate your testimony. I did have one question. 
um, which is uh, what is the statute of limitations that applies to a healthcare discrimination claim uh, under section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act and how might that be relevant to this bill? Sure, um, Representative Blumenthal. Um, the Second Circuit ruled in the Vegas Ruiz versus Northwell Health decision, that's 992 F3rd 61, that there's a four-year catch-all federal statute of limitations that applies to these 1557 claims under the ACA. And the reason that's relevant is when we're thinking about the type of statute of limitations that could uh, supplant uh, uh, that bill uh, or, or that law in Connecticut law, uh, that's a relevant consideration. Um, I proposed a three-year statute of limitations, which is even more conservative than that would apply that would apply under federal law. Um, but that gives you a sense of the importance of extending that statute of limitations in this context. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony and for those proposed amendments. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Blumenthal. Uh, if there's no further questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up online is Thomas Burr. Yes, good afternoon, Representative Quinn and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Thomas Burr, and I'm the uh, Public Policy Manager for the Connecticut Chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, otherwise known as NAMI Connecticut. I am submitting testimony today in regards to HB 5509, an act concerning the enticement of a minor to commit a crime, searches of a motor vehicle, and the Psychiatric Security Review Board and Victims' Compensation. Um, you have my written testimony, so I just want to uh, address uh, sections three dash seven, three through seven of this bill uh, and just state, you know, for the record here that as the country's largest grassroots mental health organization, we fight constantly for policies to get people help and not handcuffs. Therefore, we believe in the following points, that the safety and well-being of equities is just as important as protecting public safety. The legislature passed and the governor signed Public Act 22-45, which made both the protection of society and the safety and well-being of equities the primary concerns of the PSRB. We should not be going backward on this issue. Also, we believe that people should have the not have their ability to ask for temporary leave or conditional release reduced by half, 12 months instead of the current six months. Again, we should not be going backwards on this. We also believe it is fundamentally unfair that a higher burden of proof is being placed on the person seeking more liberty instead of the state. With all its resources, the state should prove that the ongoing restriction is necessary. And lastly, we believe that the committee failed to amend the language to include ending recommitment when someone reaches their maximum term under the board. This is strictly an issue of fairness, in our opinion. In closing, I, would have mentioned, I want to mention that since the PSRB work group is still meeting and is yet to issue the final report, the legislature and specifically this committee should hold off on making any changes to the PSRB statutes this year. Therefore, in summary, NAMI Connecticut opposes House Bill 5509. Thank you for your time and your consideration. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, comments or questions from members of the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you very much. And we'll move on to David Naftali. Um, how about Marcella Karowski? Hi there. I'm here. David Naftali is here. Okay. Can you hear me? We'll do David first, then we'll go to Marcella. All right, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, David. Hello, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity letting me speak before this committee. My name is David Naftali, and I'm a senior uh, construction manager in Brooklyn. And I'm speaking in the support of this bill, which is 5507, which I got involved because I'm strongly opposing docket 516. I came to the U.S. in 1997, and I live in New York since then, which is a very expensive state to own a home. In the past three years, I bought three lots in Bridgeport, Connecticut, especially in the enterprise zone, so I can get the tax benefits for the new construction buildings. One of the lots that I bought is to build my own home, and the other two lots 
my retirement plan is to build a low income apartment building in a low income area that there are special programs from the government to get special loans from money pay for low income apartment benefits. About two months ago, I heard from a friend that the UI utility company is planning to take over my lots that I'm planning to build on commercial spaces and between 25 to 40 apartment units. I haven't received any notices through the mail or phone calls from any representatives of UI, and I'm wondering why. I've been working on these projects for the past three years, and I've been planning this for the past six years. I have plans that are filed with the zoning department and the building department of the city of Bridgeport. I paid my architect, my structural engineers, civil engineer, surveyors, and much more. Just so now a company like UI can come and grab any property they want. Just so they don't have to do the right thing and spend the money to bury the wires on the side of the street because it's just cheaper for them to take over people's property. My plans are long-term. The city of Bridgeford has a lot of potential, especially in the enterprise zone, which is an opportunity zone. All this will be irrelevant the moment UI will install high power electrical wires across the enterprise zone. People don't know the potential that the city of Bridgeport has. Downtown Bridgeport is one hour away from New York City. It's faster to get to New York City from Bridgeport than from Long Island, Nassau County to New York City. My lots are five minutes away walking distance from the train station the, to New York City, from the bus station and the ferry to Long Island. Downtown is few minutes. Sir, if you could just uh, quickly summarize your time has elapsed. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to say that uh, I have plans uh, uh, to build an eight-story building on my lots, and I'm strongly opposing uh, the docket 516, and I'm supporting the will of uh, 5507. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, comments or questions from members of the committee? Uh, seeing none, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, next up, Marcella Karowski, and thank you for your patience. Can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Right. Members of the committee, I'm Marcella Karowski. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I support raised bill uh, 5509 because a 21-year-old is to be held accountable for enticing a minor. And measures must be taken to keep our roads sober and safe. And I agree that victims of motor vehicle theft shall be compensated. I also support SB 445 because job skills training gives one purpose and independence. When my brother was serving time, he worked in the prison kitchen. The kitchen manager wrote a letter about him to the judge that was reviewing my brother's case. The judge said that because of the letter, he was getting one more chance. And so he did work and pay restitution. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no questions or comments from members of the committee. Uh, again, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up is Jason Ortiz. Hello, how's my audio? Can you hear me? Uh, Go ahead um, with your testimony. All right. Thank you so much. My name is Jason Ortiz. I serve as Could the you pull a little closer to the microphone? Mm -hmm. We're having difficulty hearing you. Good time. All right. Is this any better? A little better. Go ahead. All right. My name is Jason Ortiz. I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives for The Last Prisoner Project. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that seeks to get folks out of prison for cannabis crimes. I'm a resident of New London, Connecticut. And today we're here in support of SB 444. It's a bill to actually change some of our reentry and resentencing processes in the state of Connecticut to be able to make sure that all the folks that are currently incarcerated for the crimes that are now no longer illegal 
for uh, the legal cannabis industry to actually be able to get freedom for all of their families. And so SB 444 is based on the best practices from other states that have adopted to address sentences handed down during cannabis prohibition, of which Connecticut is no longer doing. Our work with other states has demonstrated that the most effective and equitable resentencing processes are state initiated. Under the current resentencing process, individuals would need to file a petition to be considered for relief. <clears throat> Research has proven, and our work with our constituents that are currently incarcerated has shown that most people never file a petition or are denied proper consideration because petitions are confusing legal documents that require an attorney's help and a significant amount of time and resources. Uh, we actually did search through the, with the Department of Corrections on seeing how many folks would be impacted by these laws. And there are currently 476 individuals who are currently serving terms of incarceration. So this is separate from the jurisdiction of the state's attorneys, but there are 476 individuals who are currently incarcerated for crimes that now should no longer be having them behind bars. And so SB 444 creates a real process for relief to actually reunite them with their families and make sure that all of the folks that have been impacted by cannabis prohibition are made whole as we start to develop this industry. As you can see right now, that's nearly 500 folks that are sitting in prison right now as we see billboards and companies being formed and all these types of programs. And we really want to make sure that we can reunite them with their families. SB 444 is very necessary. There were some comments earlier that said that this is already handled. These 476 families can assure you that this problem is not handled yet. And that is why we encourage the Judiciary Committee and all the members of the Connecticut legislature to support this bill and make sure that we can finally end the harm that has been done by the war on drugs on our communities and reunite these folks with their families. So thank you for your consideration and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any comments or questions from members of the committee? Representative Porter. Thank you. Um, just a real quick question. I'm not sure if you can answer this, but I'm hoping you can. First of all, thank you for your testimony. Um, and I wanted to know if you could speak to what other states are doing on this issue, Mr. Ortiz. Yeah, and a lot of other states have advanced on this. California probably has the most robust example of being able to resentence folks after cannabis prohibition. But even states like Montana and Missouri have had significant impacts on actually releasing folks from prison. I just want to remind everybody that when we actually legalized cannabis, we didn't release anyone from prison at all. And so we only did it moving forward. There was last year, we had a similar bill, HB 6787, where the state's attorney folks did dismiss 1,500 cases that were pending, but that left 1,500 that were also pending after that release. And so two years later, there were still 1,500 cases pending. Now we have 500 folks that are still very much incarcerated. We actually saw some movement recently out of Massachusetts where the governor used their pardon authority to let folks out. And we, of course, encourage the governor to also use his power to let folks out through the executive branch. But this particular bill makes it possible for all of the folks that are currently incarcerated here in Connecticut to do that. But I would say the three states that you should look at is Missouri, uh, Montana, and California. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, and I will have a sidebar conversation with you for the sake of expediency. But thank you again for being with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Porter. Uh, seeing no further questions, thank you very much for being with us, uh, Mr. Ortiz. Uh, next up is Nathan Jones. How about Peter Wolfgang? Um, Manuel Sandoval? Hello, Senator Win uh, Kissel and Representative Quinn Porter and the rest of uh, the Judiciary Committee. My name is Manuel Sandoval. I'm from New Britain, a father, grandfather, mentor, and a licensed clinical social worker. I'm here as a leader with the ACLU. I'm testifying in support of SB 5508, an act implementing the recommendation of juvenile justice policies and oversight committee. Over the past 11 years, I've had the privilege of working with young people between the ages of 11 and 24. I've been able to protect, protect them, guide them, encourage them, and to, to dream more, do more, and be more than they ever planned thereby creating success rate that those who oppose the bill hate to hear. These youth have become nurses, machine operators, college graduates, community researchers, business owners, and are welcome members of their community, with most of them living a successful life. Three of which I'm happy to say are also social workers following in my footsteps. Currently, I'm a program director at the Youth Advocate Program, a diversionary program that would benefit from this program. However, that's not why I'm here. All too often, I've witnessed young people traumatized by the police officers, SRO, and their own community. 
Currently, uh, credible messengers have lived experience. We are able to intercede during difficult times. We provide assistance with a different perspective. Our presence, not <clears throat> our presence, although sometimes met with disdain by those in official capacity, bring a sense of common comfort to the young person when they know someone has their best interest in hand, when someone is listening to their cries and willing to help. I support a reinvestment of funds actually designed to help young people thrive, like alternatives, alternatives to suspension, expulsion, decreasing class sizes, and providing effective and sufficient mental health resources. House Bill 5508 is an important step towards those goals. First, it requires schools to direct <clears throat> with no schools with disappropriately high suspension and expulsion rates to make improvements to decrease the punishment until the rates are no longer disproportionately high. Second, it uh, puts a plan in motion to cap classroom size, will result, which will result in better educational outcomes. Third, it provides each board of education additional resources related to mental health and suicide. As a vested adult from these impacted communities, I believe 5508 is only the uh, start. We must end the victimization of youth and systemic and institutionalized trauma created by the very systems meant to nurture and protect them. This, lecture, this legislature must take steps to address the root problems of violence through methods that do not increase policing for youth, but rather their safety and security by people who support them and care for them. I urge you this committee to do the same. Um, I also oppose 5506 and SB 445. And if you mind, um, Representative Fishbein asked earlier, um, what can we do to, to, um, to stop truancy? Uh, first of all, we need to um, think about our education, right? Um, the, the education we, we have uh, if, right if you now. Could just quickly wrap up your thought. I, I, okay, so basically the system that we have in play right now with school system is no good. I, you took away the, the, the things that we have. Back in, in your day and uh, my day, we had um, uh, uh, home ec, we had woodworking, metal, all that stuff. All that's not, in, we don't have that in the schools anymore. And you want a kid to 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 be there and and sit down and pay attention when you don't stimulate them at all. Um, we need to bring stuff like that back into the picture because we we already know they they need to be stimulated. Um, so if you want to change the way that the, the kids from from wanting to go to school, make it interesting for them. You know, you had a great time when you were in school. I, I'm sure I had a great time. Um, I mean, that not as great as you probably right, but still. The the fact of the matter is that you don't know what school it. I went to. You're right. I don't right. <laughs> But I know that the school I went to didn't didn't um, support me as much. But I know that it had some right. things that it, that it did. No, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, any comments or questions from members of the committee? All right, all right. Thank seeing you. none. Again, thank you very much. Uh, next up, uh, Timothy Stewart. Thank you, distinguished members of the Judicial Committee. Uh, thank you for hearing my testimony today. My name is Tim Stewart. I'm a resident of Fairfield. Communities are being abused across Connecticut today by the Connecticut Siding Council statutes and our regulatory structure. And while the legislation before us implements many crucial reforms, which I support, it does not address what I believe to be the biggest failure and most blatant shortcoming. And this is the Siding Council's authority to establish public need or to determine public interest for transmission projects brought before it. ISO New England determines the long-term transmission requirements for New England and Connecticut, and arguably Pura should be brought back into the equation in collaboration with ISO New England and with local import, input to determine the most cost-effective transmission corridors and projects that address the future public need while protecting local interests. Under the siting, current Siding Council framework, incumbent utilities are in the driver's seat determining investment projects that extend their existing asset footprints. This too often results in huge, permanent, and unnecessary damage and costs imposed upon local communities and private property owners across the state. Has the Siding Council aggressively evaluated alternative transmission corridor routes across the state that could minimize community impacts at a lower cost? Do they have the resources? Do they have the competence to do so? Power transmission markets are unregulated, and in the decades ahead, Connecticut will need new transmission infrastructure built, lots of it. 
From a public policy perspective, are we managing this need in the most effective way? Do we allow new investment to be driven by incumbent utility operators whose motive is to expand their unregulated asset base, where they can charge unregulated fees to transmit power and thus increase profits at the public's expense? And do we allow this to continue be, to be done at the expense of degrading and abusing our local communities with permanent and unsightly industrial asset pollution? Or do we empower our higher level, most competent regulatory agencies to cite such infrastructure in the most cost-effective and optimal corridors prioritizing the least impact on communities? And it then issue RFPs to asset developers to implement the projects. The CSC statute should then pick up the ball from there. Imagine, if you may, that the construction of the United States interstate highway system was designed, built, and controlled by local paving companies. It's an absurd proposition. Why then would our legislators allow such a process to exist for our future trans power transmission grid, leaving this critical decision process to the incumbent utility asset owners with a Connecticut Siding Council merely acquiescing in affirmation and managing very poorly local complaints is not the answer. I ask you to act now to protect Connecticut communities by fixing this flawed regulatory system. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, comments or questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Yep, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Nancy Allisberg. Good afternoon, co-chairs uh, Winfield and Sastrom, Vice Chairs Flexer and Quinn, and Ranking Members Kissel and F Fishbein. My name is Nancy Allisberg, and I'm a resident of West Hartford. I am also the retired legal director at Disability Rights Connecticut, but I am testifying on my own behalf. I am testifying today in strong opposition to sections three through seven of raised House Bill number 5509. I was a member of the Whiting Task Force. The task force was created in response to the horrific abuse of a resident at Whiting Forensic Hospital. In the course of our investigation, we discovered a great many deficiencies at Whiting, such that we recommended that the facility be closed. In response to our report, the legislature passed and the governor signed Public Act 2245, a bill that would remedy many, but not all of the deficiencies that we identified. Sections three through seven of 5509 would undo all of the good recommendations of that task force and all of the positive changes of the public act. It does nothing more than cater to all the irrational fears people have of people with psychiatric diagnoses, and there is no evidence to support those fears. And you heard that earlier today. It effectively overrules 2245. Additionally, the bill before you today is premature because the PSRB work group is continuing to meet but has not issued its report. This bill is clearly a rush to judgment. Most significantly, this bill would remove the goal passed by the legislature and signed by the government that both the protection of society and the safety and well being of the equities would be the primary concerns of the PSRB. It is hard to comprehend why the drafters of this bill would want to eliminate any concern for the equities. Recovery is the goal of all mental health programs. Society is not protected when recovery is ignored. All this bill does is make clear that the drafters would rather simply lock the equities up and throw away the key. The bill also reduces the ability to ask for people to ask for a temporary or conditional leave by enabling them only to seek a leave once a year instead of every six months. It adds a requirement that a bill be held that a hearing be held by the PSRB on all applications for temporary leave. And it's important to note in terms of recovery that it's the people at Demas who know when people are ready for leave, not people at the PSRB. It institutes a higher burden of proof on the person seeking more liberty than imposing a burden on the state to prove that additional restrictions are necessary. And it does not end recommitment when someone reaches their maximum term. And as attorney Radler said earlier today, 
people can end up at Whiting for the rest of their lives. I hope the Judiciary Committee will reflect on the good work that was done by the Whiting Task Force and not throw it all away in the interests of those who live in fear. I therefore just, urge this committee uh, to Pam, eliminate- you just finish your last Yes, I, this is my last sentence. <laughs> I urge this committee to eliminate sections three through seven of this bill as being both premature and against the interests of the recommendations of the Whiting Task Force. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, again, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next up, we have Kathy Flaherty. Good afternoon, Representative Quinn and all the members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Kathy Flaherty. I'm the Executive Director of Connecticut Legal Rights Project, and we represent people who are eligible for DEMAS services, which includes people who are equities under the jurisdiction of the board. We don't represent them in front of the board. That's what the public defenders or private defense counsel do, but we protect their rights while they're in the hospital. I'm here to offer testimony on three bills today, one of which I support, two of which I don't. Uh, support Senate Bill 425 because it does provide an avenue to address discrimination in health care with remedies under state law that are not currently available under federal law. I'm against uh, House Bill 5415 about the standing criminal protective order. Um, and I would really point you to the testimony from the public defenders where they point out that if those standing criminal protective orders were put in place, it could potentially prevent family members from visiting their person, the equity who's in the hospital, if they're, you know, they want to, if there was a standing criminal protective order. Um, there are lots of ways the PSRB controls somebody beha somebody's behavior. If they were making harassing phone calls or sending letters, their ability to make any phone calls or send any mail could be restricted. Their freedom would be uh, taken away and they'd be returned to the hospital if they were out on temporary leave. So I just think 5415 isn't necessary. And the last bill I wanna testify against is sections three through seven of 5509. You've heard people testify about this all day. It certainly is premature. And I would just remind the members of this committee that it was seven years ago this month that the abuse incident at Whiting came to light, which resulted in um, the arrest of 10 employees of Demas, the termination of nearly 40, a multi-million dollar judgment against the state, um, and some significant reforms to Whiting. Whiting has improved as a hospital, but the proposals in this bill would roll back those reforms. And especially considering that the PSRB work group is still meeting and has yet to issue a report with recommendations, this bill is super premature. And I'd encourage you to remove, strip those four sec five sections from the bill if you were to advance it. Okay. Thank you, any uh, comments or questions? Uh, Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Flannery. Um, I guess the first question I have is how do we get here? I mean, we got here, um, Nancy just testified right before me. She, you know, the response of the legislature to the incident of abuse coming out was to appoint a task force. It took a really long time to get that task force appointed, but it finally did start meeting um, and they met with all relevant stakeholders. And they issued a report, and that report actually recommended abolition of the Psychiatric Security Review Board and closure of the hospital as it exists now. Um, there still is a plan to build a new whiting that is several years off in the future. Um, but you know there have been changes to the PSRB, including using treating both the safety and well-being of equities and the protection of society both as primary concerns. Demoting concern for the equities to a secondary concern is just not appropriate. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and why is the proposal legal standard clear and convincing wrong? And why do you see that as not being appropriate? It's not appropriate because it's putting the burden on the person who's seeking freedom instead of putting the burden on the government that wants to restrict somebody's liberty. And if the if the government wants to restrict somebody's liberty, I think it's appropriate to put a clear and convincing standard of burden of proof on them. But putting that that high level of burden of proof on the person 
who's seeking a less restrictive placement simply isn't appropriate. Thank you for that. And the last thing that I will ask you is, is there anything else that occurs to you that you think need to, needs to be on the record today? I just want to thank everybody from this committee, including the staff who really made it possible and the staff at Whiting who made it possible for people mm -hmm. who are currently residents at Whiting to testify. Um, that has been something that has happened the last several times there's been a bill before this legislature concerning the PSRB and a lot of people's effort went into that to make sure it could happen. And I'm very, very appreciative. Thank you. I am also appreciative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Porter. You know, on 5415, and I'm sure it hasn't been tested yet because it isn't an issue, but I, I get what you're saying about the unintended consequence of uh, the family not being able to contact. But in a normal criminal protective order circumstance, a victim could move for modification to at least remove parts of it. Um, but again, I, I, I'm, I know that hasn't been tested, but I do throw that out. And, and I, I hear you on that. And that is a possibility. I would just point you to the fact that, um, and this is in my written testimony and I just wanted to get it that in 2022, 1,613 criminal protective orders were put in place, um, after criminal cases in the judicial branch. But in 2022, that same year, only five people were newly committed to the Psychiatric Security Review Board. And it's not even clear that they committed index offenses that would match up with the requirements of the statute. So we're not talking about a whole lot of people here anyway. I think the hardest thing and I, um, is that Officer Kiddick wasn't given information, should have and certainly should have been informed of the status of the order. And I think if if she had been given a better understanding of just how many restrictions the PSRB can put on somebody, she hopefully would feel safer. Um, and that's just what I would have to add about that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from members of the committee? Representative Fishbein. Hi, Kathy. Thank Hi. you for coming here today. You know, I just want to say I, I agree with you. Uh, early on today, I was saying to someone, you know, um, this remote thing before the pandemic, uh, you wouldn't see all those people from Whiting being able to participate in the process, um, you know, coming to their legislature to talk about something that would um, impact them positive or negatively. So certainly I'm, I, you know, today I'm very happy with that ability for those people to actually speak up uh, for themselves. But thank you for once again, for coming here today. And I uh, just want to say, I, I share that. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative Fishbein. Uh, any other comments or questions? Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Uh, next up, William Lowe. William Lowe. All right, we'll move on to uh, Elliot I. Elliot I. And we'll move on to Julie Ro Roginski. Julie Roginski. Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, Chief Jacobson. Chief Jacobson. And we'll move on to uh, Luis Luna. Thank you, um, Representative uh, Wynn, um, Wynn uh, Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, and esteemed members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Luis Luna, and I serve as the Coalition Manager for Husky for Immigrants. I'm here to express my strong support for SB 425, an act prohibiting discrimination by healthcare providers in the provision of health care services in the state. So the Affordable Care Act uh, includes Section 1, 557, which prohibits discrimination on various grounds such as race, color, national origin, age, disability, or sex in covered health programs. While individuals can file administrative complaints if they feel their rights have been violated under this provision, they are not entitled to all the forms of relief available in a normal civil rights action case in state court. Uh, SB uh, 425 seeks to remedy this gap by incorporating the protections embodied in federal law into Connecticut's anti-discrimination laws, thus allowing individuals to bring cases of discrimination in healthcare provision in the state to the state. 
the this legislation is crucial for ensuring equitable access to healthcare for all residents of Connecticut, particularly vulnerable communities such as immigrants who may face language barriers and discriminatory practices. Immigrants, especially those who do not speak English fluently, often encounter significant obstacles in accessing healthcare services. Language barriers can lead to misunderstanding, misunderstandings, misdiagnoses, and inadequate care, exacerbating existing healthcare disparities within these communities. By enacting uh, SB 425, Connecticut would take a significant step towards safeguarding the rights of all individuals to uh, receive fair and non-discriminatory healthcare services. It would provide a legal recourse for individuals who have been unfairly treated based on their national origin or other protected characteristics, ensuring that no one is denied care or treated unfairly due to prejudice or bias. Furthermore, extending anti-discrimination protections to healthcare services aligns with Connecticut's commitment to upholding the rights and dignity of all its residents, such as individuals, can, such uh, just as individuals can currently bring claims for discrimination in housing, employment, and public services to the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities, they should also have avenues to address discrimination in healthcare provisions. So Connecticut can reaffirm its dedication to equity and justice, ensuring that every resident, regardless of their background, receives the care and respect they deserve. Thank you for considering my testimony and for your commitment uh, to advancing the well-being of all Connecticut residents. Okay, thank you. Any comments or questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next up, we have Evelyn Maserly. Evelyn Maserly. Then we'll move on to Christina Capitan. Hi. Good afternoon. Right uh, respect. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Committee Chair Stastrom, respect of the Judiciary Committee. Thank you for allowing me time to speak today in support of Senate Bill 444 and in opposition of Senate Bill 45 and Bill 555. Uh, oh nine. My name is Christina Capitan, founder of the Connecticut Grassroots Advocacy Organization, CT Cannon Warriors. First and foremost, I'd like to express my strong support, both personally and on behalf of our organization, for the passage of Senate Bill 444. I'm grateful that this conversation is continuing from last session, and I hope that in this session we can find some result for people who, uh, people in their families who have been and still being impacted by um, nonviolent cannabis cases in our state. I'm extremely disappointed, unfortunately, that despite legalizing cannabis in 2021 and creating and celebrating a multi-million dollar cannabis industry, our state is mostly failing to show any sense of urgency to do everything that it can to provide retroactive relief to those still sitting in prison or serving time, uh, terms of supervision under probation or parole for past cannabis offenses. Now, I've several times today throughout the hearing that um, Connecticut doesn't have a problem with individuals being incarcerated under the supervision of um, probation or parole for, for cannabis related offenses. But as an active and well-known member of the community, um, as a community advocate and an ally to consumers and patients across the state, I still receive a number of calls and messages um, and even some letters in from people who are seeking relief, clarity, and guidance, not only in regard to past cannabis convictions, but there's also people that are currently being charged with sale or intent to sell cannabis for having too much cannabis. Um, there's people who are facing probation and parole violations for using cannabis or even incarcerated for doing so. Um, so I assure you that there are still problems. Um, there's still people being raided and arrested with the wrong charges um, and a lot of those people tend to be patients who just choose not to go into the medical program um, because it's not a great program to navigate and it's hard to afford and there's not the right products available. Um, so these people are deemed as using cannabis uh, as a recreational adult when in fact they're actually medical patients that are in desperate need of what they, they need to feel better and can't get that through our medical program or can't navigate that system effectively. Um, so that's really sad. So I'm sorry to take that time. Um, so I 
um, the Connecticut legislature to pass SB 444 without delay once again um, to ensure that anyone still suffering the most severe consequences of nonviolent cannabis offenses can be provided some type of pathway to freedom um, and, and peace. Um, the Cannon Warriors are also in opposition of SB 445 as well as 5509, especially Section 2, I believe it is. Um, I believe that the passage of these bills could create unintended consequences of states trying to work hard to remedy the wrongs of things like racial profiling and some police accountability and that. Um, and it would needlessly increase negative interactions between public and uh, the public and police. It's more strain on the relationship between law enforcement officials and communities that they intend to serve. Um, passing these bills as written, you know, leaves a lot up to the discretion of a police officer. If you official, could just um, finish and, your, your last uh, industry. thought. <laughs> so in closing, um, in closing, please do everything that you can to Connecticut on the right side of history when we're ending cannabis prohibition before it's too late. Pass SB 44 without delay. Uh, oppose the path of cannabis related sections of 445, uh, HB, uh, SB 445, and HB 5509. I thank you for your time and, and giving me some grace there. Uh, thank you very much. Any comments or questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, uh, again, thank you very much for your time and testimony. Uh, next up is Duncan Markovich. Hey, go right ahead. Certainly. <clears throat> Good afternoon, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Duncan Markovich, a native resident of Brantford founder of Better Ways, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak today about SB 444, 445, and HB 5509. With regards to raise bill SB 444, I am in extreme support. To aid in this, these important efforts, I have forwarded a project proposal outlined to all committee chairs that I recently wrote to Connecticut's Department of Justice, Department of Corrections, and Chief Attorney Griffin's office regarding the use of AI tools for accelerated cannabis record expungement and prisoner release recommendations. These tools would also help evolve the chain of custody of information from the point of arrest to sentencing where tantamount and sensitive information may be lost or misinterpreted. Such an effort would not only champion Connecticut's own commitment to restorative justice, but also put us at the forefront of our national promise to right the war on drugs through true social justice and equity. I look forward to this committee's engagement with this initiative. With raised bills SB 445 and HB 5509, I want to be clear that when it comes to the rules of the road, I am unequivoc unequivocally for the safety of all those operating any vehicles as well as its passengers. However, as written, I do not support the changes in language suggested as it relates to cannabis. With regards to the state of Connecticut statistics regarding marijuana and traffic accidents or deaths, I would like to reference a recent December article from the CT Post acknowledging law enforcement agencies have not been tracking statistics of cases involving drivers accused of operating under the influence of marijuana, specifically nearly after a year of um, after the first recreational cannabis sales began. In reference to Senator to the previous senator's motor vehicle findings from Colorado. I would reference a study published in the National Institute of Health titled The Effects of Cannabis Compared with Alcohol on Driving. Uh, that study of 414 injured drivers admitted to a Colorado emergency room found an odds ratio of 1.1, indicating that marijuana use was not associated with increased crash responsibility. I've included more relevant statistics, including culpability trends for the committee in my written testimony. On that note, I would like to share that some of the language in these bills is extremely aggressive, allows for profiling and discriminatory tactics that ultimately waste law enforcement and court resources, and equally pose a confounding just juxtaposition of logic when it comes to our open container laws. I once again would like to echo the presence of the odor of cannabis does not mean the presence of cannabis, and as such should still not be a reason for an, any investigatory stop. I would say that those driving unsafe is what should warrant a law enforcement officer for an investigatory, investigatory stop, not whether or not they potentially misinterpret something they see or smell. Um, in conclusion, 
I would once again ask the state of Connecticut to reevaluate our open container laws or at least have them reflect the same concerns for cannabis as illustrated in these proposed bills. Thank you for your time today, and I welcome any questions or concerns. Okay, thank you. Any comments or questions from members of the committee? Representative Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one quick, so the open container law, tell me what you mean by that. Uh, for alcohol. What does that mean? That in this, for the state of Connecticut? Yeah. Um, unless I'm incorrect, the the allowance of an open alcohol container minus the number of occupants than the driver. Right. So under Connecticut law, you can't drink and drive. We agree on that? Absolutely. You agree with that law? I 100%. If a police officer sees somebody drinking and driving, they can pull them over. You agree with that? I, I, I certainly do. I was cut off in time with the point I was trying to make with okay, regard to Okay, I'm interested in it. Certainly. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's such a concern about drivers and intoxicating substances, then there should be at least the same congruence of logic compared for cannabis and alcohol. With the proposed intent of the bill, a reasonably prudent person would assume that anyone drinking a can or bottle while they drive could also be pulled over under suspicion. Anything might have alcohol in it. Correct. So, so let me let me clarify that because yeah. you, you, you made reference that this bill you think should needs to align with the open container laws. Or the open container laws need to align with the oh, concerns right, of right. cannabis. Okay, so, yes. so what you're advocating for then, if, if a police officer sees somebody drinking and driving, they can't pull them over simply for No, them. I highly agree that okay. they should be pulled over so in, then, in then the why same would you, nature. Why would you have – so under current law, if somebody can is observed to be drinking and driving, they can be stopped. Under current law, if somebody is observed to be smoking marijuana and driving, they cannot be stopped. This legislation seeks to fix that part. Right. So the my – Concern for bringing this up is the congruence and enforcement tactics and how people are going to be identified. Is it a cigarette? Was it a hand rolled cigarette? Was it hemp? Was it something non intoxicating? So the curiosity is how much, um, you know, the rate of incidence for correct stops, the cost of municipalities and taxpayers. Um, but Representative Howard, I, I certainly wholeheartedly agree for, for safety above all else. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank You're you, welcome. sir. Thank you. Uh, for the questions or comments, if not, appreciate being with us. Thank you. Maureen Platt. Good afternoon, uh, esteemed members of the uh, Judiciary Committee and uh, Chairperson Sastrom. I'm here today uh, to speak on behalf of the Division of Criminal Justice on two bills. We have submitted written testimony on both of these bills, so I will be brief. My first uh, bill that I wish to speak on is House Bill 5415, which allows the imposition of standing criminal protective orders for individuals uh, in cases who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, I would strongly urge this body to approve this uh, provision. This is a common sense uh, provision, widely supported by victims. I believe because this is a small population, uh, it was a glitch in the statute that it was not initially included. I can think of no reason why this body of victims should be treated any differently from other victims. This uh, standing criminal protective order on, on a closed registry this information is not open to the public, although the fact that someone is under the auspices of the PSRB is. Regarding earlier points that it would prevent family members from visiting individuals in hospitals, I would submit this is blatantly untrue. There are three degrees of standing criminal protective order. One is a full no contact. One is a residential stay away. And one is a no violence, threats, or harassment uh, standing criminal protective order. And the party uh, who is subject to this order or the victim can at any time seek modification of this protective order. These modifications are done pro se. They're done in five minutes in, in any courtroom. So I would submit it's a very easy procedure, even if it was started as a no contact to make it into a residential stay away or the less restrictive or partial. Uh, as a uh, former detective, uh, Jill Kendrick testified, uh, this would certainly provide her with a sense of security uh, and um, it would make her recover easier. 
and I would submit it is uh, a, a bill whose time has come. I would also, as a member of the task force on the PSRB, urge this body uh, to not approve 5509. Uh, the task force, of which I am a member, is meeting very regularly. As this body knows, it's composed of uh, members of specialized uh, discipline. We are working very hard on the task that was assigned to us by the legislature, which was to review the PSRB. Uh, we have not had an opportunity to review the provisions of this proposed bill, and I would uh, ask this body that we be allowed to do so and report back in our report, which will probably be uh, made during this year on this bill and what our recommendations are. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from committee. Representative Fishback. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming here today. The report that you were just referencing, um, I, I don't know if you said or maybe I just didn't hear. When do you expect that that report is going to be getting to the legislature? The report was actually due January 1st, 2024. Uh, we did seek an extension in that. Uh, I would assume, uh, based on our progress, um, I would guess it would be done in the next few months, six months. Um, we are not only planning on issuing a report on the majority view uh, on the members of the task force, but also issuing, if necessary, a minority report. This would give the legislature the best possible uh, answers to our questions and would represent uh, the feelings of the various specialized members. So I do think the report will be of great use. Uh, we have really worked hard, as uh, Dr. Um, from Demas pointed out earlier. We have looked at the uh, systems in 17 other states. We have dealt with the issue such as standing criminal protective orders. We've dealt with uh, collect issues uh, regarding um, PSRB members. We've, we're looking at whether or not uh, these issues should be done in probate court or continued in um, superior court. Uh, this is a very hardworking group, which is currently meeting approximately twice a month. So I anticipate the report being issued soon. And I also anticipate it being a document that will be well worth reading. Well, I thank you for that very concise answer. Um, on 5415, I just, my understanding is that presently, if somebody is convicted of, let's say, manslaughter, mm -hmm. uh, the court has the ability to issue a standing criminal protective order to protect the victim should that individual be let out of incarceration. Is that accurate? Um, well, whether or not they're incarcerated, for certain offenses, a judge at the time of sentencing has the ability to issue a standing criminal protective order. Uh, these orders, can they have to have a definite um, length of time. It could be five years in length. It could be 70 years in length. But again, it is up to the court that issues that. We do take input from the victims as well. Um, and as I said before, um, they would uh, have the ability to um, uh, make the order uh, unique in each circumstance. Um, for instance, if uh, someone has young children, it could stand to the young children. Uh, it could allow them to perhaps work together. To uh, I've had some where victims wa wanted to communicate uh, via Facebook or uh, via computer. So they can be tailored to any individual case. But yes, a order could be issued uh, in that case. It's commonly done. Sometimes victims don't want them. We take uh, a lot of, um, you know, we give a lot of emphasis to victims' feelings in this as well. So I've had certain cases in manslaughter where the victims' families do not want a standing criminal protective order, and we do not do it. But most times uh, in those cases, in sexual assault cases, stalking cases, such an order is issued by the court. And what is under our, under our present statute, what is the longest length of term that a criminal protective order can be put in place post judgment? It again, the computers won't take them if there's not a term. I've seen ones that are 90 years in length. Now, obviously, if someone is 50 years old, we don't anticipate it being 90 years. I've also seen victims come in after five years and say, 
listen, I've thought about this. I don't want a no contact victim anymore. And they can be changed. But most yeah. times these orders are for a period of time that is anticipated uh, forever. Understood. So I think the distinction that's addressed by 5415 is an in, if an individual is not convicted because they're found not to be able to stand trial um, and they are committed as a result of that, that our process does not allow that victim to get a standing criminal protective order. Is that fair? Yes, sure. Uh, yes, I would submit that is. And I would submit it's a glitch in the statute. I don't think anyone ever thought of this small population. Okay. And then my understanding is 5415 merely goes to close that gap to extend yes. those cases, the ability to get a standing criminal protective order. Absolutely. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Attorney Platt. Appreciate being with us. Uh, Thank you. Olivia Rankus. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, thank you. And thank you and good evening to the Judiciary Committee for the opportunity to testify. My name is Olivia Rinkus from the town of North Sullington. I'm also an undergraduate at UConn studying political and cognitive science. Um, I would first like to speak in strong opposition to HB 5415, an act concerning the issuance of a standing criminal protective order when a person is found guilty, not guilty by reason of lack of capacity due to mental disease or defect and section three to seven of HB 5509, an act concerning the enticement of a minor to commit a crime, searches of a motor vehicle in the psychiatric review board and victim's compensation. Um, as someone with mental health issues, the ways that these bills undermine the rights and welfare of patients in a psychiatric facility is disturbing and disheartening especially considering Connecticut has claimed to prioritize mental health in the past few years since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. A person who has been found to be unable to be convicted of a, convicted of a crime because of mental health reasons um, has valid mental health needs. They're not gaming the system or getting out of a conviction with a loophole. Um, HB 5415 unnecessarily gives the courts the ability to criminalize someone um, with mental health needs and punishes them or these needs all without a conviction in the court of law. On top of their mental health needs, they would now be faced with additional legal bar barriers that prevent them from seeking resources. Um, similarly, section three of HB 5509 would undermine the work that has been done, done to protect patient rights. Um, this bill would take away the prioritization of the welfare of a mental health patient in order to prioritize the protection of society. Um, while I might agree that the welfare of those with mental health needs is vital to the protection of society, it is clear that in Connecticut, where the abuse of those with mental health needs has occurred in, in Connecticut facilities as recently as within the last decade, the explicit prioritization of their welfare is still needed. This bill would also increase the wait time for those seeking a temporary leave and requires those under temporary leave to be under constant surveillance. This can be detriment. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, this can be detrimental to the ability of the person in question to form a sense of independence and autonomy. In addition to Section 3, I also find Section 2 of HB 5509 to be highly problematic. This section allows the odor of cannabis to provide a reason for the search of a vehicle, which is high, uh, the sense of smell is highly subjective. When cannabis was made a legal set substance in Connecticut in 2021, it was recognized that using the odor of cannabis as grounds for a search was no longer valid, it leads to preventable arrests, unnecessary contact with the police, and is found to have a disproportionate impact on black and brown drivers. Um, for these same reasons, I would like to testify in strong opposition to Section 4 of SB 445, an act concerning a job program for youth impacted by the juvenile justice system, a review of probation violations, statewide expansion of truancy clinics, and permitting peace officers to stop at motor vehicles slowly because the driver or passenger is using cannabis. Thank, thanks, uh, thank you, thank you, Ms. Rankus. Um, are there questions from the committee? Um, if not, we appreciate you joining us. Um, we uh, uh, great, good to see you, and um, uh, thanks for sticking with us to the end here. Uh, Olivia Dudley. Good afternoon, and thank you to the theme Judici Judiciary Committee. My name is Olivia Dudley, and I'm the Director of Program Operations at Waterbury Youth Services. 
I'll be speaking in opposition of HD 5506 and in support of Section 3 of SD 445. HB 5506 proposes that juvenile court is the most appropriate place to send family with service need cases, while SD 445 proposes sending youth and their parents to, pro to probate court. Neither of these scenarios are appropriate or based on research. Serving youth in their community in conjunction with the schools for our youth who struggle with attendance is the most appropriate and successful approach, approach in Waterbury. Waterbury Youth Services works closely with the school district to provide programming specific to truancy cases. Waterbury Youth Services tr truancy prevention program goals are to provide the expertise, tools, and guidance to determine the root causes of truancy, address the issues keeping youth from regular school attendance, re-engage youth, and motivate youth to cease truant behaviors, and increase the chance of successful high school graduation. Waterbury Youth Services Truancy Prevention Program is currently offered to 22 Waterbury Public Schools and offers home, school, and office visits. The Truancy Program focuses on building relationships with youth and their families, as well as providing resources. Through the program's work, staff identified the following common reasons for truancy. Sickness, transportation barriers, behavioral health issues, and lack of school engagement. The WIS case manager makes many referrals for food, counseling, mental health treatment, tutoring, access to uniforms, and information energy assistance, school activities, as well as medical care. In fiscal year 22-23, 181 referrals were received, and although the fiscal year is not over yet, to date, for fiscal year 23-24, we have had 146 referrals. The case manager attends PPT meetings, which has helped build relationships with the families. This also allows our case manager to connect directly with teachers and guidance counselors regarding the student's success and challenges. During school visits, the case manager completes a success agreement with the youth on ways they can improve their attendance and parent goals. In the past year, we have expanded our efforts on being more involved in the schools, and we also held a truancy recognition ceremony for youth to improve their attendance throughout the school year. This helped promote positive attendance, and we hope to continue to do so. We often have families call us for support even after the case is closed because we build a relationship. Families are comfortable to reach out for support. We would like to continue to serve families through school referrals rather than court. Court involvement creates a negative stigma for youth, delays access to services, and increases their likelihood to return to the court system. Programs such as the one in Waterbury engages you. Thank, thank you for your testimony. Appreciate it. Um, seeing no questions, thanks for sticking with us to the end here. Uh, David Parker. Hello, and thank you, Chairman Staffstrom and members of the Judiciary Committee. I'm David Parker, an architect based for 35 years in Southport. I speak in support of HB 5507, which begins to address the enormous needs for transparency, as well as other serious flaws and deficiencies of the current siting council process. I spent more than half my time over the last seven months dealing with the siting council and UI docket 516, having only first learned a month after the public hearing that UI intended to take by easement 40 feet of my property, including 25 feet of the state and locally listed historic structure where I am sitting now. One would expect it to receive a registered letter, but no, not even a letter. UI, UI claimed to have sent a postcard, which I never received. People deserve to be properly notified. Utilities and or and the siting council should be required to identify each federal state agency with uh, which a project uh, will, has been reviewed, including a written agency position on this. This is extremely important as UI obsequiously concealed the fact that the Department of Transportation did not tell them they had to move their existing lines off of the rail catenaries and instead uh, allowed them to seize uh, a 40 foot wide 
easement sovereign corridor. Uh, they should also be required to share actual loads for the transmission line before and after its proposed installation, including descriptions of outages, causes, and costs to re restore service. UI staunchly refused to provide this information in Docket 516, denying the siting council and we, the citizen ratepayers, who will be saddled with paying all costs of the transmission line with any real understanding of the actual need for the new line, which UI deceptively called a rebuild when it was actually a new line doubling the current impasse and far exceeding projected need, but allowing United Illuminating to wheel and sell power to New York while we are saddled with the cost of the transmission line's construction. There should be an explicit and fully substantiated needs assessment. They should also be required to provide appraisals of the total projected costs associated with the easements and the economic impact that the proposed facility will have on the municipality's tax base. UI's easement estimates in Docket 516 were off by 500 up, up by 300 to 500 percent and serve to grossly underestimate and therefore advance their favored path to take properties for their preferred sovereign path paid for by ratepayers as a gift to the foreign company that wholly owns UI. Siting Council Director Bachman and the Eversource representative earlier admitted that e economic impacts are not currently required by statute to be considered. This is wrong. The economic impact of Fairfield Southport and, as you have discussed, to Bridgeport was and is enormous. Uh, and uh, finally, they should include consideration of state or federally listed historic districts and must find the determination that any adverse Im impact caused by the proposed facility will substantially be outweighed by the public benefits of the proposed line. Current bill is vague on this, and I would recommend that a Section 106 review should be conducted whenever a listed property or district is affected or stipulate that all alternative means to to uh, to avoid the negative impact must have been considered and exhausted. Please ask me about this, especially with regard to Army Corps of Engineers, FERC review versus the, the after the fact mitigation, which is what sure. currently let me, happens. Let me, let, me, let me stop because I don't want I don't want you to race through this. Um, okay. It is it is after five o'clock. Unfortunately, you are our last one. But but I I personally and particularly as as I'm sure you know, are very interested in particularly the historic piece to this um, and and ways to strengthen the current language. So what I'm going to ask you to do is um, send me an email um, yes. and let's connect on it offline because um, this bill, as it moves out of this committee, which it will next week, um, uh, would, there will be an opportunity for us to continue to refine and craft the language as it, as it moves forward in the legislative process. So um please just reach out to uh, my office either by email or, or through my clerk. All right. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Uh, further questions, comments, concerns on this? If not, I'm going to uh, declare this public hearing closed. Um, I will announce that the committee will not meet on Friday. Um, there will be no public hearing. Uh, we're done with hearing bills. Um, uh, we will, um, meet on Tuesday. Uh, time to be determined, but our first committee meeting and votes are like are going to be on Tuesday. Uh, we'll get back to members on exact time, but expect a, a period for caucus in the morning and then um, votes sometime in the afternoon on Tuesday. All right. Have a good, oh, and in the interim, uh, judges on the floor on uh, on Monday.